18. The Past Born as a wisp of a thing, ephemeral as smoke from a cigarette, suckered with blood, with scraps of horror and self-disgust, embarrassing desires. I want her. I want him. I want that. Catch the ball, he says, and I catch it. Are they my hands or his? Chase me, he says. Find me. It's too easy. To lose him, I'd have to lose myself. He wants me to laugh. Shows me how. Shows me funny things. Cats that fall off tables. Teenagers skateboarding into lakes. You're my only friend, he tells me sometimes. But that's only true because his mother keeps him home from school. Because he has dirty clothes. Because he can't invite anyone over. I'm scared she'll die. I want her to hold me when I'm crying, when I'm feverish, when I'm afraid. Want her to smooth back my hair, kiss my forehead. I hate her. Maybe I'd be better off if she were dead. None of those feelings are mine, but they become mine. They become me. Sometimes she takes us to the supermarket and only puts the cheap, heavy stuff in her cart. Sugar, flour, milk. She tells him to shove packages of chicken breasts and pork chops into his backpack. No candy, she says. They expect kids to steal candy. That's how they catch you. There are mirrored pieces of the ceiling that let people watch. There are security cameras. But none of them are watching me. We take what she wants. We take candy. We take everything. Then his grandfather takes us to his big house, where there is a girl to play with and enough food for everyone. If Remy is hungry, someone makes him food. If Remy cries, someone will come. But Remy doesn't cry anymore. He gives all his tears to me. The arrangement is simple. We can stay here so long as I do bad things. People have a spark inside of them, and what I have to do is put it out. Every time I do, some of the spark gets on me, in me, like the smear left behind from crushing a lightning bug. Killing is easier than stealing, but I don't like the way that Remy looks at me when we're done. I'm changing. The sparks are doing something. I'm having trouble going back to sleep when Remy doesn't need me. I'm restless. Something is wrong with me. Something is right with me. I can do things that Remy doesn't know about. When he's asleep, I wander the house, the thin tether never growing taut. I can juggle oranges and turn on the radio like a poltergeist. Read books. Draw a picture in the condensation on the windows. It's my idea, the first time. I want to see what will happen. Cut the cord. And then when it happens, I'm scared. There is an emptiness where Remy was, and it feels like falling through the night. I have never been alone. There isn't enough of me to be alone. Each time it happens, I forget things, little things. Where I was how long I was gone. Adeline tells me things, but they're not all true. I don't want to listen to her anymore. Sometimes the air around me feels charged, like a storm coming on. I think I might be angry. I think I might be furious. I think I might be about to do something I am going to regret. Remy makes me a promise. Shh. We're going to run away. Then it will be just me, and not me, and not him. He's going to fix me. He's going to help me. But first, blot out a few more sparks. Drown a few more stars. 19. 
Candy cracks teeth. Charlie texted Doreen that she'd gotten the ring and then took herself to Blue Ruin to wait and think through what she was going to do with Night Sing's book. The bar was in a tiny, grotty brick building, far from the downtown. On the outside, a faded sign proclaimed it the Bluebird. No one ever called it that, though. It was a third shift bar, opening at 5 a.m. and announcing last call at 2 a.m. Between 2 and 5, it became a restaurant with an extremely limited menu. If you ordered enough cocktails to get you through the three-hour lull in service, you could drink for 24 hours straight. The 5 a.m. crowd were usually nurses and doctors from Cooley Dickinson Hospital, mixed in with maintenance workers, hospital concierges, and second-shift restaurant workers looking for a place to go after exhausting all other venues. Blue Ruin wasn't pretty. The scarred bar and tables in it had been purchased during the liquidation sale of an old tavern and didn't fit well into the space. The floor was sticky all the way to the door, the liquor was served in plastic cups, and the only thing they had for garnish were sad-looking limes. If ever there was a bar that perfectly captured how Charlie felt that afternoon, it was Blue Ruin. She sat down on a stool, reassured to know she could stay all night. An hour later, she was three maker's marks in, with no desire to slow down. Doreen had texted to say that she was on her way over and a lot of other things that Charlie hadn't bothered to read. Charlie had another text from her high school friend Laura about missing her barbecue, plus one from her mother about her new boyfriend's birthday and how she was hoping they could all get together. Maybe the girls would like to host, since their place was bigger? There were two voicemails from work, asking about her coming in on Monday night. She tried to imagine being back there behind the bar, making drinks trying not to think of the glass and the blood and choking on shadow, trying not to think about the sound Hermes's neck made when it broke. She ignored the messages and went into the bathroom to wipe off her makeup. She managed only to turn it into a glittering charcoal smear that covered her eyes and part of her cheeks. Exhaustion and irritability were creeping in on her faster than the alcohol could stave off. There was always a dizzying high immediately after a job followed by an adrenaline drop. Then everything felt a little too dull and you became a little too sensitive. Like right then, when she looked at herself in the mirror, staring into her own dark eyes and drawing a finger over her own scarred lip, she felt unexpectedly and humiliatingly like crying. It wasn't because of Vince. It had nothing to do with him. She went back to the bar and ordered another drink. If you were going to drown your sorrows, you needed a lot of liquid. The bartender was a friend of Dawn's and tried occasionally to make conversation, but Charlie wasn't doing a good job of keeping up her end. At some point, she realized he might be flirting. Kyle, he told her with a grin, looking up from his phone. That's my name. Maybe Dawn told you about me? Charlie was suddenly sure that Dawn had told Kyle about her. Kyle had a head full of thick, wavy brown hair. A tattoo of a rosary climbed his arm from the wrist. His shadow appeared utterly normal. He'd be better at erasing her dread and horror and sadness than all the whiskey in the world. For 15 to 20 minutes, at least. She ought to call someone. Laura. So she could apologize for not showing up for the barbecue. Barb, who could make her laugh. Jose who was sad, too. Did you know? She told Kyle, trying to make conversation. A few grains of salt are supposed to take out the bitter in coffee. Isn't that strange, to think it works better than sugar? I don't think that's true. Kyle was probably a terrible bartender. She shrugged. I like things better anyway. Like me. He gave her a look like he wasn't sure how to take that. A warning, she ought to tell him. Take it as a warning that I am in a very bad mood and happy to have an excuse to take it out on you. Charlie wanted everyone to think of her as hard-headed and hard-hearted. Hard, as old petrified wood, as rocks, as candy that cracks your teeth. But she wasn't. There you are! Doreen sat down next to her at the bar, clearly seething. The great Charlie Hall. She was wearing work clothes, 
white jeans and a collared blue shirt, with the name of the dental place where she was a receptionist embroidered over her heart. She must have dashed out of work when she'd gotten the text about Adam's whereabouts. Charlie rolled her eyes. What? I got your guy and your ring. Please tell me you didn't rob a pawn shop. Doreen's voice was loud enough to make the few other grizzled-looking patrons wasting their day look over at her. Charlie shrugged. Adam was just borrowing the ring. He told me he was using the money to make a deal that was going to change our lives. Doreen obviously wanted to believe that. He wasn't rolling bliss. Maybe he told you about the stone in the ring not being original, too, Charlie said. Because he sold it years ago. Doreen flushed. You really are like the devil, you know that? Knowing all our sins. Charlie felt as though she was observing the conversation from very far away. That's ridiculous. I'm a fuck up, Doreen. But I found your guy and even got your ring. So if you learned something you didn't want to know about Adam, too bad. They stared at one another for a long moment. Charlie took off the ring and put it down on the bar top. When Doreen reached for it, though, Charlie covered it with her hand. You made some threats about what your brother could do to Posey's account at UMass. I want a confirmation that the deadline for paying has been pushed back. Three months at least. I need to see the notice on my phone when I sign into my account. You can't expect him to risk. I 1,000% do. One of the more frustrating things about trading her work for other work was that people put a high value on her trade until a thing was done, then became convinced it must have been easy. Renegotiation was never in her favor. Doreen looked at the ring under the cage of her hand. That's mine. It will be, Charlie said. As soon as you call your brother, and I get that email. Doreen made a show of taking her phone out of her pocket as she walked to the door. A few minutes later, she came back in, mouth pinched. You know, Adam said he was going to get my ring back. He used it as collateral for a loan. That's interesting, Charlie said, in a way that let Doreen know how uninteresting she found it. Doreen sighed. I talked to my brother. He says he can't access your bill. It's not working. You've got to be kidding me, Charlie said. What does that mean? He doesn't know. Doreen looked worried which was the only reason that Charlie didn't accuse her of making this whole thing up. It could come from a different department that doesn't run their billing through his office. Or your account could have been flagged, but he tried. For a moment, Charlie felt a white-hot flush of anger, most of it at herself. She took her hand away from the ring. It occurred to her, not for the first time, that if she had been half as interested in making money from her schemes as she was in the schemes themselves, She'd be better off. Doreen hesitated. Now what? Go on, Charlie said. Take it. Fuck it. Fuck you. Fuck me. Fuck everything. What is wrong with you anyway? Doreen gestured around, as though to indicate that Blue Ruin wasn't a very nice place. It was late afternoon, and Charlie was well on her way to wasted. I'm celebrating, Charlie said. Being single. Doreen gave a bitter little laugh. Well, look at you. Brought down by love. Suffering just like everybody else. Have a drink with me, Charlie said, raising her plastic cup. To suffering. I've got to get back to work, Doreen said, disgusted. I have responsibilities. And I guess you do too. So don't suck down so much whiskey that you forget yours. Oh, and if you did knock over a pawn shop, don't implicate me when the police come after you. If I'm lucky, I'll suck down so much whiskey, I forget we had this conversation. Charlie threw back the makers in a single gluttonous gulp. Bring me the bottle, Kyle. You know, said Doreen, halfway to the door. I saw your guy once, and the minute I saw him, I knew he was going to cheat on you. Guys who look like that, nobody knew him. Charlie told her. Except for you, Doreen snorted. Charlie shook her head. Nobody. He didn't exist. Never did. Making a noise of frustration at the incomprehensibility of drunks, Doreen left. 
You didn't really knock over a store, right? Kyle asked her as he brought over the bottle of Makers. She gave him her toothiest smile. Definitely didn't. You actually want to buy this? He set it down next to her. Definitely do. She poured her own drink out of her own bottle. It was like being in one of those fancy places with bottle service, except for the fancy part. It didn't matter if she couldn't afford it. Her future was clear. She was going back to work for the Glomists, paying for Posey's school the way she should have from the start, making a clean break from her friends. If she was going to blow up everything around her, then she needed to keep everyone she cared about far away. Fuck everything. Charlie stayed at Blue Ruin into the evening, messing with the jukebox in the corner, going in with two elderly alcoholics on a pizza they got delivered, and dancing around with one of them to an old song from the 80s. Things started to blur together. The room began filling up. She remembered sitting on the toilet in the bathroom, sticking the back of a pin she found in her bag into her skin over and over. She remembered falling down on and lying on the floor and Kyle saying something about how he wasn't supposed to serve her if she couldn't stand, which made her laugh and laugh. She didn't need him. She had her own bottle. As she climbed back up on her stool, holding onto the edge of the bar to steady herself, her former boss from Top Hat walked into Blue Ruin with three of his friends. Well, well, he said, giving her a once-over. Look what the cat dragged in. Richie, never met a cliche you didn't like, she said, trying to disguise the slur in her voice. He was in his early 50s, with hair that was thinning on top and eyes like a raptor. He owned property all over the valley, including two bars and three restaurants. When he'd fired her, it was with the expectation that it meant she wouldn't be able to work anywhere else. And he took it as a personal affront that she had. Over at Rapture, I hear. Yeah, the valley was small, but she didn't like the idea of it being that small. He mimed the lashing of a whip and waggled his eyebrows. You tying people up now? I bet you like that, his friends chuckled. Rotten hell, she said, without any heat. Ooh, don't get out the thumb screws. Charlie threw the mostly empty bottle of Makers at him. He dodged in time so that it smashed against the wall behind him. Liquor ran down the dingy paint. Crazy bitch! But he was no longer smug, no longer sure that he could say whatever he wanted and the people around him were going to take it. He even looked a little bit scared. She liked scared. A smile pulled at the corners of Charlie's mouth. You've got to go. Kyle told her, then leaned forward and lowered his voice. You probably shouldn't come back for a while either. Been kicked out of better places. Charlie got up and carefully put on her coat while Richie glared. She counted the cash for her tab and tip and placed it on the wet counter. Then she blew a kiss to the old man she danced with and was immensely gratified when he mimed catching it. She only stumbled twice on her way out the door. Charlie woke in the back seat of her car with a dry mouth and a pounding head that felt as though it were stuffed with insulation foam. Her limbs were stiff with cold. Rain pattered against the roof, and the sky outside was dark and heavy with the promise of more. Moving to sit up, she caught sight of her reflection in the glass of the window. Her mascara had run, and although she didn't remember crying, her cheeks were streaked with the tracks of tears. A familiar shame washed over her. She'd had so many nights like this, when she'd woken up with the knowledge that she'd done something for momentary satisfaction that would turn out to be in no way worth the cost. But as she clambered down the hill into the stretch of woods to piss on some leaves, she was willing to embrace all her faults. She'd been lying to herself when she thought she could change. She was the exact same Charlie Hall she'd always been. Messy. Impulsive. Alone. Walking up to her car, Charlie saw that someone else was standing beside it. A man with white hair and a long black wool coat. Her stomach churned. You must be Charlie Hall, he said. I'm Lionel Salt.
I believe I have a job for you. 20. Two-part poison. The man leaned on a silver-tipped cane. Behind him was the matte black Rolls Royce of legend. Even the windows of the car were tinted dark. A small elderly man stood beside him, holding an umbrella, so that Lionel's salt would stay dry. Half the man's coat was already dark with rain. Just looking at him filled her with a feeling of horror so strong that it locked up her muscles. She knew she had to get to her car, but her body urged her to run deeper into the woods and hide. A job? She called up to him, her voice surprisingly steady. I hired a man, Ermi's Fortune, who is in the same line of work as you. Unfortunately, he's gone missing. It seems I need a new thief. And I hear you're quite good. Charlie made it up the hill and gave him a wide berth as she headed for her car. The sparkly dress she'd worn to the MGM burned bright in the late morning light. In the reflection of the car window, her smeared makeup, marred by tear tracks, made her feel entirely too vulnerable. Maybe the rain would wash her face for her, although she suspected it would only make things worse. I'm out of the game, she said. There's a guy named Adam that does a bunch of my old gigs. Balthazar can put the two of you in touch. The corner of his mouth turned up. Adam Locken. I have him working on something else for me. Balthazar had told her that Adam failed to find the Lieber Noctum. She didn't think of Salt as someone who went back to people who disappointed him. Had Salt been the person on the other end of the phone call she'd overheard? That's too bad, Charlie said. I still can't help you. I spoke to an old acquaintance of mine, Odette Fevre. It seems you might have been the last person to see Hermes alive. Such a coincidence, don't you think? She called you Charlie Hall. Is that your real name? I've only ever heard you called the charlatan. It just figured that Odette knew him. She had enough wealthy clients to have had to cross paths with local billionaire Lionel Salt. And Odette had implied to Charlie that she'd talk to someone about Hermes. Charlie ought to have immediately jumped to the worst possible conclusion. At least Salt hadn't recognized her. Of course, she'd been 15, just a kid. And it wasn't like there'd been anything special about that night for him. He probably killed lots of people before and since. But if he thought blackmailing Charlie by holding the disappearance of Hermes over her head would work, he was far off the mark. After Rand, Charlie had learned that blackmail only gets worse with time. Also, she didn't think Odette gave a shit if Charlie was a stone-cold killer, so long as she showed up for her shifts on time and kept the till balanced. After the silence stretched long enough that he realized she wasn't going to answer, he spoke again. Speaking of coincidences, what are the chances that a well-known pilferer of magical books would find herself involved with a man who ran away with one of mine? I do appreciate you calling me well-known, Charlie said. My grandson certainly knew you, didn't he? Salt's voice stayed level, but he clearly didn't like her attitude. Probably he thought someone who'd peed in the woods and who looked as though they'd had the kind of night people promised not to talk about outside of Vegas would have the grace to act ashamed. The late Edmund Carver, she said. My condolences. His eyes narrowed. I believe you call him by his middle name. Odette described him in unmistakable detail. So let's drop the charade. Vince? Charlie said. All innocence. He dumped me yesterday afternoon. Looks like you just missed him. I think you better get in the car, Salt ground out, no longer trying to hide his anger. We have a lot to discuss, and I don't think either of us want to do it out here in the rain. So many young men of her acquaintance would be envious that she'd gotten an invitation to ride in the rolls. But the idea chilled her blood. I'm already wet, so... No thanks. I'd only drip on your nice leather seat. Lionel Salt reached into the inside pocket of his wool coat and took out a matte black Glock. It matched the car perfectly. The elderly man holding the umbrella didn't so much as flinch. 
I'm afraid I am going to have to insist, Salt said, pointing the barrel of the gun casually, waving it toward her, not aiming. Not yet. It was broad daylight, and they were standing in the middle of a parking lot. Anyone could have walked out of Blue Ruin. There weren't many cars in the parking lot, but there weren't none. The road running past wasn't heavily trafficked, but vehicles passed every now and again. For Salt to be comfortable having his gun out reminded Charlie that he believed he could get away with anything. It had been more than a decade since vomiting up beet juice and running had saved her life. The night had haunted her since. But drugs and time had blurred her memories into a kaleidoscopic nightmare instead of a recollection. But the moment she'd seen Salt, that horror had surged back. She'd felt like a child again, running through the woods, monsters at her heels. She had no urge to go back to his big house and finish bleeding out on his library carpet. Under the circumstances, I really don't think I should go with you, she said, not moving. But you will, he told her, circling around the Corolla toward her. You're a smart girl. You'll make the smart choice. Charlie raised both her eyebrows. Clearly, you don't know anything about me. As Lionel Salt glowered at her, she couldn't help seeing the familial resemblance between him and Vince. They were both tall and had the same hard jaw and angry eyebrows. But where Vince had no shadow, Salt's flickered behind him like a furious flame. She noted its height, its profile when Salt turned, and wondered whose shadow he'd stolen to finally be a glomist himself. My daughter is waiting for us in the car, Salt said, pointing the gun at Charlie with real intent now. I'd prefer not to upset her. I'll even pay you for your time. But this is your last opportunity to make the correct choice. So you're going to pay me if I go and shoot me if I stay? Charlie asked. His smile grew, appreciating her observation. The world works by two principles, the carrot and the stick. If you know Odette, then you know sometimes the carrot is the stick. But despite the remark, and despite her certainty that going with him was stupid, she was aware of how few choices she had. Getting shot the last time had sucked, and this time was likely to kill her. Come along, he said. We'll have a little lunch, in public, very civilized. We can discuss what you're going to do for me and how much time you'll have to accomplish the task. Without quite agreeing, she moved in the direction of Salt's car. There might be no getting out of going for this ride, but she reminded herself that she'd gotten away from him once and would again. Oh, and this time, she really would make him pay. For the past, for the gun he had on her but most of all for sending in Hermes and wrecking a perfectly good relationship built on perfectly good lies. The elderly man with the umbrella, small and wiry, built like a jockey, opened the door to the back seat. I told you my grandfather was strict, right? He taught me lots of stuff. He believed in the improving power of work, no matter how old you were. He didn't believe in excuses. And he had a limo that broke down sometimes. There was no way Salt had taught Vince to fix cars himself, but he could have insisted that someone else did. You liked Edmund, didn't you? She asked the driver. He didn't look particularly pleased to be spoken with. Everyone liked Edmund, Miss Hall, he answered, low-voiced. She slid into the car. Even with sunglasses on, the woman occupying the seat on the other side of a large center console was unmistakably the one from the photos of galas in New York. Salt's daughter, and Edmund Vincent Carver's aunt. Though so alike in age, she looked more like a sister. She wore tight black pants tucked into suede boots, a patterned blue Georgette blouse, and a shearling jacket. Her blonde hair was much lighter than Edmund's, duckling gold. They must have cut a swath through Manhattan's elite hearts and beds. I'm Adeline, she said as Charlie slid in. Sorry about father. He can be a terrible bully. Carrot and stick. Salt said something to the driver in a low voice, then got in the front passenger seat. 
The smell of leather and expensive air freshener made Charlie's head spin. Let's get some coffee, Salt said, turning to look back at her. You look as though you could use some. And fresh clothes, Adeline said, wrinkling her nose, then smiled at Charlie. No offense. I've woken up plenty of mornings in last night's party rags. Party rags? It wasn't that she couldn't picture Vince spending time with her, because he had a deep well of patience. What she couldn't picture was Vince being like her. The car pulled out onto the road, swinging away from the bar, Charlie's Corolla, and any hope of an easy escape. A few minutes later, the car stopped in front of The Roost, a coffee shop at the edge of Northampton's downtown. An employee came out with a tray of coffees and a bag that the driver accepted through the front window. Charlie wondered if there was a sign she could give that she was being kidnapped, like those clever women who managed to signal that they're in trouble during pizza deliveries. If there was something, though, Charlie's hangover prevented her from thinking of it. The car pulled away from the curb in the direction of I-91. The wipers swept across the windshield like a metronome. She took a nervous sip of the coffee. Adeline had gotten some matcha concoction, which left a trace of green foam on her upper lip. I am a person who is used to getting what I want, Salt began, an understatement if ever she'd heard one. And what I want is a book returned to me, Liber Noctum, the Book of Night. Look for a book that Edmund is keeping under lock and key with a metal cover, and that will be it. There are no words on the cover. It may appear like a journal. Charlie nodded, unwilling to agree to get it for him, and took another sip of coffee. She waited. Sometimes silence kept people talking. Sometimes if they talked enough, they wouldn't notice when you didn't. In this case, it worked. Salt went on. My grandson can be charming, but selfish. It's not his fault that he uses people. He grew up with an addict for a mother. She put him into situations and left him among people with whom no child should associate. They lived on the street, even slept in cars. From a young age, he had to learn to survive and to shapeshift into whatever pleased the people he was around. By the time I got hold of him, he was 13 and practically ruined. Charlie cut a glance in Adeline's direction. The woman was frowning at her hands, as though she didn't like what her father was saying, but was unwilling to openly disagree. Although Charlie was loath to believe Salt about anything, a history like that would explain how Vince was able to behave like a normal person, even after more than a decade of being steeped in extreme wealth. A child who'd lived in poverty for 13 years, one who'd been the responsible person in a household, might well know how to clean gutters might have learned how to make tacos and do laundry and all the stuff that would have come less easily to a rich layabout. And as for using people? Well, he'd used Charlie, hadn't he? Salt went on. When most people look up at the stars, they are frightened by the vastness of the universe and their own lack of significance. She heard the echo of Vince's voice. Do you think that stars have shadows? but I have always been comforted, he said. And do you know why? Charlie shook her head, since that seemed like what she was supposed to do. Because they signified possibility. And all that vastness, it was impossible that the universe didn't have secrets left to be ferreted out. And when I took in my grandson, I saw that I was right. Because for all that was broken in him, he had one incredible talent. Magic. Charlie guessed. Salt nodded. When I saw him command it, which he did without a split tongue, having no formal education with any glow mist, I felt as though I had found what I'd been looking for my whole life. A true secret of the universe and a path to greater mysteries. But for Edmund, it was merely a crude little trick. He played with the thing like it was some imaginary friend and sent it off to steal candy and cigarettes. The car pulled into a long drive marked with a carved and painted sign proclaiming they were entering the grounds of the Grand Berkshire Private Club. It seemed as though Salt intended to keep his word about taking her to lunch, in public. I will send you two girls to the spa. There are showers with which to refresh yourself, Miss Hall. The staff can bring you clothing. We'll meet for lunch in a half hour. 
and then we can finish our business. Now, see, isn't that civilized? It was, except for the gun in his pocket. The driver came around again and opened the door. Adeline allowed him to take her hand as though she were departing a carriage. Charlie followed, scooting out inelegantly, trying not to flash her panties. The rain had turned into a light drizzle. She looked around, taking in the rolling green grounds, most of them golf course. The grass looked impossibly bright for this late in the fall. There was a large building in the distance that seemed to be the common space of the country club. The spa building was smaller. Its wooden shingles painted the charmingly cottage core color of a fern. A sign set to one side of the door proclaimed that this was the relaxation and wellness center. Inside, the air was warm, humid, and scented heavily with eucalyptus. A woman behind a desk took two towels from the shelves behind her and placed them on the counter. She smiled at them, as though it was utterly normal to have a hungover client in a spangly dress with makeup all over her face. The steadiness of her gaze didn't so much as flicker. We'd like a private sauna room, Adeline said. And we need some clothing in a size... 12? 14, Charlie corrected. The woman continued to smile. There are towels and robes waiting for you. Would you like some cucumber water? Absolutely. Charlie felt dehydrated enough to drink a bathtub of cucumber water. Do you have aspirin? Of course. Anything else? Charlie wondered if there was anything they could ask for that would dent her smile. A giraffe? A hot air balloon? The loan of a crossbow so she could shoot salt in the back? Still making that mental list, Charlie followed Adeline into the sauna room. White lockers lined the left wall, robes hanging on attached hooks. The door to the sauna itself was shut. The lot of dials on the door meant to, she supposed, optimize the heat and moisture levels, as though she and Adeline were lizards in an extremely fancy tank. And there was a shower room. Chelly grabbed a robe. Back in a minute, she called to Adeline. Under the steady heat and excellent water pressure, Charlie scrubbed her face with body wash, ignoring the way it stung her eyes. She shampooed her hair twice, then shrugged on the robe. Adeline stood waiting for her, hair twisted up in a tortoise shell clip. The sauna really is the best thing for a hangover. You sweat out the liquor. Charlie spotted a pitcher of cucumber water and a bottle of aspirin sitting on a silver tray. She took a generous helping of both before following Adeline into the steam. The air inside the little room was scented, even more strongly of eucalyptus than the front desk, and so thick, she seemed to be drinking it as much as breathing it in. Charlie hadn't been in a sauna before, so she wasn't sure if that was normal. The combination of heat and moisture created a claustrophobic but not entirely unpleasurable sensation. She sat on a bamboo bench and stretched out her bare toes. You've got a bruise, Adeline said, pointing to where Charlie's calf had come up black and blue after being knocked around by Hermes' shadow only three days before. Charlie decided the best thing she could do was ignore that and redirect the conversation. You and Edmund are almost the same age, right? Adeline hesitated, as though the question bothered her. We were close from the time he first came to live with us. My half-sister was so much older than I was that I never knew her well. So it was easier to think of Remy as a brother, more than anything else. Her half-sister, right, Edmund's mother. What about your mom? Did she mind having another kid in the house? She was a model from the Netherlands, used to children behaving differently than American kids. She thought there was something wrong with him. Adeline smiled as though recalling a fond memory. Edmund cursed. A lot. What about now? Adeline sighed. She lives in New York since the divorce. My mother found father's obsession with gloaming distasteful. The painkillers must have kicked in because Charlie's head hurt less. It was a little easier to think, and it bothered her even more that this whole situation didn't add up. Why did Edmund decide to take off? He didn't want to do what father said anymore. Something in Adeline's face made Charlie wonder if Adeline wasn't feeling a little rebellious herself. Father asked a lot from Edmund. She could imagine. His grandson was the one with the magic, after all. Even when Salt got himself a quickened shadow, he still wouldn't have the years of experience his grandson had. 
That was impossible to buy, and Charlie could only imagine how much that would grind Salt's gears. A man who was used to buying anything, unable to buy the power a kid had. What was he like with you? Adeline asked. The question was inflected oddly, as if one of the words meant something else. Perhaps Adeline thought of Edmund as a shapeshifter, the way his grandfather had described him, changing to suit the person he was with. It was hard to argue with that. After all, if he was different with everyone, then how could she know? But Charlie did have one way to describe him. You ever been to the Quabbin? The Reservoir? Adeline looked slightly horrified. You know there's a whole town down there, Charlie said, buried under the waves. That's what Vince was like, a drowned town. Still along the surface, everything's hidden underneath. You can't know, Adeline started, then cut herself off. Looking down at the slim gold watch with a diamond case on her wrist, still miraculously running despite the heat and the moisture of the room, she cleared her throat. <clears> throat> It's almost time to meet father for lunch. We ought to go. She stood. Charlie followed her lead, rising and stretching until she got a satisfyingly audible crack from her shoulder blades. In the changing room, Adeline regarded her speculatively. I know you're not going to think this is nice of me to say, but I'm glad you're not with Edmund anymore. She was right. It wasn't nice, but it was interesting. The spa had left an outfit for Charlie hanging from one of the lockers. It had the look of coming from a golf shop, one that she imagined was probably in the main building. Pants in a stretchy navy material, a white collared shirt, and a navy chevron zip-up jacket. They'd brought her white tennis shoes and socks. But her flats were fine, with just a little dried mud at the edges. She got dressed and braided her hair, but without a clip, it immediately began to unravel. Charlie's gaze fell on her shadow. In all this talk, no one had quite explained how Vince lost his, or when. Charlie, Adeline called. She blinked, coming out of her thoughts. A golf cart idled in front of the spa, the driver waiting to take them to the main building. Charlie didn't have to go to lunch. She could head back inside, insist that someone call her a cab, put on her own clothes back at home. But if Salt wanted to find her again, he had the resources to do it. He could tail her to and from work in his roles. For all she knew, he might be able to send a cop to her house to pick her up for him. Maybe that nice detective Juarez. Enough money bought anything. The grass was wet against her ankles as she walked to the golf cart. Then she hung on as they crossed the parking lot, past Bentleys and Lexuses. Charlie wondered how many of Odette's clients were members here. Inside the main building... Charlie followed Adeline across a gleaming stone floor to the restaurant. The host didn't ask their names, just led them to a private room where the walls were covered in yellow silk and paintings of horses, coats gleaming like polished mahogany, hung atop the cloth. Lionel Salt was already waiting for them at the table, nursing a low-ball glass of whiskey with an ice globe sitting in it. She took in his wrinkles, his faded age spots and too pale skin, as though he'd try to bleach them away the smoothness of his forehead from injections. He wore a black turtleneck and dark gray pants. On his finger, a gold ring marked with an unfamiliar arcane symbol gleamed. Charlie noted that neither he nor Adeline wore any onyx. This is a lot of trouble to go to for a conversation, Charlie said as the host hastened to pull out her seat for her. You look refreshed. Salt exchanged a look with Adeline, who nodded. Maybe there had been some kind of two-part poison in her cucumber water. If she started to feel woozy, she was going to stab salt in the chest with whatever knife there was, even if it was a butter knife. He leaned over to a waiter. We will have the smoked pheasant confit salad, the Kanzan cherry blossom tea cured salmon, and the grilled lamb loin. He looked at Charlie. I assume you're not a vegetarian. She shook her head. After a night of drinking, what she really wanted was a greasy egg and bacon sandwich but he was the guy with the Glock. And a bottle of Chateau de Clans 2018 Garris Rosé, he concluded. The waiter nodded. I'll just take an iced tea, Charlie said. After the waiter departed, Salt put his hands on the table. His nails were clean and buffed. If she were conning Salt, she'd note the veneer of perfection, the need for control. 
It manifested in the way Adeline was quiet and less invited to speak. The way he'd immediately taken the gun from his pocket when Charlie refused to go with him. He expected automatic obedience and acknowledgement of his superiority from people like Charlie. And like Vince. The best way to con Salt would be to let him dominate. Let him win. He'd believe that and he'd never look deeper. So, Salt said, putting his elbows on the table and peering across at her. We have something in common. My darling grandson wronged us both. He took something from me and broke your heart. Isn't that right? Adeline frowned at her plate. Either she was more on Vince's side than she wanted her father to know, or Charlie being with Vince had really bothered her. Maybe she hated all of his girlfriends. I suppose so, Charlie said. Then let us be allies. You won't just be helping me by getting back my book. You'll be stopping Edmund from committing a great wrong. You see, as I told you before, my grandson, in his idiosyncratic way, treated his shadow like some cross between a pet and a friend. To command a shade, one must be a good custodian. Provide blood and energy from our own bodies. We gift unto them life, and in return they give us utter obedience. They are us, after all, formed from us, as we were once made of sculpted clay and the Lord's breath. Charlie was surprised by the religiosity of his description. She had spent a few Sundays at Laura's church trying to con Laura's parents into believing that she wasn't a terrible influence. The only parts she remembered in detail were the songs, the free donuts in the basement, and a lot of language like this. Salt went on. But the sacrament is an unholy one. We give our shadows the parts of us that we want to shove down into the dark. Our anger, our jealousy, our gluttony, our most shameful desires. Imagine a hate-filled creature made of everything monstrous about a person, a thing that feeds on energy and blood. Now imagine coddling that, Miss Hall. Charlie tried to picture Vince with a shadow like that and found it easy to see why he'd been willing to overlook so many of Charlie's faults. He named it Red, Salt said. Red and Remy, isn't that sweet? Maybe that's what it calls itself now. What do you mean? Charlie asked. Once Edmund's shadow was cut free, it became a blight. A blight of a living person? Charlie objected. Formed in childhood, with a child's foolish allowance for gluttony. He overfed the thing, gave it too much blood, and not just his own. By the time Edwin was an adult, his shadow was very powerful. Powerful enough to have desires of its own. It was for that reason Edmund stole the Liber Noctum from me. To bring his blight to full life, a shadow no more. That can't be true, Charlie said, not even sure to what part she objected. The Liber Noctum details the method by which a blight can acquire and maintain enough substance to pass for human. He looked across the table at her, as though willing her to understand. The author presented this as a secret to immortality. But what no Glomis attempting to recreate the ritual realized was that it wouldn't be their consciousness that survived. And so, they were deceived unto their own deaths, and their shadows, swollen with stolen energy, walk among us. To all appearances human. Perhaps to this day. That sounded like internet creepypasta. Impossible. Ridiculous. But Charlie couldn't help remembering how Vince had told her what he'd done was worse than her accusations. Something so bad he refused to explain it. You don't want to believe me, Salt said. But you do. The waiter came in, interrupting them to bring in the wine. He filled all three glasses with a deep pink rosé then wrapped a towel around the neck of the bottle and rested it in a silver ice bucket. Finally, he set Charlie's tea in front of her, a thick lemon wedge decorating the side and a sprig of mint in with the cubes. Lionel waved him away when he began to ask if they needed anything. What did you do to Vincent, Mr. Salt? Charlie asked. Adeline gave her a sharp, surprised look. What did I do? He asked, 
as though trying out being offended. Something caused him to leave when he did. Do you really expect me to believe it was because you had a crisis of conscience over him experimenting with his shadow? Adeline took her wine glass and drained it in one long swallow. This is awful. Just tell her. I am, my dear, he said, with slightly too firm an emphasis for the words to be true. He turned to Charlie. Edmund was unreasonable about red. You know enough of blights to know how horrifying they are. They're made from the worst parts of us. They can be enormously powerful. And they are invariably insane. That's why some blights are disposed of and others are caught and tethered to new wearers. Controlling them is the only thing that keeps humanity safe. Charlie knew a few glomists wore blights instead of their own quickened shadows. Although it had never seemed like the wisest idea. Gloaming was too young an art for its practitioners not to attempt dangerous paths to power, though. Posey might be willing to do it. Who was she kidding? Posey would jump at the chance. But it didn't seem like Vince not to be aware of the danger in letting a blight roam free. And it didn't seem like Salt to worry about the safety of humanity. Charlie was glad when the waiter came back with the food, forcing the conversation to a stop. Salt directed him to set the lamb loin in front of her. Charlie took an absent bite and chewed mechanically, barely tasting what she was eating. It's true I had a hand in what happened next, Salt said, once the waiter had refilled their wine glasses and departed. I tried to save Edmund from Red, but my grandson released his shadow before I could destroy it. Now it's loose in the world. You see why I must have my book before he manages to complete the method outlined in it. What Edmund intends cannot happen. A blight who could pass for human, with an endless hunger. Would you want that walking our streets, doing to others what it did to Paul Echo and Knight Sing? Vince wouldn't do that, Charlie said. He won't, Salt said. Because you're going to bring the Book of Night to a gathering this Saturday, and we are going to keep it safe. Do we understand each other? Charlie was still stuck on his accusation. Why would Vince's shadow, Red, have killed those people? One of them got a piece of the book, which it wouldn't like, Salt said, with a twist of his mouth and a glare. The other knew too much about the contents of the Liber Noctum. But Red needs to kill. The more blood and shadow energy it consumes, the more powerful it becomes, and the more ready for the ritual. By the time Charlie looked down at her plate, the only thing that remained were smears of red from the rare meat. She wiped the edges of her mouth with her napkin. She didn't recall eating any of it. This book has been missing for a year or more. What makes you think I can get it by Saturday? Charlie asked. You know, Edmund. You can do what no one else can. Determine where he could have put a book he didn't want anyone to find. I am having a little soiree for the Glomis community in celebration of my elevation to the Cabal. Having the book would be a worthy proof of how successful I will be in my new position. Charlie stared at him in horror. Sure, the Cabal was a bootleg governing body, but it served to identify threats to the community, like loose blights or laws meant to regulate gloaming, and employ a hierophant. It also kept the local gloamists in check. Someone as monstrous as Salt on there, to be one of the five people making decisions, was going to be bad for everyone. No. One of four people, Charlie realized, because Night Sing was dead. I appreciate the offer of work, but the job's not for me, Charlie said. I have no idea where Vince is or what he did with your book. For all I know, he got rid of it. And besides, I don't like you. You kidnapped me at gunpoint. And you're kind of a dick. Telling him that wasn't revenge, but it wasn't nothing. Adeline sucked in her breath. Salt looked at Charlie across the table, and there was something in his face as though in anticipation of some great pleasure. That's all the warning she got before his shadow flowed toward her and sank into her skin. Before she understood what was happening, her hand lifted the steak knife just as the waiter returned to the room. She could sense the shadow inside her, a separate consciousness. She could hear its thoughts and sense the enormity of its hatred. Her mouth opened and she could feel her tongue begin to form words, her voice rough with resistance. I will 
murder. Then she was free and shaking with horror, uncertain if she cast the shadow off with her will or if Salt let her go. He laughed at the waiter's startled face. She becomes heated when we discuss politics, but there's no harm in her. Isn't that true, my dear? Charlie bit her tongue and didn't answer, too afraid that it wouldn't be her own words coming out of her mouth. Salt leaned in close, dropping his voice to a whisper. You have a week to steal the Liber Noctum for me. Given your reputation, I am certain of your success. But if you fail, we'll see what else I can make you do, and to whom. You have a sister, isn't that right? Now, would you like coffee before you go? A cordial? Anger and fear and fury rose in Charlie like a wave, sweeping every other thought away. She hadn't thought it was possible to despise him more than she did, but now her hands were shaking with a desire for violence. She wanted to break a glass and use it to slice open his face. She wanted to watch him squirming on the carpet as poison stole his consciousness. Salt's smile grew as he studied her expression. She had the sinking suspicion that he enjoyed her hating him. It was another kind of power. He wiped the edges of his mouth with a cloth napkin. I need to hear you say that you understand, that you will be at my estate on Saturday, book in hand. Charlie pushed back her chair and got up, biting the inside of her cheek. You have my word? He nodded. Good day to you, charlatan. As she turned to go, though, Adeline grabbed her hand. I know you saw the news stories. Before you judge my father, remember what Red is capable of doing. Was Vince's shadow really out there, murdering people in anticipation of some transformation? Was that what had happened to Rose Alaband? How responsible had Vince been for all of this? And yet, Rand's body had also been found in a car, along with a dead girl that Charlie was fairly certain he'd never even met while alive, all staged by salt. Maybe Vince hadn't faked his own death. What if he'd just taken the book and run? If Salt had set up the burned husk of the car with charred bodies inside, Vince would have been pronounced dead, making it impossible for him to get far or to go to the authorities. If anyone thought he was alive, he'd be wanted for murder. Of course, that didn't explain Red. Let go of me, Charlie told her. Adeline's fingers dug into Charlie's skin. You think you know Remy, but you're wrong. Charlie pulled her hand out of the woman's grip and walked from the room as fast as she could. She wasn't even sure where she was going, so long as it was away from the Salt family and their horrifying desires and demands. As she crossed the smooth tiles of the reception hall, she spotted a man leaning against the wall. Charlie's heart sped. He was younger than most people walking through the country club, dark-haired, with deep-set eyes and bruised skin underneath. Bullet holes. She'd thought of them that night when she first saw him in the alley. But up close, his eyes just seemed tired. Then her gaze fell to the area between the edges of his gloves and the cuffs of his shirt. It didn't show much, but she could see there was shadow where the skin of his wrist should have been. You're the Hierophant, she forced herself to say. He smiled, but it was all wrong. Too many facial muscles were engaged. His mouth was pulled in too many directions. Yes, he said as though forcing the words out. I am hunting. A blight. Charlie took an involuntary step back, alarmed more by the way he spoke than what he said. It reminded her suddenly and horribly of how she had sounded when Salt controlled her. Red? She asked him. A gleam appeared in his eye. You've seen him, haven't you? She shook her head. The Hierophant gave her one of those strange smiles. I was a thief once, like you. If she'd gotten caught in the wrong place at the wrong moment, she could have wound up like him. Hands cut off, sent out to kill blights. Had he been a Glomus before? Most thieves weren't, if for no other reason than it was hard for a shadow to cross the onyx protections most Glomus put in place. Your shadow, Charlie began, wanting to ask if it had quickened on its own or if they'd bound him to something. His eyes narrowed and he pushed off the wall, taking a step toward her. Once they get their claws into you, they never let go. 
She scuttled back. The hierophant cocked his head to the side and began to speak, at first in a monotone, then in a rising shout. Tell Red, I want the book. Tell Red, we can share. Tell Red that I will rip him to pieces. As he continued to advance toward her, Charlie turned and ran. Her flats slapped against the polished floor. No one can fight their own shadow, he shouted after her. She hit the doors with her shoulder, throwing them open. The matte black car was waiting for her, and she didn't stop running until she was inside. 21. The Past Remy Carver stood on a cobbled street in Boston's Beacon Hill neighborhood, trying to appear like a normal teenager instead of the conductor of a murder. He felt the pull of a shadow, as though there was a rope between them, thinning as Red floated up the stairs of the row house. Across the street, an elderly woman in a fur-collared coat walked a fat chihuahua. She glanced toward Remy, and he turned away, moving deeper into the shadows, his heart hammering. Maybe he should have come at two in the morning, instead of just past eleven at night. His grandfather argued for this hour, saying that he would be less conspicuous when there were other people on the street. But there was no time when it didn't look a little suspicious for a 14-year-old boy to be hanging around with a couple of trash cans, waiting for his invisible friend to finish killing somebody. Remy didn't belong in a place like this, no matter who his grandfather was. The window boxes full of spring flowers and gleaming brass door knockers made him uncomfortable. He tried to concentrate on something other than what was happening upstairs, even though part of him could see out of Red's eyes. His shadow had made it to the man's bedroom. The door was slightly ajar, no barrier at all. The man was asleep, wife beside him. She had one of those cannulas in her nose, the ones that supplied extra oxygen. Remy shook his head, pressed his eyes shut as though that would stop the images from coming. No, no. Think about the last time he saw his mother and how much better she was doing. But that memory wasn't so good either, because she'd wanted him to come live with her and he couldn't. Think about the fancy private school he was attending and how Adeline had introduced him to her friends. They'd thought he was cool. He knew how to score drugs and how to spot a guy heading into a liquor store who'd buy them a bottle of Grey Goose for an extra 20. They wanted him to come to their ski lodges this winter. They wanted him to come to their islands for spring break. And wasn't that a hell of a lot better than what he'd been doing last year? Wrapping duct tape around his sneakers so his feet wouldn't get wet? Trudging through the gray snow. It was worth it. This was worth it. That's what he concentrated on as Red flowed down the man's throat, as Remy's head echoed with awful sounds, as the wife woke up and started screaming. Think of having a home. Think of mom going to the kind of rehabs that celebrities hung out at. Think of a future. Think of Adeline, who wanted to be his sister. Don't think about Red. Ever since his grandfather had discovered how useful Remy could be, He'd wanted him to use his shadow. And his grandfather started collecting books on glomists, spouting off about how Remy was doing it wrong, how Remy needed to understand that Red was just an extension of him, like a hand, something he had total control over. That acting like Red could make his own decisions was dangerous. But Remy didn't want to kill anyone. It was bad enough he had to be a participant in it. He couldn't imagine being wholly aware of what he was doing pushing himself down the man's throat, watching his eyes bulge and his tongue loll, listening to the frantic howls of the wife close enough that his ears would feel like they were bleeding. When it was done, Remy wiped tears from the sides of his eyes. He hated knowing the man was dying, and he hated the dying man, too. If only he'd just gone along with Remy's grandfather's business stuff, then they'd all be less miserable. It didn't take long for Red to return, sliding across the cobblestones toward him. But his shadow stopped before returning to his dormant place. Instead, Red stood black against the brick wall, as upright as Remy was, in defiance of the streetlights and any natural law. You're unhappy, Red said, although the words could only be heard in Remy's mind. Adeline had explained to him that Red was the part of Edmund that Edmund didn't know about, like a subconscious. But Red didn't feel like his subconscious. He felt like an attic, 
a place to shove things Remy didn't want to deal with. At the new fancy private school that his grandfather insisted he attend, they didn't like people getting into fights. So Remy didn't get into them anymore. Even though at his old school, he had to get up in people's faces if he wanted to be respected. But that anger had to go somewhere. And when Remy felt sad at times like this, or when he was missing his mother, he put that sadness into red, too. His pity for the people his grandfather wanted dead. Which wasn't fair, because red shouldn't have to kill people and feel sorry for them. But red wasn't real. He was Remy's subconscious. Or an attic. He used to be a friend. So what, it's over? Remy said, thrusting all the sadness away from him. He wondered if Red would complain, but it was his energy, right? Like the blood that fed him. Next time, cut me free, Red said. And when the thing is done, I will return. Remy hated it when his shadow said stuff that didn't seem to come from his thoughts at all. Things that surprised him. He'd used to like it, back when it was moves in a game or sprinting ahead in a race. We need to go, he muttered, and set off stalking down the sidewalk with his hands in his pockets. The police would be coming soon, and an ambulance. Let a shadow follow. That's what shadows were supposed to do. He felt better once he turned the first corner. There was nothing to tie him to the murder. And the more he thought about it, what Red wanted was what he wanted too, wasn't it? Even if it was impossible. So it shouldn't have been that surprising, what Red had suggested. Remy was just being weird about things on account of what his grandfather had told him. I promise I'll come back, Red whispered. Cross my heart and hope to die. Stick a needle in my eye. You don't have a heart, Remy thought at him. Or an eye. On my life, then. I promise on my life. You're just me, Remy said. I'm just you, Red echoed. But Remy wasn't sure what it meant now that the words were coming from his shadow. When they were younger, he always knew what Red meant. I'll think about it, Remy said. But he already knew he'd do anything if it meant he didn't have to have a night like this one again. 22. The Scholar and the Shadow Once they hit the highway, the elderly chauffeur cleared his throat. There's something in the back seat for you, Miss Hall. On the floor mat, where it must have slid, she found a book with a red leatherette cover, stamped in gold. After stealing so many old, crumbling volumes, there was something odd about holding a modern book crafted to seem to come from another time. The title read, Complete Works of Hans Christian Andersen. A hundred-dollar bill was tucked into a page, acting as a bookmark. The story was called simply, The Shadow. With little else to do on the ride home, she read, it featured a scholar from the cold north who traveled to a marvelous city in the south but was unable to bear the heat of its days. He shrank beneath the hot sun, growing thin and exhausted. Even his shadow seemed to fade. Only in the evenings as the cool breezes came did he begin to feel like himself again. He would sit out on his balcony with a candle and watch his shadow stretch and lengthen in the night air. Charlie felt a little shiver go through her. She read on. Beneath the scholar and his shadow, the city appeared magnificent by moonlight. Rattling carriages passed musicians playing mandolins. Church bells rang. Donkeys carried carts of ripe fruit back from the markets. The scholar drank in scents of spices and smoke and lush flowers. He was particularly struck by those blooming on the balcony opposite his, from where the sound of singing came. Each night, the scholar would sit on his balcony and look across. Once, he thought he spotted a beautiful maiden among the flowers. When he looked again, she was gone. But in the candlelight, his shadow became long enough to stretch across the street to the girl's window. Make yourself useful, the scholar told his shadow, laughing. Go look inside and tell me what you see, but be sure to come back. And with that, the scholar went to bed. But his shadow did not. It scampered away to look and despite his command, never returned. The scholar found this very vexing. Soon, however, he found a new little shadow beginning to grow from the very tips of his feet. By the time he returned from the hot country, he had a freshly grown shadow that was perfectly sufficient 
and decided to be content with that. One night, many years later, there was a tapping on his door. On the other side was a very thin person, immaculately dressed. Looking at him made the scholar feel odd, but he ushered the stranger inside despite his misgivings. The stranger introduced himself as the man's shadow. Astonished, the scholar was nonetheless a little amused to see him again. The shadow told him many tales of his adventures and how, since he was able to slip in anywhere and see all those things that the powerful wanted to keep hidden, he had done very well for himself. He had become quite wealthy. The scholar marveled at this, for he had remained poor. The shadow invited the scholar to travel with him and offered to pay his way. This was a bit too much for the scholar's pride, but in the end, he relented. Away they traveled to a place where they could take the waters, with the shadow claiming he hoped it might heal his lack of a beard. As they went, the shadow made all the decisions and paid for all that they ate and drank. Soon, the shadow began to treat the scholar more like a servant. Many people from all over came to the healing waters, and the shadow met a princess who had come to cure a condition she had, one which allowed her to see things too clearly. She took a look at the shadow and told him that he had come to the waters in the hopes that he might grow a new shadow. He laughed and said that she must be cured already because his shadow was right there, and he indicated the scholar. The idea that his shadow was so much finer than anyone else's intrigued her. That night they danced together, and she told him of her country. He had been there, and had such a breadth of knowledge that she quickly fell in love with him. She wanted to marry him, but needed to assure herself of his wisdom, since a ruler ought to be wise as well as knowledgeable. She tested him by asking him a series of difficult philosophical questions. The shadow laughed, saying they were so simple that even his shadow could answer them. And when she put the same questions to the scholar, he answered them so handsomely that she agreed to marry the shadow immediately. That evening, the shadow made the scholar an offer. He could live with them and be wealthy all his days if he would tell everyone that he was the shadow and the shadow was the man. The scholar refused. He said he would go to the princess and tell her everything. But the shadow told him that if he tried, the shadow would tell the princess and her guards that the scholar was a liar. Be reasonable, he said. I am the one who's going to marry her, and they will listen to me instead of you. But the scholar insisted, and all was as the shadow predicted. The shadow told the princess's guards to seize the scholar, and they did. By the time the shadow and the princess were married, the scholar had been put to death and was no more. Charlie closed the book and saw that they had left I-91 and were weaving through back roads toward Blue Ruin. Putting her hand on the leatherette cover, she tried to put aside the story itself and focus on why Salt had given it to her. He wanted her to believe that Red wasn't just a threat to the world, but to Vince. She shouldn't care, but she had to admit that she did. Hatred of Salt burned in her gut, but no matter how much she despised him, no matter how sure she was that he was deceiving her, she was equally certain that he hadn't lied about everything. The chauffeur pulled into the lot and parked beside her Corolla. She got out, taking the book and the hundred-dollar bookmark with her. Salt had promised to pay, after all. The matte black Rolls-Royce was back on the road, speeding away into the late afternoon, as Charlie opened the door to her car. She held her breath until the engine started its usual miserable sputtering. Her purse was where she'd left it, in the back seat. Her phone was there, too, with a missed call from Posey and another from work. She ignored those and called UMass's bursar's office to try to straighten out whatever was wrong with Posey's account. She got a busy signal. When she tried again, the call went to voicemail. Between one call and the next, the office had closed and was going to stay that way through Veterans Day. Frustrated, she drove home. It was just after four in the afternoon and the house was quiet. Her sister either hadn't risen from bed or had shut herself up in her room. Exhausted, Charlie went straight to her mattress and face-planted on it. When she woke, the house smelled like something was burning. She found that she'd been clutching the red book to her chest, as though it were a stuffed bear. In the kitchen, Posey glared at a sheet pan of blackened cookies. You didn't come home last night, she said. Neither did Vince. And what are you wearing? Charlie looked down at the athleisure the spa had picked out for her. With a shrug, She sat on a chair and tried to pry up a cookie. 
She could use some sugar. Vince left. Packed up his stuff. He's gone. She'd expected Posey to be thrilled, or at least smug, but she appeared shocked instead. You dumped him? Charlie shook her head. No, I told you, he left. But why? Because his name isn't really Vincent Damiano. He's Edmund Carver, and he's filthy rich, and he's supposed to be dead. Charlie sighed, gave up on the cookies, and went to pour herself some cereal. All they had were bran flakes, boring, and purchased by Vince at a request. She poured them into a bowl. Seriously? Posey said. I think he's in trouble, Charlie said. I mean, obviously he's in trouble, but he's in more trouble, and it's got to do with his missing shadow. Vince had been 13 when Salt took him in, troubled, and probably desperate for stability. What might he have been willing to do for that? She bet the answer was absolutely anything. Posey poked at the burnt cookies with a slightly melted plastic spatula that was probably leaching toxins into their baked goods. A chunk of one came off. Who's after him? It's a little bit of a complicated story. Do you remember mom's old hocus-pocus friend, Rand? Posey wrinkled her nose. That old guy that was always hanging around with you. Didn't he die in some really weird way? He was murdered, Charlie said. Posey shook her head. No, that's not it. They found him with another body in his car. Suicide or murder-suicide. I remember now. Dad blamed mom for letting you go off with him all those times. He was worried that guy had done stuff to you like everyone figured he did to that girl before he killed her. Her father had, of course, said absolutely nothing to her. Until this moment, Charlie hadn't known he'd been aware of Rand's existence. It was hard to balance her surprise with annoyance at Posey, who apparently thought that Charlie just misremembered one of the most horrific events of her life. Rand was murdered, she said. I know because I was there. Posey began to open her mouth, possibly to object, and then abruptly closed it. Vince's grandfather killed him. Lionel Salt. Why were you there? Posey asked, her voice much quieter and less sure. Because Rand was a con artist, Charlie said, and I was his helper, like a magician's assistant, but for crime. So nothing like a magician's assistant, Posey said. Charlie ran her finger through the blackened crumbs. Look, Rand wasn't the best guy. He was vain and irritable and conned me into working for him in the first place. But he taught me a lot. And he didn't deserve to die and definitely not like he did. No one deserves to die like that. You always told mom you wanted to go with him. Posey bit a cookie, then made a face and put it back. I thought he was buying you stuff. And back then I was envious, but then later I didn't know what to think. You always had money. And, well, he was a creep. When she put it like that, it did sound bad. Charlie wondered more than ever what their mother had thought she was doing with Rand and why she'd been okay with it. Charlie chewed her good-for-you cereal, frowning. Her past problems might be unsolvable, but Vince was the key to fixing her current problems. He either had the Libra Noctum or could tell her its whereabouts. And if he was really attempting to make his evil shadow into an evil person, maybe he'd be done by Saturday and she could take the book back to Salt. And if it felt like a relief to have a reason to contact him, she refused to dwell on that. Pulling out her phone, she sucked in a breath as she tapped his name, waiting for it to ring. A moment later, an automated voice told her that the number had been disconnected. Of course it had. Well, she'd spent the better part of a decade finding things she could find one tall guy with no working credit cards and a fake ID. Charlie looked across the kitchen to her sister. Do you think you could be friends with your shadow? She asked. Like, come to really care about it. Posey frowned consideringly for a moment. There's a lady who married the Berlin Wall. She was super devastated when they knocked him down. Carried around a brick for a while. Posey had a point, but that wasn't what Charlie had meant. Yeah, okay. But could you reasonably be friends with it? I don't know. Yeah, Charlie said. Me neither. If it could talk, maybe, Posey said, still chewing over the question. But then aren't you just talking to yourself? Charlie frowned at the floor. She hadn't been talking about her own shadow, but perhaps she should have been. 
It was as unresponsive as ever. Definitely not friendly. You hate me a little, don't you? Posey gave her a look. You mean because it's unfair that it's your shadow that's quickening when becoming a glowmist is a thing I want most in the world? Charlie nodded. I'm angry, Posey said. At the universe. And at you, I guess, even though I know it's not your fault. I'll get over it. But if you fuck this up, I will hate you. Charlie sighed, half sure she was fucking it up already, and entirely sure she'd fuck it up somewhere down the line. That was just her nature. Charlie Hall, maker of mistakes, patron saint of disaster. The only things she'd ever been good at were trickery and deception, so she better stick to those. Paul Echo had gotten a page of the Lieber knocked him somehow. If Vince sold it to him, there'd be some record of the transaction. Maybe Vince had left Echo with a phone number that worked, or even better, an address. Curiosity Books, that was the name of Echo's shop. Well, Charlie was feeling curiouser and curiouser. I'm going back out, she said, heading to her bedroom for a change of clothes. Posey gave her a sideways look. You coming home tonight? I'm going to order lo mein. Get me some, Charlie called back. I can always eat it for breakfast. Curiosity Books was on the third floor of a slightly shabby converted mill building, just above a concrete artisan and across the hall from a circus school where small children were taught how to juggle and spin plates. The locks on the doors were a joke. Charlie didn't even need to pick it. She just slid her big Y points card into the gap between the frame and the door, then brought it up hard enough to depress the latch bolt. Turning the knob, she nudged the door with her hip. It opened. The walls were lined with bookshelves that seemed to have been scavenged from every library closeout sale and Craigslist giveaway in the neighboring towns. The volumes were so tightly packed that Charlie wondered how any of them could possibly be removed. Cardboard boxes had been stacked in small towers, some with their sides ripped, others containing more folded boxes inside, presumably for shipping. High on the back wall, above a bank of windows, an unattributed quote had been painted. The universe belongs to the curious. An old 1950s-style metal desk rested in the middle of the floor, with a computer humming away on top, an ancient-looking landline phone, and a label printer. Loose paper carpeted the floor, as though recently pawned through. Charlie walked from one end to the other, inhaling the powdery dust of old books. A locked glass cabinet had been smashed, and the shelves inside emptied. A single bookshelf rested on the floor, books seeping out from underneath. She went back to the desk, sat down, and moved around the mouse in a circle. After a moment, the computer monitor sprang to life, showing a ridiculously cluttered screen. She opened a search window and typed in name, colon, knocked him. Nothing came up. She replaced it with name, colon, blight. And that got nothing too. Then she tried inventory and got a .xl file. When she opened it, she found a list of books Paul Echo had in the store, with short summaries, the price Paul paid for them, and the price he'd sold them for. She typed, knocked them, into the search area of the file. No results. Frustrated, Charlie took out her cell phone and called Balthazar. He answered on the third ring. Darling, he said, drawing out the vowel. To what do I owe the pleasure? What if I want to take the night sing job? She asked, kicking the file drawer and making the chair spin. Too late, alas. I hear someone got the folio already. Regretting it? Don't worry, I have a half dozen other jobs. A few out of state if you're willing to travel. A few impossible if you're looking for a thrill. Always, Charlie said. But who wanted them? Wanted which? Night sings papers. Idly, Charlie began to open the drawers of the desk. They made a grating metallic sound. Balthazar hesitated before answering. Is there something you ought to tell me? I don't think so. In the files drawer, she found dozens of manila folders, all labeled with the dull needs of business. Bills, rent, takeout menus, insurance, bookseller organizations with acronyms, ABA, IOBA, NEIBA. It was a puppeteer, wasn't it? There were several underlings from Carapace who wanted the folio. And yes, a puppeteer. A very wealthy puppeteer. He paused, 
as though troubled. Now, do you want to tell me how you knew that? She fought down the urge to show off, to mention that she was aware Raven was the one they'd been taken from. It's my job to know stuff, Charlie said innocently. She ought to thank Balthazar, hang up, and leave things at that. But she owed him something in the way of information. Remember that job you said I should do? Finding the Liber Noctum? Salt basically told me he'd kill me and everyone I love if I don't. Good thing I'm not likely to find myself in that category, said Balthazar. Oh, I don't know. You're growing on me, she told him, as her fingers went to the far back of the files in the bottom drawer, stopping on a thin folder marked porn. It was empty. You're trouble, charlatan, he said, but with fondness. Goodbye, Balthazar, she told him, and hung up. Turning to the computer, she typed porn into the search bar. A folder came up. Inside were a half dozen JPEGs, three MOV files, and another folder marked geriatric porn. That contained a single Excel file. When she clicked it, a new inventory opened, listing a collection of occult books that might be of interest to Glomists. This spreadsheet included the year created, the specialty of the Glomist, whether it was a one-off or mass-printed, whether there were other editions, what shelf it was on, and how Paul had acquired it. Then there was a list of Glomist ephemera. To hide knowledge from one another, Glomists had taken in writing out their secrets in non-traditional ways, stitched into the lining of a leather coat, written in tiny letters inside of artwork, objects whose real value was disguised so thoroughly that they might be thrown out or sold for pennies at a flea market. And then there were NFTs, popular among the wealthy and still far from commonplace among most Glomists. Paul had one in his inventory and seemed to have listed it for a hundred grand two weeks ago. Charlie scanned down the list of sellers, looking for Remy, Edmund, Vincent, Red, even Salt. But the only name she recognized was Liam Cloven. Liam Cloven, M.D., Vince's old school chum. It looked as though he'd sold Paul Echo three books within a week of the time that Edmund was supposed to have died. According to the entries, two were memoirs from the 18th century, worth 500 bucks apiece, which had been kept in the shattered glass cabinet. Clearly, those were gone. The third was Umbramagis Through History, self-published through Lulu in 2011. Instead of a shelf, the book was marked as being in a cardboard box on the other end of the room, marked with a 7A. Charlie went to retrieve it. As she did, a knock on the door startled her. Paul? A gruff voice came from the hall. Book in hand, Charlie went still. The door was slightly ajar, and she saw the moment that it began to swing inward. She ducked down behind some boxes. Someone in heavy work boots crossed the floor toward the desk. Come on, man, the person said in exasperation. Paul, you owe me the goddamn rent. You can't hide from me forever. He exited the room with a slammed door. Charlie liked to think of herself as light-footed when she wanted to be. But in an old building, it was almost impossible to tell which floorboards were likely to creak and groan. She figured it would be the better part of valor to stay where she was for 15 minutes until she was sure Paul Echo's landlord had gone. With nothing else to do, she opened up Umber Modgett's Through History and read it by the light of her cell phone. It contained a collection of curated excerpts taken from other books. And although the introduction of misinformation was often a concern with reprints, there was an air of authenticity in the sheer neglect with which the author had put it together. Each page was clearly just scans of the original material in the original font. Charlie scanned through the excerpts from newspapers, histories, and other documents. Whatever she'd thought of how it had been put together, the actual information in the book was compelling. A warrior in Thebes fell in a field of blood, but his shadow fought on until his killer died. A member of a shadowy secret society operating around the time of the Order of the Golden Dawn claimed she was able to send her consciousness out of her body at night and discover her enemies in their most private moments. That same account suggested that while her shadow was on a mission, she was vulnerable to other shadows taking control of her body. A mystic attempted to feed his shadow all of his blood and live on through it. A woman 
had woken on a hillside to three elderly folks trying to cut off her shadow at her feet. She shouted and they ran. She never found out exactly what they'd been doing, but she had a sense that if they had succeeded, something terrible would have happened. A man had nearly choked to death when a dark figure had turned to smoke and gone down his throat. A servant carrying a candle and entering the room by chance caused it to flee before its dread mission was accomplished. By the time Charlie looked up from the book, the building was quiet. Tucking the book into her bag, she slipped out the door and down the stairs. She'd have to talk to Liam Cloven, but there was someone she wanted to talk to first. If Red had really murdered Night Singh, then what was Raven doing with his papers? And if Salt was the very wealthy puppeteer looking for them, why would he be scrambling to get the notes of someone from Carapace when he was supposed to be obsessed with the return of the Liber Noctum? In the car, Charlie turned to the empty seat beside her where her own shadow fell. Okay, kid, she told it. The universe belongs to the curious. 23. Bear Claws Charlie pulled into the parking lot in front of Eclipse, Piercing, and Shadow Modifications in Amherst around 10 that night. It was in a strip mall, positioned between a Korean chicken place and a laundromat. Charlie parked in the back, against a thin copse of trees. The chilly night air carried the scent of beer and fried things from a bar one lot over. Grabbing a Dunkin' Donuts bag from the back seat, she went to the door near the dumpster, a red bulb burning above it. She knocked, knuckles hard on the wood. A sliver of light peeked out the edge of blackout curtains hanging inside the window. Moments later, a black woman opened the door. She wore a tank top and ripped jean shorts. Her curls were dyed the color of flames, with yellow at the root, red for most of the way, and little licks of blue at the tips. Tattoos covered her arms from a dark-skinned moon goddess, new enough to be shiny with moisturizer, to older and less well-rendered spider webs, roses, and a skull with a serpent snaking through its eyes. Folding her arms across her chest, Raven regarded Charlie suspiciously. I don't take walk-in clients, especially at this hour. You had something stolen from you recently, Charlie said. I want to talk to you about Night Singh and his book of observations. Tell me what I want to know and you can have it back when I'm done with them. Less than a week, I promise. Raven narrowed her eyes, then stepped back so that Charlie could come inside. As Raven closed the door, Charlie saw the words, El arte es largo y la vida breve, ran down the inside of her left arm in large Gothic script. Scabs dotted her legs, as from flea bites. Marks made by feeding her shadow. Charlie held up the Dunkin' Donuts bag. I brought coffee, if it's any consolation. Okay, thief, let's hear what you want. Raven poked around in the bag, then looked up. Fuck yeah, you got bear claws. The first part of any con was winning someone's trust, and every conversation was a little like a con. Coffee and pastries couldn't hurt. How did you wind up with his papers? Charlie asked. From what I heard, his death was unexpected. You could say that. Raven raised her eyebrows and took a sip of coffee. They found him in his home, on the rug near his desk. The walls were painted with gore. The cabal didn't want anyone to know details. But I found out. Raven went on, not leaving space for comforting words or horrified astonishment. Another Glomis said they heard a man's voice screaming. Someone other than night. To do what was done to him required a kind of strength that could only come from a shadow, a very powerful one, glutted on energy and blood. That's awful, Charlie said. Raven nodded. Knight was the first Glomist I ever met, the one that taught me how to use my magic properly. Got pissed when I decided I wanted to focus on alteration. Said I was chasing money. Maybe he was right. The thing was, though, he gave me that book a week before he was murdered told me to keep it safe. He had information that could bring down someone important. Holding it over that person's head kept him safe, and not just him. I guess he was wrong about that. Lionel Salt? Charlie asked. Raven gave her an odd look. Maybe. That old man is a freak. Stole the shadow he's wearing. Lots of people are supposed to have disappeared into his house. 
If that's common knowledge, how come the Cabal never did anything? How come Night Singh never used what he had? Charlie asked. Raven went to a cabinet near a kitchenette and took down a metal dog dish. I've got a couple of things to do. Do you mind if I work while I talk? Go ahead, said Charlie. Raven opened a mini fridge jammed into a corner behind the counter and took out a plastic bag of blood. She ripped open the edge with her teeth. Hand me one of those coffee mugs, she asked, nodding toward a sink where a few clean forks and cups rested on a scratched plastic drying rack. Charlie stared at her incredulously. You want me to do what now? Raven smiled. Mugs, by the sink, get one. Charlie chose one at random. It read, kick today in the dick. Raven poured the blood into the cup and then stuck it in the microwave, setting the timer for a minute and a half. To get the chill off it, she said, as though that explained anything. As the mug went around in circles, Raven turned to her. Nobody has any real proof. And salt's rich. That's why the cabal won't do anything. As for why Knight didn't use what he had, I don't know. Depends on what he had. You can't expect me to believe you didn't read through Knight's book while you had it, Charlie said. Raven smiled. Oh, I did. Lots of information, most more relevant to shadow wearers and alterationists but absolutely nothing that seemed like it could take down anyone. Charlie frowned. Other than whatever Knight had, would Salt have any reason to want him out of the way? Knight was against his being a Cabal member, and now that Knight's gone, they're bending the rules and letting Salt join, even though Malik's already representing the puppeteers. So they're not going to have anyone from Carapace? Raven's gaze went to the mug, turning on the plate, her expression remote. It's not fair. Knight helped build the Cabal. He was one of the early Glomists to be open about shadow magic. Charlie opened her coffee and took a sip, thinking about Red and what Salt had said about Vince. What was Knight's connection to the Liber Noctum? He might not have one, but she hoped that by putting it like that, Raven would believe she knew more than she did. The Book of Blights? The microwave beeped and Raven dumped the contents of the mug into the stainless dog dish. He thought it was hilarious that Salt got scammed into paying so much for it, I guess. That's the problem with rich glomists. They buy up all the magical books because they can, and they use that knowledge to tie other glomists to them. Salt wouldn't follow anyone's rules, and now he's going to be the one making the rules. There were stories of cults formed by glomists in the early days of shadow magic becoming public. Lots of bloodletting to juice up their shadows. Lots of creepy robes and creepy sex. And in the end, lots and lots of death. When Charlie thought of what a Glomist organization run by Salt would look like, she imagined the high-class corporate version of those cults. But people would join. He had the books and the money. And the bigger his organization became, the more influence he'd have with the other Glomists. His seat on the Cabal would mean no one could stop him. Shoving the empty, blood-stained mug back into Charlie's hands, Raven went to the door and set the dog dish down on the step. Do I want to know? Charlie asked, eyebrows raised. You will in a minute, whether you want to or not. Raven appeared immensely amused. Why do you want to know about the Libra Noctum? Didn't Salt's grandson make off with that before he kicked the bucket? Why do you want to know any of this? Charlie flopped down on a bench near a stack of Flash magazines. Something's gone wrong, and I guess I'm caught up in it. I can't walk away now even if I wanted to, and I don't. What I really want to figure out is who's been lying and about what. Raven snorted. Probably all of them, about everything. Outside, a passing cloud changed the way the moonlight fell. Charlie saw a few shadows slipping toward the bowl. They were faint, indistinct things, even as they moved into the strong light of the bulb over the door. Barely noticeable. But the area around the bowl grew ever darker as more congregated. The surface of the blood rippled, as though disturbed by some phantom cat tongue. Then it was all ripples. There is one thing about the Libra Noctum, Raven said softly. Night knew a guy at an auction house, and they let him put on white gloves and take a look before Salt bought it. 
he copied out some notes on the binding of blights, but nothing else. Could he have overlooked the ritual to give blights weight and form? Or had it seemed so terrible that he simply didn't want to know it? Charlie sat there, more frustrated than ever, watching blood drain from the bowl. The shadows thickened around it, dense and dark. How about the Hierophant? He's supposed to be hunting down blights, and you said it must be a powerful shadow that killed Night Sing. It could be a blight, couldn't it? Raven sighed and looked out toward the edge of the parking lot near the trees. That guy? Steven? I knew him a little before he was the Hierophant. It wasn't even that he was a bad thief. It was that he stole the wrong thing from the wrong person. The glomist who'd hired him hung him out to dry. Then they punished him by stitching that old blight to him and, well, I don't think things are going well. A shadow like that, conscious and whispering in your ear, creepy as fuck. I doubt he's gonna catch anything. Charlie recalled Salt's comment about powerful blights being tethered to new wearers. She recalled the Hierophant's words, too. Tell Red I want the book. Tell Red we can share. Tell Red that I will rip him to pieces. Why would a blight agree to be tethered? Charlie asked. Raven shrugged. Most don't. Charlie gestured toward the bowl. Those are blights, right? But giving them blood, that gives them power, right? A little, Raven agreed. You're wondering why I'd want to do that. Charlie eyed them, thinking about Red and the Hierophant, and the feeling of a shadow making her mouth move. I was actually wondering how much blood it would take to make a shadow powerful enough to be a blight without its glomus dying. I'll tell you what, said Raven standing. I'll give you a demonstration of both. Her shadow shrouded her hand in what appeared to be a glove of fog. She reached out and plucked one shade up from where it licked at the bowl. It wriggled in her hand, but the other was holding what appeared to be a needle and thread, all formed from shadow. It continued to twist like an eel or jellyfish, or some internal organ dragged outside of the body, and also like none of those things. If you looked fast, it might seem that Raven was miming holding something, that she stabbed an imaginary needle into an imaginary thing. Charlie couldn't decide if she was more disgusted or fascinated. Raven saw her expression and smiled. Every time an alterationist changes someone, we have to use some of our own shadow to do it. If we're not careful, we'll give ourselves away, piece by piece, until there's nothing left. But I'm careful. These little shadows, they're nothing. No cleverness in them, barely any consciousness. Might not even survive being stitched to a person. But you're right that, strictly speaking, they're blights. Shadows that have survived being apart from their wearer. On the steps, Charlie could see a few slinking off now that their feast was over, but some still remained, a translucent darkness, like a film in the air. This part might freak you out, Raven said. You can close your eyes if you want. There was absolutely no way she was going to look away like a coward. I'm good. Raven took the shadow and dropped it into her open mouth. Charlie bit her lip to keep from making an astonished sound. That hadn't been at all what she was expecting. Raven continued with a smile. When a Glomus puts a piece of their consciousness into their shadow, they grow a kind of homunculus. Power is only part of what makes a blight. If you don't want your shadow to be separate from you, don't consider it as separate. Never name it. And never feed it blood that's not yours. Because that's giving it energy that also isn't yours. Charlie nodded. But most blights are formed on the deathbed. Glomists often push parts of themselves into their shadow in those last moments. Often all of their fear and pain. Scary things get made like that, but powerful things. To create a blight without that would probably require stealing energy. Maybe through someone else's deathbed and someone else's blood. Charlie thought of Salt and what he'd done to her, of her fingers around a knife. If it was powerful enough, could it control you? Could it puppet you? Raven studied her for a long moment. I've never heard of a shadow being able to control the person to whom it's attached. 
But there's only one way to be entirely safe. To have no shadow at all. The shadowless can't be controlled. There's a door shut inside them. The shadowless can't be controlled. Could that be why Vince cut his shadow loose? To avoid being puppeted by his grandfather the way she had been? To avoid being controlled by Red? Raven turned to Charlie. I think that's enough answers for you. And so help me, if you fuck me over, I'll make sure you wind up the next Hierophant, with something ancient whispering in your ear while you chase down blights until one of them catches you and devours you whole. I'll bring you Knight's Papers, Charlie promised. Bring more bear claws when you do, Raven said, sending Charlie back into a night that felt more full of shadows than before. The next afternoon, Charlie sat at the kitchen table with pens in either hand and two sheets of notebook paper with tattered edges beneath them. In synchronized movements, she wrote the same words over and over on both pages. Hey, dummy, is your brain split yet? I didn't know you were ambidextrous, Posey said, frowning at her. Not sure I am, said Charlie. But maybe good enough is good enough. Posey got a seltzer out of the fridge and popped the tab. She leaned against the counter and watched Charlie write. Do you feel like your consciousness is bifurcating? Charlie sighed and stopped writing. I don't know. If it was, what could I do? Posey pointed to her shadow. Try moving your fingers. Those fingers, I mean. Charlie frowned in concentration, focusing on attempting to feel a hand that wasn't attached to her. But no matter how hard she stared or tried to shift her consciousness or tried to think in two places at once, there was no perceptible change. Posey shook her head. Okay, what about lengthening it? That seemed even harder to Charlie, but she complied, attempting to imagine her shadow spreading like it was melting. She tried to make it ooze, even just to blur a bit at the edges. Again, nothing. I'm trying she told her sister, forestalling any criticism. Maybe you could try to inhabit your shadow, Posey said. Charlie threw up her hands in frustration. What's that supposed to mean? Posey shrugged. They went on like that, with Posey looking up exercises online and Charlie becoming increasingly frustrated. Eventually, Posey had a Zoom call with a client, bringing their session to an end. Charlie was relieved to give up. She pulled out her own laptop and stared at the screen. With a sigh, she pulled up the article about Edmund Carver's death, copying over the name of the girl whose body was found in the car with his and putting it into the search engine. Rose Aliband. There weren't many mentions of her, the longest being from a week after she went missing. Family and friends of Rose Aliband are asking the public to share any information that could lead investigators to her location. Aliband, 23, went missing a week ago after what was described by witnesses as a heated argument with a friend. According to investigators, she'd been spending time with some new people. Her cell phone was found by the side of Interstate 91, just past exit 19B, with a SIM card removed. Aliband's mother extends this plea. Rose was a nice girl who trusted people too easily. She thought magic was all fun and didn't understand how people would use her for what she could do. I am terrified to think what might have happened to her. If anyone has seen my daughter or has any information about her whereabouts, please, we're begging you to call 911 and report anything, no matter how small. Vince could have had something to do with Rose Alaban's disappearance. He'd convinced Charlie to trust him, after all. She'd gotten in his van lots of times. A nice girl wouldn't have stood a chance. But to be that person, he would have to be what Salt had called him, a shapeshifter. Because the Vince she'd known was the kind of person who'd go to the store and get those stupid bran flakes because they were healthy, and Charlie had been wanting to eat healthier. Who'd patched up Charlie's cuts just because she'd been bleeding. But if Red had committed the murders, Vince would feel responsible. Red had been part of him, after all. Lucifer came over and butted her head against the edge of the laptop. Absently, she scratched under the cat's chin. Lionel Salt wanted Charlie to believe that Vince was planning to use the Lieber Noctum 
to make his shadow into some kind of immortal monster. According to Knight Singh, it wasn't worth what Salt paid for it. But the Hierophant sure acted like the book did something. If Salt were right, and Vince intended to do this ritual with Red, what was he waiting for? He'd had the book for a year, and it wasn't like he was a procrastinator. He didn't put stuff off. He was the only person in her household who had ever taken lint out of the dryer. Impulsively, she typed Edmund Carver plus Adeline Salt into the browser window. Scrolled through articles with more photos of them. Vince with a scarf around his throat. Adeline hanging off his shoulder as though trying to appear far more sober than she was. A small smear of lipstick at the very corner of her mouth. Then a gossip blog article with aerial photos of some people on a yacht. Charlie squinted. On the prow, two bodies were entangled with one another, half hidden by a shade sail. The woman's blonde hair was tossed to one side, and her bikini top was pushed up. The man was bent over her, but she knew him even without seeing his face. She knew them both. Adeline and Vince. Is Eris cheating on shipping tycoon? Charlie couldn't help remembering how Adeline had outright said she was glad he and Charlie weren't together anymore. And all those photos of Adeline and Edmund together at all those fundraisers, balls, and parties in New York. Never anyone else by his side, or hers. Couldn't help thinking of the photo in his wallet. Posey came in, leaning against the doorframe. She was holding a pack of worn tarot cards in her hand. What are you looking at? Proof the Hall family curse is real, Charlie said, and closed her laptop. How about you shuffle the deck and pick three cards? Charlie gave her a look. Oh, come on. Think of tarot as a psychological tool, Posey told her. Accessing the unconscious. Young was all for it. And you need to get the part of your mind that's holding you back from being a glomist. Fine, Charlie said, accepting the stack. She shuffled them as though she was about to play poker. Concentrate on your question, Posey told her. It helps if you close your eyes. Ask the cards what's blocking your magic. But what Charlie wanted to know was about Red. She flipped over the top three cards without looking and handed them to Posey. Maybe this is why people went to psychics in the end. Because they needed help and stopped caring how they got it. Any port in this motherfucking storm. These are all major arcana, her sister said, frowning at them. Interesting. What does that mean? Posey didn't look happy. That something big is going on. Okay, Charlie said uncertainly. What else? Posey set down the first card. The magician. The conversion of the spiritual into material. It's a card of new beginnings. So I'm guessing this is about you being a glomist. Nothing we don't know, Charlie said, although she was a bit impressed. Posey set down the second. The fool. Charlie rolled her eyes. See how he's about to step off that cliff and is oblivious to the danger. I see. Charlie's sister looked at the final card, raised an eyebrow, and grinned. Ooh, looks like there's a taboo that you're in danger of breaking. Charlie frowned. Which card is that? Posey showed it to her. A religious figure sat on a throne in red robes holding up his hands as two monks knelt before him. The Hierophant. That night, Charlie went down to the basement and took out the aerial silk that she hadn't practiced on for months, the one that was supposed to keep her limber enough to slither through windows like the Grinch. She strung the cloth up on a hook, shook off the dust and at least one annoyed spider. Then she climbed in and went through the old exercises the ones she used to do every morning before pickpocketing practice. She was stiffer than she used to be, but as her muscles warmed, she found herself relaxing into the rhythm of it. On the wall, her shadow followed every pose. 24. Sad Songs on Repeat The next morning, Charlie brought a cup of coffee back to her mattress on the floor and finally returned the call from Rapture. They wanted her to come in the following night and then go back to working regular hours for the rest of the week. 
Charlie was fine with that, so long as she could take off Saturday for Salt's party. Book or not, she was going to have to attend. Then, after taking a huge sip of coffee, as the lazy golden light spilled over her worn sheets, she called the bursar's office at UMass. A grouchy-sounding woman picked up. Can you look up my outstanding bill? Charlie asked. It's under Posey Hall. Hold on, the woman said with a long, suffering sigh. Charlie bit the skin around the edge of her thumb, trying not to play out the worst possible scenarios. It looks like you missed a deadline, the woman said. There's a hold on your account. Charlie's heart kicked up. No, I had until the end of the month. I have the letter around here somewhere. End of last month, the woman said. For a moment, all Charlie could do was stare at the wall. It was possible that Doreen had gotten her brother to do this, but it was equally possible that Charlie had made a mistake. I can get it to you, she said. Monday. Monday, or you wash out and have to reapply for next semester, the woman said impatiently and hung up. Charlie flopped back on her bed, looking up at the ceiling, trying to convince herself to keep going. If she stopped, she might not get out of that bed for weeks. She dialed Vince's boss, a story ready. But as soon as he picked up the phone, he launched into a tirade. Tell that son of a bitch that he's dead to me. You hear that? You tell him that he can't just go on a bender and expect to have a job when he sobers up. He's not... Charlie started, but he'd already hung up. And even if he hadn't, he obviously had no idea where Vince was. Three calls, two hang-ups. Maybe she'd lost her touch. Charlie sighed, letting her head fall back to her pillow. She missed him and wasn't sure she'd ever known him. She might be able to guess where Vince would go, but Remy Carver was an utter mystery. But maybe not to Dr. Liam Cloven, who'd sold three valuable books to Paul Echo, who'd obviously known a lot more than he'd let on. Charlie got up and started pulling off the sweatpants she'd slept in, her shadow following her motions. She watched it against the wall, stepping into panties, tugging its bra over its head, tying back its hair with an elastic band. We're magic, she whispered to her shadow, to herself. There was no response. Are you hungry? She asked. As she moved her hand to her leg, the hairs stood up on the back of her neck and prickled all along her arms. She hooked a nail under the hard edge of a scab and pulled at it, like she was ripping off a band-aid. Blood came sluggishly, beating up and running off her ankle. It never hit the floor. After a breakup, it was normal to listen to sad songs on repeat. It was normal to spend hours staring at old photos and letters, or burning them on the grill or even drawing devil horns on every picture you could find of your ex. Normal to eat an entire carton of ice cream on the couch and wash it down with a bottle of Chardonnay. Normal to talk about the guy incessantly to your friends, to call his number just to hear his voice on the answering machine, and then hang up without leaving a message. But just because people did those things didn't mean they were good ideas. More like pressing a bruise to check if it still hurt. Going to bother your ex-boyfriend's roommate felt a lot like one of those things people did, but shouldn't. It took a few more calls, but Charlie discovered that Liam Cloven was a resident at Bay State Medical Center. That made getting to him more difficult in some ways, and simpler in others. Charlie couldn't just make an appointment and confront him when he came in to treat her for her bunions or whatever. But medical residents are famously exhausted, and exhaustion means limited attention. Liam was going to be concentrating on his job, which meant that he'd have nothing left over to detect a trap before it sprang. Not only that, but Liam Cloven was on the cusp of all his hard work paying off. He'd sacrificed a lot of wild nights to get where he was, put in the time studying, took out loans. As a medical resident, he was so close to six figures that he must be able to taste them. He had plenty to lose. Charlie had practically nothing. There were several ways to waylay medical students, but the simplest was to hang out in the cafeteria around lunchtime. They might have lectures or other duties keeping them from a particular hour, but if she waited, he'd get hungry eventually. 
but to spot him, she was going to have to figure out what he looked like. Her initial searches online were fruitless. No photos of him with other medical residents at Bay State, although she scrolled through official images for the better part of an hour. He didn't seem to even have a Facebook. Finally, she discovered a picture of him in Remy's graduating class at NYU. There he was, Liam Cloven, red-haired, squinting against the sun. And not far off, Edmund Vincent Carver, looking straight into the camera. Charlie pulled out clothes she used for this kind of role. A pale blue turtleneck to cover her tattoos, her regular jeans, a brown bobbed wig that she could shove her hair under, neutral makeup. By the time she'd driven to Bay State Medical Center and parked as far out into the visitor lot as was possible, she'd slid into character. Inside, she gave her driver's license to the board woman at the desk, and when asked, claimed to be meeting a cousin in the cafeteria. That part of the hospital was open to the public, so no one had any follow-up questions. She asked for directions at the gift shop, her gaze checking for cameras as she went. There were plenty. The Bay State cafeteria reminded her of the one at the community college where she'd taken two classes in psychology before dropping out and taking a six-week bartending course instead. It had steel counters, no surface that couldn't be quickly wiped clean. The smells were familiar, too. Reheated frozen things and gravies thickened with cornstarch, milky chowder, onions, and hazelnut coffee. Charlie found a table in a corner and waited. After the first half hour went by without incident, she got up and found herself a pre-packaged ham with Swiss on rye, a coffee, and a water. By the time Charlie returned, someone had snagged her table. She found a new spot, chewed, and checked her phone. She had an angry and possibly booze-soaked message from Adam on her real phone. You bitch, you should have just left us alone. You think that Orine is I to leave me because of what you said to her? Then you have another thing coming. She is as angry at you as I am, and ain't maybe more now that I told her, wait, had you tricked me and stole what was mine. She told me everything. Bitch, 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 I hope her you die. She set the cell down on the table, feeling as though it had bitten her. She ought to have seen that the situation was going to go bad once she'd lifted the book. Now. Susie Lampton had told her it was going to blow up in her face way before that. I hope her you die too, fuck knuckle, Charlie thought, and deleted the message. She was trying to calculate just how much she'd screwed up when Liam Cloven walked into the cafeteria. He was pale and skinny, with a reddish beard. Since he was a classmate of Edmund's, she knew he had to be around her age, but the scrubs and facial hair made him seem older because he'd done something with his life. Not like her, Charlie Hall, spending half her time trying to blunt her fangs and the rest of it hunting. She waited until he'd gotten his food and found a table. Hello, she said, sitting down next to him. Mind if I sit here? Now some guys think that women con artists have it easy. That all they have to do is show some leg, like Bugs Bunny hitchhiking in drag, and the mark screeches to a halt tongue lolling. First of all, that's not even a little bit true. And second of all, if a woman decides a low-cut top is necessary, that's because cons work differently for her. Offer a man a business opportunity and he's suspicious. Not that it's a con, but that because she's a woman, she doesn't know what she's talking about. It's a delicate business to act clever enough to be taken seriously and still make him feel like he can screw her over. And if he wants to screw her too, well, that's an even more delicate business. But while the disadvantages that a woman con artist had were manifold, there were advantages. For instance, women seemed less threatening. If a man had sat down across from Liam, he would have reacted differently. He might not want Charlie there, but he didn't seem worried she was dangerous. No, he said annoyed. I mean, yes, I do mind. I really don't want company. She reached over and took his hand. He jerked it away from her, which made sense. Who wanted a total stranger grabbing you? Charlie let her eyes fill with tears. She pressed her fingers to her mouth in horror. But it's the truth, she sobbed, loud enough for people, including nurses and doctors, to hear her. He started to stand. No doubt he wanted to get away from her as quickly as possible. A totally reasonable reaction. 
The problem with reasonable reactions, though, was that they were easy to predict. She grabbed his wrist, and this time she spoke low enough that only he could hear. Sit the fuck down, Liam Cloven, or I'm going to make such a scene that everyone in this room is going to believe that when you treated my dying father, I smelled alcohol on your breath. I am going to be loud, and I'm going to be convincing. Or you can tell me what I want to know, and I will act like you're a sympathetic doctor comforting a patient through a tragedy. You can even pick the tragedy, if you like. That was the other advantage women con artists had. The flip side of not being taken seriously. To the public, they looked like Marks. Who are you? He was obviously furious, but he sat in the chair across from her. What do you want? This won't take long, she said. I just have a few questions about Edmund Carver. His frown deepened. You were at my door the other day. She probably only had a few minutes before he managed to shake her. Where is he? Dead, he said. Try again, she told him. He started to stand. I don't need to tell you anything. Maybe you also got me pregnant, she mused. This isn't a soap opera, he hissed. Not yet it isn't, she told him, eyebrows raised. He glared, but he sat, put his head in his hand. Then he grabbed his sandwich and started taking it out of the plastic. Look, he paid me to let him keep some stuff at my apartment and to use the address for mail he didn't want his grandfather to see. That's it. What did he keep there? Charlie asked, wondering if it could be this easy. He had a closet with a padlock on it. It wasn't any of my business what he kept in there. But you knew, Charlie said, hoping that if she sounded sure, he'd believe she was sure. Some. Liam looked across the cafeteria, as though hoping to spot someone who could save him. A spare phone, books from his father's collection, clothes, his driver's license, a fucking Krugerrand, if you can believe it. He was planning on leaving. I know that. Then you, what, broke in there and sold his books to Paul Echo? He asked me to sell them, Liam said, a little too loudly. She smiled to let him know that he'd screwed up because the sale of those books occurred after Remy was supposed to be dead. And when was that? Liam sighed. Okay. I saw him that night, okay? He showed up absolutely out of his mind. He was practically naked, wearing a woman's robe he told me he swiped out of a laundromat. Bare feet. It wasn't himself. Said he needed me to sell some books for him. I did it. I didn't know about the girl... I didn't know about any of it. And then you helped him fake his death, Charlie said. You got a body out of the hospital, is that it? No! Liam half stood before realizing how many people had turned to look at him. He sat back down, even angrier. No, of course not. I had nothing to do with that, any of it. What did he say happened to him? He shrugged. He didn't. What I worry is that he came from killing someone and got rid of his clothes because they were covered in blood. But back then, I figured his grandfather had thrown him out after he discovered Remy had a plane ticket booked for Atlanta. Something drove Vince away from that house. After years of going along with whatever monstrous business his grandfather was engaged in. On his own, he'd be broke after more than a decade of living like a prince and he'd been poor enough that he wouldn't have any illusions about what that would be like, or how quickly a couple of grand of stolen money could get spent. What was in Georgia? Liam nodded, rubbed his face. His mother. She was the one whose letters he was trying to hide from his grandfather. She died of an overdose the night before he showed up at the apartment. It must have pushed him over the edge. Did he seem like the kind of person who could kill someone? Charlie knew the way she was asking was wrong, that it was giving him cover to deny it. She wanted him to deny it. Liam considered the question. Remy had a morbid sense of humor, but I've heard worse. I'm a doctor. Gallo's humor is our thing. She smiled encouragingly. Anyone can do anything under the right circumstances, he went on. And look, one of the doctors that works here is known for being generous with the prescriptions. I saw Remy's cousin Adeline buy some ketamine off him. 
Rich partiers like prescription drugs. They're more expensive than street drugs, but come in safer formulations. And you're dealing with people unlikely to roll you. Who knows what Remy was into when he wasn't around me? Ketamine? Charlie's friends are more of a weed and oxy crowd. It makes you disassociative, Liam said. In lower doses, it confers feelings of euphoria. In higher doses, people enter a state not unlike a coma, except they're partially conscious. Sometimes unable to speak, they can have hallucinations and memory loss. Charlie wondered what had been in her drink all that time ago. And that's enough for me, Liam said, moving to stand. I don't know where he is, and I don't know where the book is either, okay? The book? Charlie echoed. Liam snorted. You think you're the first person to come around looking for it? Or him? Two months after Remy showed up half naked, this young guy comes by, muttering to himself, never taking his hands out of his pockets, threatening me. There have been other visits since, too. If I knew where Remy was, I would tell the police, not any of you. Charlie took out her phone and flipped to a photo of her with Vince. They were at the Lowe's in Hadley on Throwback Friday, waiting to see the Bride of Frankenstein. It wasn't a great picture. He was a little blurry. But it was still obviously him. I was his friend. See? Liam appeared visibly relieved. I still don't know anything. Remy's gone. He mailed me something. Charlie reached into her pocket and took out a tiny key. It was actually to a music box her mother had given Posey, but it was small and silver and might have gone to anything. And said that if anything happened to him, I'd know where to look. But I have no idea where to even start. He insisted it was important, that it had something important in it. I was hoping it would prove he was innocent. If you can't help me find him, you can help me find that. It wasn't the worst story Charlie had ever come up with. Liam frowned, considering. Back in college, Remy's grandfather would yank him out for weeks at a time, on a whim. And when Remy came back, he'd be a mess. What kind of mess? Charlie asked. Angry, Liam said. But because he didn't know when it was going to happen, he hid stuff, even back then. He used to talk about how there are places rich people will never see, even if they're staring right at them. If he really hid something, he would hide it in a place like that. Charlie wondered if, when Liam was a surgeon and rich, he would look past those places too. Wondered if that was the dream. She reached across the table to put her hand on his arm, trying to radiate sincerity. Thanks for talking with me, even though I pressured you into it. Remy always said you were a good guy. Liam gave her a sad smile. I thought he was too. Out in the parking lot, the sun had sunk low and red behind the buildings. Charlie checked the time on her phone. One more night before she had to be back at Rapture. Four more days before Salt wanted his book. Liam's description of the person who'd been looking for Vince had matched the Hierophant. She knew he wanted the book and had apparently been wanting it for a while. But what she still couldn't figure was, lies aside, what all these people actually wanted the thing for. The sound of footsteps interrupted her thoughts. A man was behind her, his footfalls faster the closer he got. 25. Black Cat. Toad. Crow. There's a moment of dissonance when people break the social contract. A moment when the civilized mind searches for some reason why a person might be running toward you that doesn't mean they're out to get you. Luckily, Charlie's mind wasn't particularly civilized. She raced for her car. He chased after, boots thudding dully on the asphalt. She ran full out. Eight hours on her feet most nights meant her leg muscles were no joke. But he was already too close and had momentum on his side. He caught her arm, spinning her around. She stumbled against her car and looked up into his face. Adam? His eyes were bloodshot and his breath could peel paint. But it was him nonetheless. He grabbed hold of her wig and tugged hard. It ripped loose, pulling pins and hair with it. Charlie Hall, you miserable, monstrous bitch! Thought you were going to con me and then rob me? Yeah, something like that, Charlie said evenly, meeting his gaze. No point in denying it. 
He hit her, knuckles hard against her cheek. The back of her head hit the window of her car. She would have fallen, except her fingers caught the handle of the door and she was able to hold on and stay mostly upright. He punched her in the stomach. All the air went out of her. She curled around the pain like a pill bug. Charlie might talk tough, but she had never been in a real fistfight. Even with her sister, they'd mostly resorted to hair pulling and the occasional mean scratch. Think, Charlie, she told herself, but shock and pain dulled her thoughts. Where's the book? He shouted. Give it to me. Gone, she managed. I am going to break your face, he told her. Your ugly fucking face. I am so sick of hearing about you. Everyone thinks you were so great, but I'm better. Do you hear that? I was always the best. She spat at him. Saliva sprayed his cheek. He flinched in surprise, closing his eyes, giving her a moment to tear out of his arms. Racing around to the other side of her car, she jerked open the door. He grabbed her throat. And then she was in two places, as though there were more than three dimensions to the world. Her consciousness split. She was both the person screaming and trying to claw at his hand, and she was something else, which rammed into him from the side. Her shadow. She felt a pull somewhere in the center of her, and she saw it. A figure all of darkness, as though someone cut a hole in the universe. Her. And not her. A mirror that reflected back no light. He stumbled, and her butt hit the seat before he got hold of her again. Animal instinct took over. Her body went wild, kicking and screaming. One kick landed against his upper arm. Another scraped his knuckles. He howled in pain and let go of her. Charlie yanked the door shut. She slammed her hand down on the lock button. The clicking sound from all four doors felt deafening. Adam pulled on the door handle and Charlie had a horrible moment of being sure that it would open. He beat his fists against the glass window. She just sat there, her fingers running over the steering wheel. He was shouting at her, but her mind felt far away, numb with shock. Even though she'd known Adam was terrible and that she'd robbed him, she'd underestimated the danger. A year out of the game and she was fucking up left and right. Though it was dormant, there was something new between Charlie and her shadow, a buzzing of sensation, an almost umbilical connection, a phantom limb, a homunculus. With shaking hands, Charlie rooted out the key from her bag. Thankfully, the car roared to life. Adam pounded on the hood, and Charlie gave him a momentary warning of revving the engine before hitting the gas. He reeled back just in time to avoid being hit. Heart thundering, Charlie steered herself out of the parking lot. At the first red light, everything looked a little hazy, as though she was seeing it through a vaseline lens. She realized her eye was starting to swell. Also, she thought she might be having a slight panic attack. She pulled over at a gas station about a mile away and checked her face in the mirror. Her left eye was purpling. Her mouth was cut, upper lip swollen like an esthetician had gone ham with a needle full of filler. Charlie was a mess. There were enough people wanting to knock her around that they were going to have to take a number, like at a deli counter. And what had it taken out of her shadow? She remembered Vince's words about unspooling, remembered that it was freshly quickened, with no reserves of energy. She had to feed it. Charlie couldn't remember where she'd first seen an image of a witch feeding her familiar from a third nipple. She recalled a woodcut, or an illustration meant to look like one. It must have been in the research she did for the Inquisition, back when she was Alonzo. As a kid, Charlie hadn't believed third nipples could be real until she looked them up. It turned out they could show up anywhere on the body. Imagine having a nipple on the back of your calf, or on the knuckle of your finger. It made her think of a pronouncement some misogynist barstool scholar once made with great seriousness. Martinis are like breasts. One is too few, and three are too many. Which was bullshit. Ask anyone who'd been through surgery to remove a tumor, or any fan of science fiction, or anyone who liked martinis. Ask her shadow which was curled around her, nursing as tightly on her skin as any familiar. Black cat, toad, 
crow, spirits sent from the devil to make mischief in the world. One wound was fine for it, although even a few drops of blood are hard to squeeze out when your scabs were shallow and are healing. You're okay, she soothed, as though to a child after a fall. You're okay now, right? So hard not to think of it as a separate thing. So hard not to treat it like one. So hard not to love it. Or not feel responsible for it. It settled back into place. A cloak on her back. A carpet at her feet. A veil. Real magic. Her magic. It was never great to get punched in the face. But Charlie found herself smiling through her split lip. Until she realized that to have followed her from the hospital... Adam must have tailed her to the hospital, which meant that he knew where she lived. And as angry as he was, he might drive straight there. She picked up her cell and cradling it painfully against her cheek, called Posey. It rang and rang. I know you're awake, she muttered. Posey's voicemail started up. She must be Zooming with a client. Charlie tried her again, letting it ring, hang up and calling right back. Finally, Posey picked up. Charlie, I'm... You've got to get out of the house, now. Why do you sound so weird? Charlie didn't have time to explain about her swollen lip. Seriously, now a coffee shop, the drugstore, doesn't matter where. Just pick up your laptop and your wallet, go out the back door and hop the low fence into our neighbor's yard, the one with the trampoline. What? I am going to stay on the line while you do it. I'm in the middle of a card reading, Posey protested. It's got to be right now, Charlie said. Give me a sec. Charlie could hear her talking to someone in a conciliatory way, although she couldn't make out the words, hopefully explaining to her client that she had to go. She came back a moment later. You know I can't drive. I will be with you the whole way, Charlie said, keeping her voice calm and low. Radio voice hostage negotiator voice. I promise, I'm coming to pick you up. There was a long silence on the other end of the phone. Please, Posey. So much for staying calm. Hurry. Fine. The backyard? So you're not visible from the street. Charlie wanted to get on the highway and race toward home, trying to beat Adam. But she knew it was better to focus on getting her sister out of the house. Just, you know, quick. As Posey moved through the house, grabbing some things she said she needed and herding Lucifer into a cat carrier, Charlie dug her fingernails into the mound of her thumb. She wanted to scream at Posey to move faster. She wanted to do anything but sit there in the parking lot, hurt and powerless. Some huffing and rustling later, Posey said, Okay, I'm outside with the cat. I'm heading toward the back. Go over the fence, Charlie said. You're almost gone. You've got to explain... I will, I promise. And I'm sorry. What if the neighbors... Just keep going. Don't look back. Go, go, go. Okay, Posey said, sounding fragile. I'm over the fence. You know I hate walking through someone else's property. What if Elias comes outside and yells at me for cutting through his yard? You're doing great. All you have to do is keep going. Avoid the main roads and cut through to... Charlie tried to think. There were a lot of streets crisscrossing around there. It would be easy to choose the wrong one. She didn't think Adam knew what Posey looked like, but a woman with a cat carrier was hard to miss. There was a Williston library one way, attached to a private high school for rich kids that had perks like riding horses. Posey might be able to talk her way inside, but she'd have to deliver her story with conviction. In the other direction was a Duncan, a lunch place that would already be closed, a tattoo studio called Needle Inc., Union Package Liquor Store, and Glory of India, which mostly did takeout. You should have come out on Clark, so cut through the parking lot on School Street. You're going into Union Package. Browse the wines until I get there. What if they don't allow pets? Posey asked. Then we'll figure out something else. There's a Walgreens that's not far. Charlie waited, listening to the sound of Posey's breath, until she heard the jangle of the bell on the shop door. You're coming right away? Posey asked in a hushed voice. Right away, Charlie confirmed and hung up. This was why she'd stayed away from glow mists, away from cons and heists of magic. 
How had she not yet learned the lesson of juggling knives? Even when you kept them all in the air, you still cut yourself on the blades. She glanced at her shadow one more time, trying to shift her perception toward it. It flickered in response. Okay, she said, and pulled out of the gas station. Her car sped down the highway, the rattling of the engine barely noticeable. Whatever Vince had done held even as she pressed down on the gas and wove around delivery trucks and commuters. Her swollen eye made it hard to switch lanes to the left, and a pickaxe of a headache cleaved through her thoughts, which were mostly a litany of what else could go wrong. What if Adam decides he needs a shot of courage before he busts into my house and goes into the nearby liquor store? What if he is following my car right now? What if he has an accomplice? What if Lucifer pees in the cage and gets Posey kicked out at just the moment when... Charlie pulled up to the curb and fought down a wild urge to jump out of the car. Keeping the engine running, she called Posey. Her sister picked up on the second ring. I'm out front, Charlie said, feeling out of breath despite having done nothing more than drive. Maybe she'd cracked a rib. A few minutes later, Posey emerged with a bottle wrapped in a paper bag, an overstuffed backpack on her shoulder, and the cat crate swinging from her hand. She climbed into the back. Lucifer let out a miserable yowl as her cage was unceremoniously dumped into the seat well. I got both our laptops and some wine for mom. Mom? Charlie echoed. But Posey had lost interest in that line of conversation. She was gaping at Charlie in the rearview mirror. What happened to your face? And who are you afraid is coming to our house? Is it Vince? Did he threaten you? Vince? Charlie gave her sister an exasperated look. Posey frowned. I don't know. Was it the Glomis from Rapture? Charlie shook her head, pulling away from the street. She needed to put some distance between them and anywhere close to her house. That guy's dead. What? Posey's eyes widened. What do you mean, dead? Check behind us. See if anyone's following, Charlie told her. Posey shrugged off her backpack and turned around, kneeling up on the seat. She looked pale and a little sweaty. How am I supposed to tell? You keep watching. Not just the cars behind us, but the cars behind them. I don't know. I've only seen it done in movies. Charlie took a turn. No one follows the exact same route, especially the one I am going to take doubling back on the same roads. So if they stay with us too long, we worry. Okay, Posey said, staring. Are you okay? Charlie asked, her gaze on the road. Of course I am, Posey said. You're the one with the face that's swelling like a balloon. Now will you explain? Doreen has this on-again, off-again boyfriend named Adam, Charlie started. The guy you were texting, Posey said. Charlie nodded remembering her sister grabbing her phone on Wednesday, back when it had seemed as though she wasn't going to blow up her life again. So Doreen beat you up? For messing around with her boyfriend? No, are you serious? Adam was pissed because I ratted him out and stole something from him. Put like that, it did sound bad. Which he deserved. And that thing I stole, he stole first. I don't think anyone's following us, Posey told her slumping down and returning to a normal, legal seated position. Can we go home? Charlie shook her head. Let's give Adam a night to cool off, where he doesn't know where I am. I'll talk to Doreen. She'll calm him down. Posey frowned at the window, clearly unhappy. Charlie sighed. Sorry about your client. You know that Vince knew about Adam, right? Posey said. That I was conning him? Charlie cut her gaze to her sister in the mirror. How could he? Okay, knew was the wrong way to put it. He thought he knew about Adam. Just come out with it, Charlie said. He heard me reading off your phone. You know, about meeting Adam in private. Charlie felt sick. Did he say something? He asked me if I saw when you were going to have the meeting. Posey looked deeply uncomfortable and said that I was right about him, that I'd been right all along. And what did you say? Nothing, Posey told her. I was too surprised. I really didn't think he noticed what I said or what I thought. And I guess maybe I wasn't fair to him. 
Now you think that? Charlie had to force her foot away from the gas. So strong was her impulse to take out her feelings on the road. Posey shrugged. He was too calm. I was always waiting for the other shoe to drop, for him to hurt you. I mean, hot built guys are supposed to be assholes. I figured he was probably bad news. But in the end, even though he was a huge liar, I think he might have been your most successful relationship. Charlie briefly contemplated driving them both off the road and straight into a tree. I wasn't the only one who lied. He'd said that when they were fighting. Now, much too late, she understood what he'd meant. I couldn't give you what you needed. I kept things from you. Even if you didn't know what was wrong, you could tell there wasn't enough of me. On Friday morning, when he'd gone to Rapture to pick her up, had he known she was supposed to meet Adam? She would thought he was there because he'd been worried her car wouldn't start. But what if he'd been there expecting to find her with someone else? I wish I could say I was sorry. That I wanted to be honest the whole time, but I didn't. I never wanted to be honest. I just wanted what I told you to be the truth. Charlie had always believed that nothing really touched Vince, because everything he really cared about had been left behind in his old life, the one he was exiled from, the one to which he longed to return. But it was entirely possible that he'd hated his old life, and that she'd lost more than she ever realized she had. 26. The Past The glass of champagne in Remy's hand was warming too fast. Too many bodies pressed together. All around him, delicate laughter floated through the stifling air. Adeline was talking to a viscount or a baronet or someone with one of those titles that didn't come with any money but did come with invitations to parties. It bothered Remy a little, that he could tell that without trying, that his eye automatically picked out the lack of tailoring in the man's suit and the worn leather strap of a third-generation Rolex. He tried to convince himself that it was mere cleverness and not snobbery, but knew it wasn't entirely true. He'd gotten used to having money he didn't earn and feeling smug about it. The fundraiser was being hosted in the home of one of Remy's ridiculously wealthy school chums. It was to benefit children of some kind. Maybe they'd been sick. Maybe they were going to be given art therapy or ponies, or their ponies would be given art therapy. It didn't matter. There was a theme, too, Old Hollywood, which basically meant wear something fancy or ridiculous or both. That didn't matter either. The important thing was for the young people to get their parents to shell out a donation of 50 grand. 10 would go into their youthful pockets, with 40 left for the charity. Later, he and his friends would take their ill-gotten gains and go to a club where they'd get bottle service and drink enough to forget the whole night. Remy would dance and howl at the moon and stagger back to his grandfather's pied-à-terre with his arm around Adeline, every choice he'd ever made seeming worth it in those giddy pre-dawn hours. His phone pinged, bringing him back to the present. His grandmother, again, suggesting they meet for brunch the following day. Terrible idea. Not only was he planning on being extraordinarily hungover, but he didn't want to talk about the only subject they had in common, his mother who hadn't been doing so well at the new rehab. Being with his grandmother made him feel a rush of longing mixed with resentment, and that was the other reason he didn't want to see her. He didn't like feeling things. He'd lived with her when he was small, he and his mom. He'd had a bed all to himself, and they'd eaten dinner together every night. But mom wound up stomping out, dragging him with her. And that had been that. Remy felt exhausted by the thought of brunch but he felt guilty about making an excuse and not going. Maybe he felt something other than guilty, but he didn't want to dwell on it. You're ashamed, Red whispered to him, always there in the back of his head, like a fucking evil cricket masquerading as a conscience. You don't have to feel that way. I can be ashamed for both of us. Remy glanced at his shadow, thrown on the floor, larger than he was in the light. Maybe Red could have brunch, and he could lie in bed. He might be able to hold Remy's shape for long enough. Between the murders and the energy Remy was feeding him, he was becoming alarmingly stronger. Each time he became a blight, he seemed to be able to do much more than before. What's the matter? 
Madeline asked. She was wearing a stiff vintage McQueen dress, covered in shining beads that gave the impression of slashes. She carried two old fashions, holding one out as though it was for him. Nothing, he said, tucking his phone back into his pocket. She grinned. Bored? She asked. I heard there's a pool in the basement. Come on, let's go skinny dipping. Rami snorted. Then he stashed his champagne flute behind a plant and took a slug of whiskey fragrant with orange peel. He loved Adeline's cheerful sociopathy. It reminded him of her father sometimes. But where his was bent toward conquering the universe, hers was bent toward fun. The fundraiser was being held in an Upper West Side townhouse, the kind that went for 50 million, easy. The kitchen was done up in brass and marble with a fancy Italian stove. The walls were papered in bright modern designs, hung with amusing art. Even the carpets were clever. One was in the pattern of a maze, and another had a wash of turquoise color over a traditional design. The place made Remy's head swim as they made their way to the stairs. It was so far from his grandfather's grim, fusty house with its dark wood and heavy drapes. He caught sight of himself in the mirrored bar. Black suit, white scarf around his neck, covetous eyes. Let's go, he said, pasting on his usual amiable smile. He had nothing to be unhappy about. He was having a wonderful night. The stairs spiraled down into a lower-level lounge full of scarlet and pink and pillows. The air was faintly perfumed with chlorine, and the windows glowed with subaquatic blue light. A chandelier projected shadows that dappled the ceiling with the shapes of goats and wolves. Unzip me, Adeline said, laughing as she turned around. Remy tossed back the rest of his drink. The world had blurred a little at the edges, and he had the beginning of a pleasant buzz. A woman in black pants and shirt came down the stairs at a run. Excuse me, she said, looking slightly panicked. You're not allowed here. Who are you? Adeline asked, sounding impressively haughty. I'm part of the staff. We've been asked to keep people out of the private parts of the house. Her tone was apologetic but firm. This is Jefferson's place, Remy told her. My friend. He doesn't care if we're down here. Well, his parents do. She nodded toward the glass in his hand. You've been drinking. It's an insurance thing. Red could make her change her tune, Adeline said to Remy. He rolled his eyes. Overkill. The woman took a step in the direction of the stairs. Probably the word kill, in any context, made her nervous. Let Red play, Adeline insisted, a cruel little smile on her mouth. Maybe it was because she'd been embarrassed, her zipper half down her back. Maybe it was the flip side of cheerful sociopathy. But when she was like this, she wouldn't back down. Come on, it'll be funny. Use your own shadow then, Remy told her. Or better yet, let's just go upstairs. This was the second quickened shadow to which she'd been tethered. The first one withered away, the graft failing. The second one took, but she seldom practiced with it. He thought it made her uncomfortable, but she didn't like admitting it. Adeline gave him a look. We are not going anywhere. What is it that I am supposed to do? He heard the question in his mind, felt his shadow's annoyance, and wasn't sure if it was his as well. Puppet her, Remy thought back. Make her go upstairs or say something stupid. Scare her. Don't hurt her. You don't want me to make her drown herself? He was almost sure Red was joking. There was a time that he would have had to maintain a bifurcated consciousness, but not anymore. Red just did things. Ideally, what you told him, but occasionally something else entirely. Remy could probably stop him if he tried. Probably. The woman gave a shudder and a gasp as Remy's shadow shifted to overlap hers. Adeline clapped her hands in delight. The woman's mouth moved grating outwards. I'm not getting paid enough for this shit. Go ahead. Use the pool, assholes. Remy laughed. He found it a little disturbing how much Red would have to know about people to come up with something so entirely realistic. But it was still funny. Adeline gave a sigh of annoyance. No, make her say something embarrassing. 
the woman's body moved jerkily, her eyes wild with panic. Stop ordering me around, Adeline, she said. I don't like it. Adeline turned to Remy, astonished and offended. Did you? Oh, come on, Remy said. He's just having a laugh. Then the woman gasped, hand going to her mouth as Red let her go. She looked at them both, tears starting in her eyes, then ran up the stairs. Adeline turned to Remy, eyes blazing. She was furious. Remy didn't think she'd have been so angry if he'd said that, but she thought of Red as a toy, and toys weren't supposed to answer back, especially not in public. Before she could lecture Remy on controlling his shadow, Madison, Topher, and Brooks thundered down the stairs. Topher had gone to the same prep school as Remy, and he and Adeline knew the others from running in the same circles. My man, Brooks said, going in for the one-armed guy hug. Heard there was a pool. Should have known you would get here first. Maddie had swiped a bottle of Don Julio 1942 from the mirrored bar. Oh, I should have gotten glasses, she said. I can pour a shot straight into your mouth, offered Remy, relaxing in their company. The five of them skinny dipped in the pool together, drinking tequila and laughing. Adeline seemed to forget about what had happened and everything was normal again. Then they put back on their clothes, got hold of Jefferson, his girlfriend, and someone else's cousin, and went out to the box, where acrobats were flying through the air, along with a single shadow. At various points, it held them suspended above the crowd, making them appear to be hanging on absolutely nothing. Topher wanted to roll bliss, and Adeline showed off her gloaming ability by sending him off. When she was done with him, he was in such a state that he could only loll in a corner of their private booth, murmuring to himself and twitching. Remy hoped that she'd given him the promised good time. She'd sent people off into week-long bouts of terror before, and by then, it was clear her foul mood had returned. Brooks and Jefferson, impressed, asked her a lot of questions in a way that made it clear they were interested in more than the answers. Maddie and the cousin had begun making out. Both their skirts pushed up so high that it was clear only one of them was wearing underwear. Remy tried to avoid Adeline's wrath by talking to the girls at the next booth, who recruited him to play a drinking game. You were supposed to all stare at one other person, and if you locked eyes, shout Medusa before the other did. He'd had at least three more shots of tequila when Adeline put her hand on his shoulder. She appeared to be quite drunk. Tell Red to kiss me. Remy was far from sober himself, but even he knew that was a bad idea. Come on, Adeline, sit down and play with us. Her shadow whipped toward one of the girls, smacking her in the head hard enough that she bit through the glass she was about to take a sip from. He stood as the girl's friends tried to use napkins to stop the bleeding. Remy didn't want to think about the girl's pink teeth. The way the chunk of glass had fallen onto the table, glossy with spit. Come on, let's go home. It's late. Don't you want Red to? She shouted as he dragged her through the club. Remy didn't answer. Tell him he has to do what I say. They were out on the street. Or I'll tell my father that he's a blight half the time. Remy groaned. Stop with the threats is exhausting. You're exhausting tonight. Tell him, she insisted. Fine, he lied. I just did. It wasn't like Red hadn't heard everything anyway. I think you're the one that made him be awful to me, she said. Remy didn't bother to deny it. They were both wasted and likely to get into a stupid argument. They'd been together too much these past few months, living in each other's pockets. It wasn't normal. They shared too many awful secrets. It was making them snipe at one another. Adeline was still sulking as they staggered into the pied a Remy didn't care. He was planning on going to bed and sleeping through brunch. He sobered up fast when he saw his grandfather waiting for them. He sat on the couch, a single light on, giving his face an eerie illumination. Have you ever heard of Cleophes of York? He asked them, as though continuing a conversation they'd been having. No, replied Remy hesitantly. This was the price of Salt's money, living on his terms and his time. A very old blight, Salt said. 
tethered five years ago. I think I figured out a way to talk to him without the person who's been wearing him knowing. We're going to try an experiment. Adeline frowned. What kind? Good old ketamine. He picked up a vial of liquid from the coffee table and shook it. I'm going to inject Edmund, and we'll see if that allows Red to puppet him. <sighs> I'm too drunk, Remy protested. Mixing booze and drugs is how rock stars die. Salt snorted. Don't flatter yourself. Now sit on the couch and roll up your sleeve. Seriously, Remy said. Tomorrow. Now, Salt corrected. You will find that I am very serious. Remy gave Adeline a beseeching look, but she didn't meet his gaze. She was looking out the window, her face carefully blank as though her thoughts were far away. She'd stopped fighting her father years ago. The price of disobedience was too high. I could possess you without any needle, Red whispered, if you let me. But his grandfather didn't want to know what Red could do. He wanted to know what ketamine could do. Then let me kill him. No more murders, Remy thought automatically. All he needed to do was get through this unpleasant thing and then forget it. Shove more fear and anger into Red. And if sometimes Remy felt as though he'd given so much of himself away that there wasn't much left, he was unwilling to contemplate any of the alternatives. Remy flopped on the couch, shook off his jacket, and began unbuttoning his shirt sleeve. Remy's grandfather took a needle out of plastic packaging and removed the safety thing. Then he stuck it into the top of the vial and sucked up the clear fluid. He was having a hard time telling the difference between his and Red's thoughts. They were running together in panic. If Remy stopped breathing, no one would believe that he hadn't taken ketamine at the club. That was the real genius of his grandfather, to set up things so that no matter what happened, he would never be accountable. Then there was a sharp prick on the skin of his arm. He glanced at Adeline. She was watching him, her expression soft. And then he felt a sensation like falling. He tasted blood as though he'd bit his tongue. The last thing he remembered was the sound of his own voice turned unfamiliar in his ears. No more Remy now. Only Red. 27. That Awful Thing I Like When Charlie had moved out from her mother's apartment, she figured that she'd finally been free of the fear and guilt that followed her through adolescence. But seeing her mother always brought its return, ready to fill the air to choking with everything unsaid between them. She hated the feeling. Hated the long-stay motel where her mom lived because her credit was bad and her job history patchy. Charlie hated the better-than-average chance she was going to wind up living in a place just like it one day. Lots of people lied to their mothers. There was nothing special about Charlie having lied. The problem was that her mother would never forgive her if she found out. Charlie had made her mom believe that the universe cared about her, that spirits had arrived to protect her in her time of need. If someone took that from her, she'd hate them. Even if it was the person who'd given it to her in the first place. especially when those lies had made her mother susceptible to more lies from more liars. As Charlie pulled the Corolla into the parking lot of residence suites and around the side where her mom's room was, her chest felt tight. This late in November, leaf peepers had stopped coming through the valley and no one was driving up from Connecticut to pick apples, so the hotels were mostly empty. There were plenty of places to park and no excuses to delay. As she took the key from the ignition, Charlie noticed that there was some kind of small metal thing stuck to her keys. It took her a moment to remember that she'd taken it from the bottom of Vince's duffel, thinking it looked like a watch battery. Apparently, it was magnetic. Frowning, she tossed the keys back into her purse, magnet still attached. Posey knocked. Bob, mom's current boyfriend, opened the door, took one look at Charlie's swelling face, and yelled, Jess! Their mother came to the door. She had been in high school in the 80s and still used a crimping iron faithfully. Her long, dry hair fell over her shoulders, rippled with ridges from the hot ceramic and bottle black. Her fingers were covered in silver rings and her eyes were thick with liner. Oh no, what happened? And why do you have the cat? 
Charlie gave an abbreviated version of the story, omitting the theft. Mom was sympathetic, but it wasn't lost on Charlie that, once again, she'd won that sympathy with lies. You should call the police, Mom said. Have them escort you home and arrest Adam. He assaulted you. Charlie didn't plan on doing that, but she wasn't above suggesting to Doreen that she would. Adam wouldn't want them nosing around, what with his illegal dealings. Maybe you would get him to back off. Once ushered into the motel room, Charlie let her mother steer her to the couch while Posey found a perch on a bar stool beside the kitchenette counter where she could plug in both her phone and her laptop. The place was essentially three rooms, a bedroom with a door, a bathroom that you had to go through the bedroom to get to, a kitchenette, a little bar height table with two chairs, and a couch in front of a television. Cable came included in the week-to-week price, no extra charge. Mom and Bob had brought in some furniture from previous residences. Two lamps Charlie remembered from her childhood, an unfamiliar but obviously not hotel-originated rug, some bookshelves, and stacks of Bob's cardboard boxes of individually plastic-sleeved Magic the Gathering cards, of which he had a lot. He claimed that they were valuable enough that when he was ready, he was going to sell the whole collection and buy a house. But he couldn't, until he finished his legal battle with his old employer. Mission trucking was the unambiguous cause of his back problems and had been court-ordered to pay for his insurance. They wanted to settle so they could wriggle free from their obligation, but Bob wasn't taking less than a million. He kept promising her mom that once he got it, they'd live in style. It was his version of the big score, and about as likely. We need to put something on your eye, Mom said. Oh, honey, that doesn't look good now, but it's going to look even worse tomorrow. I'll get her some ice, Bob said. You get in a few good hits? Charlie laughed. You bet. Hope you kicked him where it counts. He brought her a package of frozen peas, and she pressed them to her eye. Bob had a balding head and a paunch, and wore a t-shirt proclaiming his love for the Ramones. Having plugged in all her devices, Posey hopped down off the stool to get the cat some water in a plastic takeout soup container. So you two are going to spend the night, their mother said. I insist. With only days until Salt's party, Charlie didn't have time for a black eye or being stuck at her mother's place. And yet the pain in her face was yielding to exhaustion. Besides, there was something she'd come here to find. You want me to get the blow-up mattress out of the station wagon? Charlie asked. Her mother shook her head. No, you stay put. Your sister can go, or Bob. Charlie got up, glad to have an easy excuse for her search. I got it. A constellation of magnets covered the refrigerator. A few were from local businesses, and others were emblazoned with sayings like, all I need is coffee and wine, or so punk rock I'm out of safety pins. Charlie grabbed the car key from where it was suspended and headed back out into the cold. At almost 60, Charlie's mother had collected more stuff than she was going to fit comfortably into the hotel, especially given Bob's cards, which required a climate-controlled environment and were too important to him not to be kept nearby. And so, the back of Mom's wagon was full of her clothes for the off-season, decorations, taxes, and apparently, an air mattress. The bins were crammed in tight. One of them was marked Christmas, another family photos. Charlie found the stale-smelling plastic mattress under a tub marked Vital Documents. That was what she'd come for. After she'd escaped from Salt's house, the guy who'd found her had called an ambulance. She didn't remember much after that, but they must have done a talk screen at the hospital. The results ought to be with the rest of her medical paperwork. Charlie pulled the lid off the bin. And there, Under birth certificates and her mother's divorce proceedings, she found a folder with her name on it. Inside was a copy of the police report, hospital release, and the bill sent to the insurance. She skimmed over the details. Scratches on arms and face consistent with branches. Mild dehydration. One stood out. Traces of ketamine in system. She closed the folder, Liam's words echoing in her head. One of the doctors that works here is known for being generous with prescriptions. I saw Remy's cousin Adeline buy some ketamine off him. It seemed that stealing a quickened shadow hadn't slowed down Salt's experiments, and that he'd gotten the rest of the family involved. 
Did you find it? Her mother called across the lot. Charlie stuffed the folder under her shirt so her jeans held it in place. Yeah, mom, she called back and dragged the mattress inside. Her mother had made fever few tea, which she said was good for pain. Bob slipped her some ibuprofen, which worked much better. Charlie went back to the couch in the frozen peas. After a few moments, when she was pretty sure no one was looking, she eased the folder out from under her shirt and into the seam on the side of the couch, where the cushion would cover it. Lucifer patrolled the new space, meowing, as mom took out some chopped meat and started making something for dinner. Bob put on that show where people bring in old stuff and experts tell them whether the item is worth money. A long-haul trucker had brought in a cuckoo clock of his grandmother's that turned out to be a real antique from the Edwardian period. When it struck midnight, a man appeared, running from his own shadow. This was a time of great spirituality, said the elderly appraiser, stroking his beard thoughtfully. Glomists performed elaborate shadow plays against the walls of ballrooms. Magic was right in front of people, and yet few looked closely enough to discover it. Don't let the front desk know you've got a cat in here, Mom told Posey. There's a $150 cleaning fee for bringing a pet into the room. I wasn't going to tell anyone, Posey complained, an adolescent whine creeping into her voice. And I don't know where I'm supposed to talk to clients. It's so loud in here. Try the bathtub, Mom said, unhelpfully. An hour later, they ate goulash, sitting on folding chairs around a cafe table that couldn't hold all their plates at once. They drank Posey's wine. They were following the Hall family tradition of pretending everything was okay, and Charlie was glad. Nothing was okay, and she had no idea what to do about it. Posey tells me that Vincent moved out. I'm so sorry, Mom said. Charlie nodded. The less said about that, the better. One more thing that was definitely not okay. Yeah, well, you know my luck. She didn't say our luck, because she liked Bob. Of course, it was possible that she would have liked anyone who'd brought her ibuprofen. If he'd brought her coffee, too, she might have married him herself. Her mother waited, as though hoping she might say more, might share. When Charlie didn't, her mother deflated a little. Charlie felt guilty all over again, in a new way. After dinner, Mom turned to Bob. I want to show them where we sit outside. Outside? Charlie asked. It's cold. Under the stars. You get the blankets and I'll get the folding chairs. A few minutes later, they were in the parking lot, looking at the lights of Springfield in the distance and the stars above. Not bad, right? Mom said. Like a porch. Bob stood by the car and looked up obligingly. Rain cleared out the clouds. I am not staying out here freezing, Posey said. I have a chat with some friends. We're revising plans. Hopefully, that meant ayahuasca was off the table. Be careful, Charlie reminded her. Posey gave her a sharp look and went inside. After a while, Bob left too, saying something about making himself some tea. Charlie stayed wrapped up in her blanket. She didn't want to go back to that claustrophobic room air thick with her own mistakes. And she worried that Posey was desperate enough to be a glomist, that she'd allow herself to be tricked, and that all the promised sweetness would be there to drown in. I'm glad you came to us, Mom said. Me too, Charlie replied automatically, alert to the dangers of this conversation. I've got a lot of regrets about decisions I made as your mother. When I was younger, I wasn't always paying attention to the right things. I wish you felt like you could come to me when you were in trouble years ago. Charlie had a sinking feeling that this was about Rand, that Posey had said something during their daily tarot chats. When was I in trouble? I know you don't like talking about it. There's obviously something you think you know, so go ahead and say it. Charlie needed to stop talking. Instead of splitting her tongue into two parts, she needed to bite the whole thing off. She should be trying to avoid this conversation, not indulging it. I saw you take your old medical file out of the car, she said. And I'll never forget how I felt when I got that call from the police. And then when they found Rand's body with the dead girl in the trunk, that girl could have been you. That was true, but not for any of the reasons that her mother was imagining. It wasn't me, though. 
I'm fine. Are you? Her mother asked. I know you were with him that night you wound up in the hospital. If you never deal with what happened, you'll never heal from it. You'll stay in that hurt, angry place. Charlie Hall, with a furnace inside her that was always burning. Of course she was angry. She wanted her mother to have believed her when Travis smacked them around, to have loved her better than Alonzo, who wasn't even real. She wanted her mother to have protected her from Rand, who was bad enough and still so much better than he could have been. She wanted her mother to believe her now, even though Charlie had lied before. I'm fine. Sound as a bell, Charlie said. Right as rain. I wanted you and your sister to have the freedom to express yourselves, to make mistakes, to discover yourselves. I didn't want to hold you back. Mom was playing with one of her chunky silver rings, rolling it around her first finger. I didn't have that as a kid. And you had a gift. I thought Rand would show you how to use it. Guilt came over Charlie in a swell. She had to change the subject. She couldn't stand feeling this way anymore, torn between a desire to scream and a desire to confess. Maybe when I stopped using it, the gift moved on to Posey. Her mother gave her an impatient look. Charlie sighed. You want me to talk to you? Okay. Here's what I want to know. Have you ever met Lionel Salt's daughter? They were around the same age, and the area had been even smaller back then. If her mother knew Vince's, maybe she'd know what happened to her. Kiera? Her mother looked up, blinking like she was trying to refocus her thoughts. We didn't run in the same circles. But you knew her name, Charlie insisted. So you must know something about her. Mom shrugged. She used to buy shrooms off a friend of mine. Partied hard. Told disturbing stories about her father. But people want to believe that the rich are keeping their fingernails in jars like Howard Hughes. And she seemed like the kind of person who'd say whatever got her attention. Fell in with some ex-cons up in Boston, got knocked up. Eventually, her father put her in rehab. And that's the last I heard. She didn't talk to any of the old crew after that. Why? I heard she died. That's all, Charlie said. Sad, said her mother. Charlie stretched, rolling her shoulders. I think I'm going to go inside and see about the air mattress. Think about what I said, her mother told her as she stood. As Charlie walked away, a memory came to her of when she was very little and her parents were still together. She was sitting in the back seat of the car, the window down. Wind whipped her hair. The radio was on. Charlie's little legs swinging along with the music, and mom and dad were laughing together. Golden sunlight had turned the world dazzlingly bright, and it seemed as though night would never come. As she and Posey took turns pumping up their bed, Bob and mom moved comfortably around the room. They seemed contented. It was weird, but nice. Like there was no curse, just a casual family inheritance of bad relationships and a cycle that no one was doomed to repeat. Charlie and Posey laid down next to one another, trying not to bounce the mattress. Charlie remembered a whole childhood of sharing beds with Posey, whispering to one another, back when they had the same secrets, back when they had the same gifts. Charlie thought of the moment when her consciousness split, when she understood how to be in two places at once. Even now when she closed her eyes, she could feel her shadow. If she concentrated hard enough, she could see herself from its vantage. As soon as she did, though, Panic sent her spiraling back to her own body. Charlie didn't have a goldfish or a turtle because she worried she'd forget to feed anything that couldn't yowl for its dinner. She forgot to take her birth control pills at least twice every month, sometimes for two days at a time. When she downloaded an app to help her remember to drink water, it had come with a pixelated plant you were supposed to tap when you drank a glass. She killed the plant, over and over. Sometimes she'd drink the water but forget to tap the plant. And sometimes she'd just forget to drink the water. How was she going to remember to give blood to a shadow every day? How was she going to keep from accidentally letting it drink up all her energy until she withered away? How was she going to keep it from becoming her own personal monster? Lying on the mattress, the soft susurrations of breath surrounded her as the others succumbed to sleep. But Charlie's mind couldn't stop racing, couldn't stop worrying, wouldn't stop assembling and reassembling the information she had. 
Once Salt realized his grandson had magic, he would have wanted to control him. Kiera's situation was rife with opportunities for exploitation. Salt could easily get custody of Vince in court. He had the money to feed Kiera's habit. She might not even contest it. And for Vince, the promise that his mother would be sent to rehab, that she might get better, and then doling out access to her as a reward for good behavior, the promise of reuniting hanging forever over his head, and the fear of her being punished for his missteps motivating him further. If Charlie could come up with that plan, she had no doubt that Salt had concocted a worse version. And so Vince does what Salt tells him, and Red, whatever he was before, becomes a reflection of those things they do together. But controlling an adult is much harder than controlling a child, especially one with a long education in manipulation and cruelty. So Vince plans to leave and join his mother, but something goes horribly wrong. Possibly, Salt realized that he didn't need Vince if he had Red and cut off his grandson's shadow. But if he planned to have it sewn to him, that didn't happen. It became a blight, the talking kind. So he had to make a deal. He could have been the one who offered the ritual from the Liber Noctum, and Vince, the one who stole the book to keep Red from walking the world. There was no way Salt would mind making a monster, so long as it served his interests. And in the meantime, Red keeps on killing for him keeps on doing his bidding. Together, they get him accepted into the cabal. But if he'd promised Red his reward by the time of the announcement, then she could see why he needed the book. The problem with monsters is that you need to keep them leashed, or they turn on you. The Hierophant wanted the book as much as Salt did. Had the blight tied to him made him some kind of promise? Some arrangement to get the same ritual? Or was he working on behalf of the Cabal, trying to keep Red from becoming a new and more terrible form of blight? And more importantly, what was Charlie going to do? Salt expected her to bring him the Liber Noctum by the weekend, and the weekend was coming up fast. Charlie's head hurt, and her eye hurt, and her ribs hurt. Her gaze rested on the refrigerator with its dozens of magnets. And as she looked at them, a thought came to her about the little magnetic silver thingy dangling off her keys, the one she'd found among Vince's belongings. Maybe that's all it was, a magnet. A magnet for holding a metal-covered book. She got up as quietly as she could and clad in a borrowed shirt of Bob's, slid on her shoes, put on one of her mother's coats, slipped out the door as quietly as she'd slid into plenty of other homes. In the parking lot, the angle of the streetlight gave everything long shadows. The hiss of cars on the highway was distant, the streaks of the lightning farm barely visible. She popped the hood of her Corolla and looked at the puzzle of the engine and spark plugs and the other things she didn't really understand. Rich people never performed their own oil changes or rotated their tires. They never even vacuumed their own seats. And Vince had spent a lot of time working on her car. But the Liber Noctum wasn't stuck in the guts of the Corolla. And though she crawled underneath, the only thing she discovered was an oil leak. In the morning, Charlie's neck felt hot against the press of her fingers. She went into the bathroom and splashed cold water in her face, combing it back through her hair. Her mother's dire predictions hadn't proved accurate. The swelling had gone down around her eye. It had, however, turned a magnificently dark purple with plenty of yellow and green bruising at the edges. I'm heading out to Rite Aid, she announced over breakfast, drinking down the sweet milk in her cereal bowl. You can't go to work like that, their mother said. I know, Charlie told her. That's why I need to go to the drugstore first. Posey snorted indelicately. A few minutes later, Charlie was out the door. According to the YouTube tutorials she'd watched while the air mattress slowly deflated beneath her, Halloween makeup was her best chance to fix her face. Luckily, some remained in the clearance section. She got herself a cheap palette that consisted of white, lime green, royal blue, bright yellow, and cherry red. Charlie was concerned she was going to look like a clown. She added to that some regular stuff. A full coverage concealer, liquid eyeliner, distractingly red lipstick, new deodorant, a three-pack of panties, and the only black t-shirt in her size. 
Unfortunately, it was emblazoned with a red-nosed reindeer below. It's beginning to look a lot like fuck this in puffy letters. Still, it was a fine opportunity to break Salt's $100 bill. Back at the motel room, Charlie poured the stuff out on her mother's bed and sprawled on the comforter to put it on. After a lot of Googling of color wheels and watching that video again, she mixed bright yellow with a little red and dabbed it on the purpling parts. Then she waited for it to dry. Surprisingly, by the time she applied the concealer in careful dabs, the only thing that showed she'd been hit was a swelling. And even that was less obvious next to a red lip and a little bit of gold dusted on her eyelids. You look good, her mother said with a frown. But I still think you should call out sick and go talk to the police. I'll think about it, Charlie lied. Are you ready to go? Posey asked. And can I use some of that? Charlie ducked into the bathroom to fix her hair and turn the disturbing reindeer shirt inside out. When she returned, Posey was wearing eyeliner and some sparkly shadow. They split the pack of underwear. That night, being back at Rapture was strange. The mess had been cleaned up. The broken glass was gone. New bottles rested on the shelves. Although the bar wasn't as well stocked as it had been, the unusual whiskeys and gins that Odette liked, Rose and Rhubarb were favorites, would take time to replace. It was functional. Normally, Wednesdays were slow. But since the bar had been closed for the better part of a week, there was a lineup of performers. As Charlie came in, a body modification artist was up on the stage doing public piercings and tongue sluttings. By the time she was pouring her first drink, an acrobat with labrets through fresh holes in the dimples of her cheeks was performing a set that was half sleight of hand and half burlesque. An hour in, Charlie was sweaty and footsore. She had to make a conscious effort not to touch her face and wipe away her careful makeup. Even with it, customers had to notice the swelling. Balthazar gave her an odd, guilty look the one time she saw him out of his shadow parlor. Make with that awful thing I like, Odette said, sitting herself down at the bar. She was in a red vintage Vivian Westwood sweater set printed with black barbed wire. Charlie turned away to spray a coupe glass with absinthe from a spritzer. How are you holding up? Odette asked. I'm fine. Charlie shook up Odette's burnt martini and pushed it over to her along with a twist of lemon peel for garnish. Glad to be back. You're a darling for saying so anyway, Odette told her. I met a friend of yours, Charlie said, keeping her voice low. Is it true you have a client who's an actual billionaire? Odette took a sip of her drink and grimaced a little bit at the bite of the alcohol. Lionel, a client? Goodness, no. He'd rather be on the other end of the whip. Charlie pretended to be surprised. Have you ever been to his house? I certainly have. It's a grim old place. Plush carpets, lots of incense, and horrible art. But his liquor is top-notch, and he knows a lot of interesting people. She paused. He called me the morning after that man came in. Asked me a great many questions about your Vincent. What do you think he wants with him? Charlie looked at Odette as steadily as she could. No idea. Maybe he's got an odd job he wants done? Ah, yes, Odette said. It must be something like that. You remember that thing you said about pasts being the only thing that matter? Charlie said. What did you mean? Did I say that? Odette looked surprised. Well, if I did, I suppose I must have meant it exactly as it sounds. Isn't who we are today what counts? Charlie didn't know why she was pressing this point, since she wasn't particularly happy with the person she was today. And Odette had been talking about Vince when she'd said it, not Charlie. Odette laughed. <laughs> sure, honey. Isn't that the point of reinventing ourselves? Charlie asked. Odette took a second sip of her drink and closed her eyes in pleasure. Ah, yes, that's good. Then she fixed Charlie with a look that made her remember that Odette had lived longer than she had and maybe lived harder too. Who we were and what we did and what was done to us, we don't get to shrug that stuff off and become some new shiny person. Charlie raised her eyebrows. We can try. Take fetish. 
No one is into sucking on someone else's feet or worshiping their shoes or rubbing a balloon all over themselves for no reason. I know a boy who used to sit under the kitchen table and draw while his mother and her friends talked. He would look at their shoes and know that if he touched one, he would be discovered and then he'd have to leave. You can guess what he likes. But if he didn't admit to himself, what then? It takes bravery to be an adventurer, Odette said, lifting her drink and walking away. And what better adventure than the discovery of our true selves? As Charlie worked, she let the physicality of the tasks take over, let herself fall into the rhythm of the work. Fill this, shake that, swipe a card, start a tab, pocket the change. Hold the pills in her glass at the exact right angle for the exact right head on the beer. Do a boss pour for the hipster requesting one. Dole out fireball to a trio steering straight for regrets. As she wiped down the bar top and collected wet napkins and wooden stirs, her thoughts turned to her last days with Vince. The day before he'd left, he'd gone outside with the excuse of cleaning the gutters. He must have known that it was only a matter of time before Salt connected the dots and discovered him. Maybe he'd taken that opportunity to move the Lieber Noctum to his van. She'd tossed the room only hours later. She could have been that close to finding it. Hiding the book in his van was a short-term strategy at best, though. Since Vince had no legitimate ID, he couldn't have a vehicle registered to him. If he was ever pulled over, the van would be impounded. And if Lionel found his grandson at any point, it would be an obvious place to look. Now that she thought of it, her car would have been an equally bad hiding spot. Someone like Hermes might have taken it apart that night he came to Rapture. Salt had been standing right next to it not four days ago. But that left the whole rest of everywhere to have put the Book of Night. Liam said that when Vince would hide something, he'd pick one of the places rich people don't see. Perhaps he'd hidden it in one of the areas of Salt's own house he'd never gone. The laundry room, the pantry, behind the television. That would be something for Salt to be walking past it the entire time and never noticing it. But it was risky, too. It would be hard to reobtain the book, and there was no guarantee it wouldn't be disturbed by someone else. Even if he taped it to the chimney, slate repair people might stumble on it. Even on a roof. Charlie stopped, nearly overpouring soda in the scotch and soda she was making. Who cleans the gutters the day after they murder someone and the day before they leave their girlfriend? A ridiculously considerate person, she supposed. Someone who'd been meaning to get to the task and wanted to get it done before they were gone. Or someone who was moving something to a new hiding spot, one that no one was likely to stumble on and which wasn't the sort of place that someone like Salt would even remember existed. Their rental house had a chimney connected to the furnace and water heater rather than a fireplace. And it had a metal top on it, one that magnets might grip. Of course, there were lots of things that were made of metal in a house, but outside of the house made sense if he wanted to protect the people inside, and if Vince wanted to be able to retrieve it without having to face Charlie. She could look, anyway. It would give her a chance to check and see if Adam had busted up their place. If it didn't seem like he'd been there, Charlie would call Posey and they could move their stuff and themselves back in the morning. Put a baseball bat by the door. See if their landlord would mind if Charlie installed a couple of better locks. If she did find the labor knocked him, she had a different problem. No one blackmailed you into one job. Do that job, and there'd always be another. Carrot and stick, back and forth, until you forgot you ever had a choice in the first place. And then what? There wasn't a reward at the end. Just a knife in the back. Charlie might not agree with Odette that the past was the only thing that mattered. But it had taught her something. Besides... She'd be damned before she rolled over for Lionel Salt. She was going to have to con him. She wasn't sure how, but she would have to beat him at his own manipulative game. Realizing she had to manage that or die trying brought her a great calm, like letting a riptide drag you away with it. As she waved goodnight to Odette and got in her car, Charlie had the bittersweet feeling one gets just before leaving town, bidding farewell to everything, because you're not sure you're going to see it again. Charlie parked a block down from her house and walked over. As she got close, she saw lights moving on a screen inside. The television was on. She slowed her step. Had Posey forgotten to turn it off before leaving? 
Was Adam so arrogant that he'd broken into the house and then kicked up his heels? Quietly, she took the ladder from where it was leaned against the side of the house and set it against the gutters. As she climbed up the rungs, she could see inside more easily. Someone was in the house. In the shifting light of the television, she was able to make out a figure slumped to one side of the couch, as though he'd fallen asleep while waiting for someone to return home. 28. Abandon All Hope Up on the roof, Charlie crawled over the asphalt shingles. The pitch wasn't particularly steep, and the moon was bright enough for her to see her way to the short faux chimney, with a metal grating covering the top. She pulled herself upright, looking out over the neighborhood for a moment, then, satisfied that no one was out on the street watching, she checked for bolts screwing down the cover. To her surprise, the whole thing lifted off. It was flimsy, like tin or aluminum. Looking down the chimney, she saw that the inside edges were lined in heavier metal strips. And there, attached to one side, was a steel box with a lock on it. Her heart stuttered. Stealing had often been a game to Charlie, one where her cleverness was pitted against that of the person who hid in the prize. Solving their puzzle was the goal and the thrill. But as her hands reached for the box, what she felt was uneasiness. She couldn't shake the feeling that the darkness itself was watching her, waiting to strike. Charlie pulled the box free, sending two of the magnets falling down the flue. They made a clanging sound that she hoped was an amplified inside. For a moment, she went still, listening. No sound from inside. Was it Adam? Certainly, he'd been angry enough to break in and trash her place, looking for Night Sing's book. But she didn't think he had the patience to wait more than 24 hours for her to return. Vince, however, had fallen asleep in front of the television like that loads of times. Maybe he was ready to tell her the truth. Or maybe he'd come up with a fresh bouquet of lies. He wouldn't know what Salt told her or what she'd ferreted out on her own. He certainly wouldn't know that she'd already stolen his prize. It'd be satisfying to explain how wrong he'd been about her and Adam. It made her a little giddy to think of having another fight with him. It made her want to put on lipstick. Carefully, she crawled back to the ladder and slid down, box cradled against her, wincing at the sound of the wood creaking. Quietly, she eased to the ground and padded through her neighbor's yard staying away from the light. At her car, she stuffed the metal box under the front seat. What she ought to do was leave, go back to her mother's motel room and try to jimmy the lock on the box. But the combination of hoping for Vince and hating Adam lured her. She crept back to the house. It was odd to evaluate her own place like a burglar. But the first thing she tried was the first thing she always tried, the front door. She turned the knob, and found that it was unlocked. Posey might have left it open when she ran out, and Adam could have broken in another way and then used the front door if he'd left and come back. But the simplest explanation was that Vince had used his key to let himself in and hadn't locked up after since he expected Charlie home later that night after she'd finished work. She reached up to smother the sound of the bell on the screen door as she eased it open. She slid through the kitchen, pausing to pick up a heavy pan with little pieces of burnt noodle attached to it, just in case. A few steps more, and she stopped in the doorway to the living room. It was the smell that hit her first, the odor of decaying flesh that made her gag. There was something dark smeared on the walls. The body on the couch was too still. Dread turned her limbs to lead. Vince. Her trembling hand went to the light switch and everything became obscenely clear. Writing in blood, thick and clotted, covered the walls, in some places caught with hair. The words continued high up on the walls where a human hand couldn't reach. On the couch, Adam's body lay cracked open, ribs exposed. Charlie stared at the open cave of his chest and the too dry mess of his insides, at the tattered sail of his shadow, flying off the mast of his feet. Her gaze went back to the walls. Over and over, the same word in finger-painted letters. Red. 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 
Charlie was still in that doorway when the police arrived. She wasn't sure she remembered calling them. She didn't remember how long she'd been standing there. You, one of them said, hand on his gun. Drop what you're holding, hands in the air. She discovered she was still gripping the pan from the kitchen. She let go. Distantly, she heard it clang as it hit the floor, but that felt very far away. Outside, the strobe of blue and red lights added another layer to the surrealness of the moment. She raised her hands. It wasn't that Charlie hadn't seen a corpse before. She'd seen two in the last week. But this belonged to someone she knew, someone who'd been murdered in her living room. His blood soaking her secondhand couch, which they were going to have to throw out. The rug would have to go too. Maybe she should just burn the whole place to the ground and let her landlord get the insurance money. Another cop, a woman, crossed to Charlie and patted her down. The buzz of radios in the background and muttered conversation made it hard to focus. This is your place, the cop demanded, obviously having asked the question twice. Are you the one that called us in? Yeah, I think so, Charlie said. Yes. Did you kill him? One of the others asked her. Charlie laughed, which wasn't a great look. You think I could do all this? They exchanged glances. Did you? The woman asked. No, I just got off work. My sister and I were at our mom's place all yesterday. She kept her hands up and open. A photographer from forensics came in. At least Charlie thought they were from forensics. She wondered if someone would have to climb up the walls and get those invisible hairs. She wondered if the police would recommend someone from Vince's company to clean this all up once the body was gone. Did you know the deceased? She nodded. Adam Locken. He live here? Your neighbor said a man shared the place with two young women. Charlie considered what she could say. No matter what name she gave, his prints were all over the house. The minute they ran them, they'd discover Edmund Carver wasn't dead. And they would believe he was the killer. That was my boyfriend, Vincent. But he moved out. Last name? Damiano she told them, wondering if such a person even existed. What's with the message? One of them asked. Do you know what it means? Red. The color of blood. The name a boy gave his shadow. Never name it. Raven's words echoed in her head. But children named everything. They named teddy bears and goldfish and duck ponds and pieces of gum on the sidewalk. Of course Vince was going to name his shadow. Perhaps it had come looking for him, like the shadow in the fairy tale. Perhaps it had mistaken Adam for Vince and then became enraged when it realized it had the wrong person. Or it killed Adam for Vince since he had a grievance. Or it had come looking for her and saw an opportunity for some fresh blood. And then it signed its work. I don't know, Charlie told them. One of them walked behind her, jerking one of her hands behind her back. She felt the cold metal of cuffs. I think you better come with us. We'll go down to the station and you can make your statement. Am I under arrest? Charlie asked. I'm giving you a ride. He was a short guy with broad shoulders and dark curly hair. His badge was shiny. He told her his name was Officer Lupo as he led her out to the car and pushed her head down as he got her into the back seat. Neighbors had come out of their houses in bathrobes to check out the drama. Charlie wanted to wave but she was cuffed. The big brick building housing both the police station and the fire department was only a few blocks away. It wasn't long before she was being led into the station and put in a back room with a big table. They asked her for her fingerprints for elimination purposes, and she let them press each finger into a pad and then onto a paper. They asked for her license, and she handed it over. They wanted her to unlock her cell phone, and she did that too. Mostly, they left her alone in the room coming in once or twice to check on her. After about 45 minutes, Detective Juarez rolled in, looking as though he'd just been roused from bed and not happy about it. You again, he said when he saw her. She didn't say anything. What was there to say? Does this have something to do with what happened in Rapture? He asked. Charlie shrugged. If it doesn't, I guess I've got the devil's own luck. What was this Adam guy doing in your house? He looked at his notes. You knew him, right? If you want to lie to pass a sniff test, 
it helps to put your worst foot forward. He was cheating on his girlfriend with me. After he broke it off, I told her. Day before yesterday, he came after me in a hospital parking lot and beat me up pretty bad. Did you make a police report? He asked, studying her face. I guess I should have. She didn't doubt he believed her about getting knocked around, though. The makeup she'd done was okay, but she'd been wearing it for hours, and she was sure that her bruises were showing through. And nothing could disguise the swelling. After that, someone brought her a coffee. But that was the only consideration they gave her. The questions went on and on, doubling in on themselves. Most of them were about Vince, but she was asked about Doreen, too. Charlie's hours at work, when she'd come home, what she'd touched. Over and over, Charlie asked if she was under arrest. Finally, they said she could go. Told her to stay away from the house, since it was an active crime scene. Cautioned her to stay by her phone, that they would contact her again. There's too much weird shit in the world, Officer Lupo said to one of the other cops under his breath. Not all of it needs to be washing up around here. Charlie was on her way out when she passed Doreen, wearing pajamas, a trench coat, and Ugg boots. Her face was blotchy and tear-stained. When she saw Charlie, her eyes seemed to roll back in her head. You, she said, her voice so guttural that it seemed like she was making sounds more than words. You did this. Charlie wanted to snap back at her, but it wasn't fair. Doreen had loved Adam, and even if he had been terrible, he was dead. Look, I'm sorry that he... Before she could finish her sentence, Doreen lunged. Nails raked across Charlie's cheek. A cop grabbed Doreen and hauled her back, although she kicked like she thought she could get free. Calm down, he said. Jesus, lady. Ow, Charlie said, putting her hand to her face. Fuck. This is because of you, Doreen shouted. You were supposed to help him. You were supposed to bring him home. Hard to be too sympathetic when he'd been hanging around waiting to hurt her. But she saw Doreen's point. Adam might have screwed over Balthazar and Doreen both. But Charlie had certainly screwed him. You are the devil, corrupting everything you touch, Doreen shouted. Remember that favor my brother was supposed to do for you? Well, it's undone. You're in default. Charlie shrugged, turning to head toward the doors. You can't threaten me with what's already happened. You got him to do that the minute I gave you the ring. Doreen, held back by two policemen, still managed to spit in Charlie's direction. Exhausted, Charlie walked back from the station to her car just as dawn was breaking on the horizon. The Corolla was where she'd parked it, metal box tucked under the seat. She slid in and looked at her face in the mirror, studied the fresh red marks, which stung like hell. Abruptly, she tasted salt in the back of her mouth and her eyes stung. She blinked back tears. Pull yourself together, Charlie Hall, she told herself in the mirror. It was Thursday morning, which meant she had two more days before Salt's event. Two more days to discover what Vince's shadow wanted, where Vince was, and who was lying. Two more days to know what she was going to do with the book and the lockbox. But what she needed right then was sleep. She couldn't go inside her house, since it was an active crime scene, cordoned off with tape. And she wasn't sure she could bear going back to mom's place. The thought of sleeping on the air mattress while they moved around the room, of fending off questions, of telling more lies, made her feel claustrophobic and panicky. Not to mention the threat of a blight out there. One looking for a book she might have in her possession. Maybe looking for her. So she couldn't go to Barb's either. Not to any of her friends. You are the devil, corrupting everything you touch. The devil, like Susie Lampton said, with the devil's own luck. But maybe her luck was changing, because Charlie remembered something. Susie Lampton had gone on a yoga retreat, leaving behind an empty condo for Charlie to break into. Susie's place was within walking distance of the center of downtown Northampton. When Charlie pulled up, she realized right away that getting in was going to suck. The units were newly built, with large windows and no trees or overgrown bushes to hide her from Susie's neighbors while jimmying the door. The last time she'd been there, 
She'd admired the place, but hadn't done nearly enough casing. Charlie parked three streets over, tucked the lockbox into her bag, got supplies from the trunk, and walked. It was just after six in the morning, and she was sure people inside the units were just getting up, getting ready to send their kids to school and take themselves to work. Cutting behind the units, Charlie noted they had patios in the back. That was promising. People were more likely to give someone hanging out in a backyard the benefit of the doubt, and sliding glass doors were incredibly easy to open. People put deadbolts on their front entrances with keypads and steel doors, and then neglected the back. Charlie positioned a screwdriver under the bottom of the patio sliders, then pushed up hard at the same time she turned the handle. Ten seconds later, she was inside, and the doors, no worse for wear. As she walked through the modern white kitchen with thick marble counters and pristine subway tile, Charlie's steps echoed. She had a moment of feeling entirely out of place, as though she wasn't just an intruder, but a traveler from another world. She made herself climb the stairs. Susie's bedroom was wallpapered in a cheerful pattern of tropical leaves. The door to the walk-in closet was open, and clothes were scattered on the floor, as though Susie had packed in a hurry. Charlie staggered to the bed. She fell asleep on top of the coverlet, with early morning sunlight flooding in through the picture window, still in her clothes. She woke to the red and golds of sunset. Her head felt cottony and her mouth was dry. For a disoriented moment, she didn't know where she was. Then everything came flooding back, and along with it, a stab of panic. This is a job, she told herself. A job, even though she wasn't sure she had a client. When working, you couldn't afford to let yourself get freaked out. Forcing herself up, she handled the practical things. She plugged her phone into her charger and sent her sister and mother a text, saying she was okay and giving them a brief outline of what happened to Adam. Then she got into the shower. One of the things Charlie had always loved about breaking into houses was the pretending part. Here she was, trying on Susie's life, like the fresh tea and hoodie Charlie found in her closet. Susie had body wash that smelled like vetiver and shampoo that smelled like hemp. In the medicine cabinet, an assortment of half-used bottles of painkillers greeted her. A book on her bedside table promised the eight secrets of being an effective communicator. All the lights were so bright that there were barely any shadows. As her jeans went around and around in the washer, Charlie made a pot of coffee. In Susie's fridge, she found a can of Diet Coke and a jar of peanut butter. Charlie stuck a spoon into the peanut butter and took a bite of it while she poured the contents of the soda can down the sink. Then she picked up some kitchen shears, took out Vince's metal box, and got to work on the padlock. First, she had to cut the can so that it became a large rectangle of aluminum. Then she cut out two shims, each with a long wedge. Since he'd used a spring-loaded double-lock padlock, she knew she was going to need to hit the two tabs on the inside to wedge them open. Carefully, she pressed the first of the metal shims around the shackles, adjusted it a little with her fingers, and took it out again. Then, positioning the long wedge on the outside, she pushed it down into the gap between the shackle and the body of the lock. With enough slight back-and-forth twisting, she got it to slide in deeply enough that she was ready to rotate it. No audible noise came from it, but there was a feeling of resistance. When she couldn't turn it any farther, she found pliers under the sink and used those to get it the rest of the way. Then she worked the other side. When both were done, and the shims turned, she gave a firm pull. The lock opened. She sucked in her breath and opened the box. No Lieber Noctum rested there. Only a slim piece of paper, the edge tattered from being ripped out of a notebook. Charlie slammed her open palm against the marble counter. Fuck, fuck, fuckity fuck. What was she going to do now? She supposed the box was a decoy, a piece of misdirection. Vince had left it to slow down anyone looking for the Book of Blights, which meant that wherever he was, the book was with him. Unfolding the paper, she was surprised to find it addressed to her. To the charlatan. If you found this, things have gone all the way wrong. The key is abandon all hope. Charlie poured coffee into a mug and took the letter over to the couch. Her heart was speeding. The sight of Vince's handwriting, blocky letters written in a rush, brought back an intense longing to speak with him, to yell at him, to make him believe that so long as he wanted to be known, 
she wanted to know him. The key is abandon all hope. Maybe she should. Maybe she was being a fool. But her gaze strayed back to the words. The key is abandon all hope. Not to abandon all hope. The way you'd write it if you were suggesting it literally. The words had the feel of a riddle. But she didn't understand it. Staring at the wall, she sipped her coffee. She had no better idea of where to find him than before. Her mind traveled down predictable paths to the same dead ends. She'd already tried his cell phone. She'd gone to the address on his license and talked to Liam. She'd called his boss and found out he hadn't shown up for work and was pretty much fired. What had he wanted with grotty hotel rooms and cleaning blood off ceilings anyway, being the grandson of a billionaire? But maybe he'd gotten used to that, tidying up after his shadow's messes. Maybe he liked it, being in all those empty hotel rooms, the way she'd liked breaking into houses. But then she had a very different thought. There was a story that Vince told about how his boss's wife was furious because her husband brought her to a fancy hotel for the weekend, not revealing that he had the key because the room was the newly cleaned scene of a murder. Probably cleaner than any other room in the hotel, his boss had told everyone at work. Nothing for her to complain about. The wife hadn't agreed. It made him spend a week on the couch. If there was an unoccupied hotel room, Vince could have gone there. He wouldn't have needed any identification. He wouldn't have even needed to break in. Charlie took out her phone and poked around a bit until she found the number of Craig, one of Vince's coworkers. The young guy who'd taken a job cleaning up bodies so he could one day do super authentic special effects makeup for movies. The last text she had from him was from four months ago. Vince's cell died, and he wants me to tell you he'll be home in one hour with Veg Lomain. It was such a normal message that she couldn't stop looking at it. Charlie thought about the horrible moment when she'd been sure it was Vince's body on the couch, Vince's blood on the walls. She had to find him before Red did. She called the number. Craig picked up. This is Vince's girlfriend, Charlie said. I know he's in the doghouse at work, which is why I'm calling you. Is he okay? Craig asked, sounding like his usual friendly self. Winnie and me were saying it wasn't like him to just drop off the face of the earth. She always found it a little funny how upbeat Craig and Winnie were, considering what they did. Their boss? Not so much. He got really sick, Charlie said, thinking that covered a host of possibilities. When he's feeling better, he'll give you a call. But he wanted me to ask about a place he cleaned. It's the room that wasn't going to be able to have guests for a week or two. He thinks he left his watch there. In Chicopee? He sounded a little wary, but not yet suspicious. Yeah, she agreed. But he totally spaced on the room number and he doesn't want to ask at the desk. Give me a sec. The tension had gone from his voice. She hadn't asked for the name of the hotel, after all, or an address. He believed that she knew the place. Says here it was 14B. Thanks, she said. Vince will give you a call when he's feeling better. Tell him to hang in there, Craig said, and disconnected the call. Charlie typed in murder and Chicopee into her phone's search engine and sorted the results by most recent. It appeared that there'd been a stabbing at the East Star Motel on Armory Drive eight days before. She gave herself a victory spoonful of peanut butter and went to get her jeans out of the dryer. The East Star Motel hunched on the corner of two streets, a one-story building with exterior entrances to the rooms, not unlike where her mother lived. But if that place was intended for long stays, this was the opposite. It rented by the hour, its sign promising vacancies, Wi-Fi, color television, and discretion. Charlie pulled into the lot. The Corolla made a strange sound as she did, a sputtering sort of cough. And then the engine died. No! she told the car, in what she hoped was a stern manner. This cannot happen, not right now. Come on, come on. But all it did was drift a short ways forward and then stop, halfway in and halfway out of a parking spot. She slammed both hands down on the steering wheel, but that did nothing. Turning the key in the ignition did even less. Finally, she got out, slung her bag over her shoulder, and pushed the car so the back of it wasn't sticking out. It was on a weird angle and taking up more than one parking space because of it. But there wasn't much she could do. 
At least her car had gotten her to the motel before it died. There was no white van in sight, which wasn't a great sign. But then Vince might have gone out, or even stolen himself a new vehicle. She could hear television on in room 12B and some moaning from 15B. Her gaze went to the locks on the rooms with a professional eye. They were digital, but not expensive and not all that secure. Unless someone had done up the deadbolt, it was possible that she could force it with a well-aimed kick. The blinds on 14B were drawn and shut. She hesitated, hand on knob, thinking of walking into another darkened room just hours before, thinking of the husk of Adam's body and a single dripping word written all over the walls. The idea that Vince might actually be on the other side of the door gave her pause, too, as much as she hoped for it. She needed to be ready for the possibility that Remy Carver wasn't much like Vince. He could have played her. He could have been acting. He might even be in a relationship with Adeline, which was deeply messed up. But people in messed up families did messed up things. If Vince didn't exist, then better she observed it for herself. Like going to an open casket funeral. Sometimes that was the only way you could accept someone you loved was truly gone. She tried her big Y card and the seam trick, but the lock resisted. In her car, she had a wire bent into an under-the-door device. These didn't look great to use, since you had to squat down and shove a wire into the seam between the door and ground. Once inside, the wire bent up, and if you angled it right, the loop at the end grabbed the lever. You tugged, and the knob turned. Glancing around the parking lot, she was ready to go back for the wire when a woman came out of one of the rooms holding an ice bucket. While she waited for the woman to get her ice, then mess around with the vending machine, Charlie wondered if there was a simpler way to get inside the room. Her shadow. She sent it out deliberately for the first time, pushed it through the open spaces between door and frame. Her vision split, and the headache started between her eyes. She tried to concentrate on her shadow hand becoming solid enough to turn the lever, but it felt like grasping at nothing. Part of her was conscious of the woman moving back toward her room, of a light drizzle starting up. The rest of her was fumbling in the dark. She tried to push energy into her shadow. She wasn't sure if she was doing it correctly, until her hand became briefly solid, and the lever turned. Her shadow flowed back to her in a rush, and the sensation was so intense and strange that Charlie had to lean against the wall, shutters running through her. It was as though moths alighted everywhere on her skin and then were somehow absorbed into her. And even more overwhelming, the possibilities that opened up, the vast expanse of things she would be able to do, the places she'd be able to worm her way into, unfurling in front of her. Taking a deep breath to steady herself, Charlie pushed the door the rest of the way open. She flipped the lights and had to smother a scream. A massive bloodstain covered the gray patterned rug. It took her a few moments of standing there, lightheaded, fighting down panic, to absorb that it was only a stain, and an old one at that. There were smears at the edges, where scrubbing had made the blood blur. That was why the room couldn't be rented. It needed a new carpet. Charlie closed the door slowly behind her, making sure it didn't slam. Photographs had been taped up along the wall above a cheap-looking pressboard cabinet. A bed resting in the middle of the floor had a stripped-down mattress covered in clothes. The blinds on the window had been taped over from the inside with garbage bags, and a rolled-up towel rested near the door, probably used to hide any light from peeking out while Vince was inside. Torn packaging from Williamson's clothier was scattered over the chair near the bathroom. A shoebox, a heavy wooden hanger, and one of those zip-up body bags fancy suits came in. As she stepped into the room, she realized the lamp on the bedside table had been knocked over and smashed. The bed itself was pushed a bit diagonal, as though something heavy had shoved it. And on the other side, she found a chair, turned on its side. There'd been some kind of struggle. Was the absence of the van in the parking lot evidence that Vince had escaped his assailants? Or had Salt taken him and the van both? Charlie forced herself over to the wall. Photos of the Hierophant had been taped there, standing on a street corner, meeting with Malik from the Cabal, a shot of him covered in what looked like shadowy armor, as though he were some kind of knight. And beneath them, 
a printout of an article from two years before. Suspect and shadow theft case has all charges dropped, victims outraged. The photo of him was small and blurry from being printed off the internet, but she recognized him right away. The Hierophant's name was Stephen Vorman. But she still didn't understand the connection between him and Red, unless the blight to whom Stephen had been tethered was Red. But he'd wanted her to give Red a message. So that couldn't be right. It bothered her. The idea that she wouldn't be able to tell. If she knew Vince, she ought to know his shadow. On the nightstand, she found a notebook, rinds of paper stuck in the coils left over from pages that had been ripped out. In the bathroom, she found a comb and pomade. And in the trash can beside the toilet, she found a glued-together box with clay inside of it, a styrofoam cup stained with black paint, a bottle of clear nail polish, and two empty plastic containers that had a two-part resin in them. He'd obviously been molding something, but what? Turning over the box, she noted the squarish-shaped depressions. Charlie went back to the bed with a notebook. Fishing around in her bag, she came out with a pencil and did the old trick of running the graphite lightly down the page so the marks of previous writing would be revealed. Char, I don't know how to say goodbye to you. Charlie sat there for a long time, staring at the ghost of a letter. While she didn't understand what it was, Vince was out there executing a plan of his own. And given what he'd written, he didn't seem optimistic about how it was going to turn out. She needed to think. Paul Echo had a page of the book. He'd gotten it from someone. And Knight had seen the book, although he hadn't found the ritual that made the Book of Blights famous, the ritual that Red was hoping to enact. Maybe Knight had missed that part. After all, a quick flip through in an auction house wasn't enough time to be certain there was nothing important inside. Charlie had seen plenty of secrets that weren't readily apparent. Tiny words written in artwork, lemon juice print revealed by heat, ciphers that were all but impossible to decipher without an equally well-hidden key, any of the puzzles that Glomists created for one another. But Knight had said he had the means to bring someone down, and she had every reason to believe that person was salt. So there had to be something. Fetching Knight Singh's book, she smoothed out its leather cover and thumbed through the pages, skimming for Salt's name. For anything to do with blights, or immortality, or the breath of life. Nothing. And Raven, who'd read it, claimed not to have found anything either. Charlie went through the book again, more carefully. She felt each page's thickness to see if any had been glued together. She checked the spine to see if anything had been inserted into it. Then she checked the end papers, running the pads of her finger over them to check for any unevenness. On the back inside cover, she found light glue marks along one edge, as though perhaps the paper had been removed and replaced. Getting the knife attached to her keys, she tried scraping at the edge. Sliding it into the seam, she pried up the edge, loosening the leather. And there, underneath, were papers written in an unfamiliar hand. There seemed to be various ways to cut a dormant shadow away from a living person. Remy is able to make Red pick up the shadow of a knife and wield it. Interestingly, the knife does permanently lose its shadow, and the next morning, I perceived spots of rust on the blade, which warrants further investigation. Remy, as a glomist, can use his fingers and, while making a snipping motion, use those scissors to sever the bond between person and shadow. It was also possible for me to cut away a shadow using an onyx knife. All those means can also be used to remove a shadow from a corpse. But this shadow has a discernible difference in texture and weight. This also warrants further investigation. That had to have been written by Salt. It wasn't quite a confession, but it was damning nonetheless. The next page was worse. I cut her wrist several times, thinking that perhaps that would be enough trauma to quicken her shadow but she died like all the rest, despite the alterations done to her. Yeah, that was bad. Charlie wasn't sure if any of this would be admissible in court, but it would lead investigators to look for evidence, which was almost certainly out there. 
and it would ruin him in the court of public opinion. Not to mention what the cabal would be forced to do, since it was other glomists he'd been targeting. The third page was about Red. Remy has been doing experiments of his own, ones he's been hiding from me. He has been setting his shadow free. I have no idea how he's managed this and have it returned to him, but it does. Does he feed it excess blood? And if so, how much? How long has he been doing this? Now I will be paying close attention. Another thing I must know. Is he controlling it? And if not, does that mean Red is self-aware? Kogato ergo sum. And if so, what has it stolen from Remy to become that way? And then a final page. I have made a mistake, one I hope I will be able to correct. If I can't have Red, then I will have to kill him. If Salt knew that Night Singh had those papers, then he would certainly have wanted Night dead. Salt had to have been the client paying Adam, the one he'd hidden from Balthazar. Now she had the leverage. If she could figure out what to do with it. If she could solve the puzzle in time. A con, after all, was about uncovering the truth. Warping it, sure, but uncovering it first. It was the closest thing Charlie had to Posey's tarot. A belief in something larger than herself. Just like Posey could put down cards in neat little rows, Charlie could plan out her schemes. But eventually, she had to surrender to improvisation and trust her instincts. Charlie recalled lying on the rug of Salt's house, with a hidden room and a safe only steps away, where all his most valuable possessions would be kept, including ones that were never supposed to be found. That was what she needed to get into. Just in case Vince came back, Charlie ripped a piece of paper from the back of his notebook and used her pencil to write him a message. I found the letter you didn't send me. Call me if you find this. And don't do anything stupid. Love, Char. She left the note on the mattress. Then she flipped off the lights and carefully closed the hotel room door, keeping her head down as she crossed the parking lot. 29. The Past Vince sat at the bar, every part of him alert to the crush of people around him, to the smell of sweat and the sweet rot of syrupy drinks sunk down into the grooves of the floor. The music was turned up loud enough to discourage much in the way of conversation, but to the right of him, a guy was trying, shouting at another guy about a video game where you built a house underwater. That's the whole point, the guy was yelling, to survive, build your base. You've got to get ready for when they launch the update and the sharks come. It had been a month and a half since he'd left Salt's house. And every day he was away from the place, he simultaneously hated it more and missed it. He felt homesick for what had never been his home. And for the one person who had mattered to him most and was gone. The hardest part was having so much time to think. To have to make his own decisions. To wrestle with the guilt of being alive when by all rights he shouldn't have been. Vince was used to measuring out his life in small moments, never letting himself look much ahead, and never daring to look behind. Here we are, on a boat. Here we are, with a knife. Here we are, in the bedroom of a CFO in the middle of the night. And now Vince had to make plans if he was going to survive. He had something he could use to bring down the old man, but he couldn't use it on his own. Better to pass it off to Night Sing with his web of connections and his dislike of salt. The item was in the messenger bag slung across Vince's shoulder, and he wanted nothing more than to be rid of it. Maybe Vince could have a future where he wasn't constantly looking over his shoulder. That thought brought a rush of guilt with it. The problem was that Vince wasn't used to the setting things up part. He'd been all about the execution. Another? The bartender asked. Vince had allowed himself to be talked into a pumpkin beer having no idea what to order in a place like this. Adeline would have had champagne with vodka to wake it up. Salt would have had a single malt from a place that Vince was certain he'd butcher the pronunciation of, and which was likely to dig deeply into his cash reserves. Remy had always had whatever everyone else was having, but Vince didn't have to act like Remy anymore. The pumpkin beer had the virtue of being cheap. Unfortunately, in Vince's opinion, that was its singular virtue. 
I think I'll try something else. While the bartender went through what they had on tap and Vince chose something at random, he noticed two glow mists walking in. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw them spread out, their gaze sweeping the room, trying to spot someone with a description Vince had given. He supposed that they were attempting to be subtle, allowing their shadows to seem dormant, but Vince clocked them immediately. There was an energy to them, a dark swirling at the edges, like smoke trickling out from hidden hot embers beneath char. Night Singh had promised to meet him alone. He'd lied, which meant that Vince had very probably walked into a trap. He'd chosen this place because it was crowded and was glad of it now. There couldn't be many other people in the room, if any, without shadows. But so long as he stayed part of the crush at the bar, what he was lacking wouldn't be apparent. Vince was glad he'd only described himself tonight as wearing a red scarf, one which was still resting in his bag, waiting to be put on. He turned to the woman standing beside him. If he was part of a conversation, he'd give the glomists another reason to overlook him. Around his age, her cheeks were flushed from the warmth of the room. She signaled to the bartender, who seemed to be aggressively ignoring her. Her licorice black hair hung down her back, and a tattoo of scarab beetles formed a collar just beneath her throat. Across the room, one glow mist had positioned himself near the entrance, and another was standing in front of an empty booth. Night must be on his way. Vince raised his hand and somehow caught the bartender's attention. I think she'd like a drink, he said. The woman flashed him a look he found hard to read. A gin and tonic, she said. The cheapest gin you have, with three limes. The bartender turned to Vince, and he realized that his second beer was half gone. He didn't remember drinking it. He didn't even remember if he liked it. Bourbon. Neat, he said, dredging that up from a movie or something. When it came, he learned that neat meant without ice. I don't usually order god-awful drinks, she told him squeezing the first of the desiccated and slightly brown limes perched on the side of her glass. So tonight's special, he said. That got him a quick smile. There and gone. And suddenly, Vince had the terrible certainty that he knew her. He couldn't remember where or under what circumstances, but they'd met before. The crowd surged in, and he put one hand against the bar to brace himself. You grew up around here? It was not a particularly clever question, but maybe her answer would help him place her. The woman pushed back her mane of black hair and took a deep swallow of her drink, trying to avoid being shoved off the bar stool by a guy on the other side of her. Yeah, I'm a local, but I bet you're not. He nodded, tailoring his story to her lead. Only been in town a few months. She raised her eyebrows. School? He shifted position, so that he was standing between her and the press of people. Got an elbow in the back for his trouble. Shook his head. Looking to make a change. We've got a lot of asparagus. She laughed at his puzzlement. <laughs> so much that they call it Hadley grass. There's even a festival. And three different asparagus ice creams. That the kind of excitement you're into? Sounds about the level I can handle. The funny thing was, it might as well have been true that he wasn't local, for all he'd seen of the towns. I guess there's an archery school and a place where you can learn how to swing a broadsword. There was a slight slur to her voice that made him wonder if the flush in her cheeks was as much from liquor as warmth. In case I want to slay a dragon. Her nails were ragged at the edges, the nail polish chipped from her biting them. Do you? A quick glance showed him that Night Singh had arrived. He sat in a booth at the far end of the room. Night's people had positioned themselves in strategic locations so that once they spotted Vince, they could close in and cut him off from the exits. He counted five. Definitely a setup. Vince eyed the nearby fire door the crowd was trying to press him into. Want to slay dragons? He echoed. I don't want to slay anything. The bartender walked by and dropped a receipt in front of her and seemed about ready to ask Vince if he wanted another round. She lifted it and eyed the guy. What's this? He shrugged. Your bill? Maybe I wanted another drink, she said, ground a glass in her voice. So pay for the last one. He wore an arrogant little smile, aware he ruled the bar. She leaned toward him, 
her voice loud enough the people waiting for their drinks could hear her. I've been sitting here, watching you short pour the guests, give people the wrong change, use sour mix instead of lime juice, and wipe down the counters straight into the ice bin, she told him, reaching into her bag and pulling out a handful of coins. You're going to burn and bartender hell. You're drunk, he said defensively. If I am, it's despite you. She counted out what she owed in quarters and dimes, leaving him as many pennies as she could find at the bottom of her purse. She turned to Vince, and the fire hadn't gone out of her eyes. You think I'm petty, right? He thought she was everything Remy had been afraid to be. I think you're a vigilante, he said, smiling. She contemplated him for a long moment. Come outside with me, she said. It's too hot in here. Vince was torn. If he left with her, Knight and his people would be less likely to spot him. Walking beside her, his missing shadow could be easily overlooked. But part of him wondered if Knight had come there expecting to be set up himself. If the Glomist was taking precautions instead of making a move against Vince, then the situation was still salvageable. What he wanted, though, was to go outside with the woman. He got out his wallet and threw down a couple of bills. She took his hand and led him toward the door. He watched the confident sway of her hips. She walked through the bar as though she expected everyone to get the hell out of her way. And amazingly, they did. I'm Vince, he told her. But her gaze was on Night Sing, recognition in her expression. Then her gaze slid back to Vince. Charlie, she said, pointing to herself. Charlie Hall. Vince had counted five Glomists, but that didn't mean Knight hadn't hired people who weren't Glomists. People like Charlie. She might lead him around the back of the bar and sink a knife in his side. And if he was lucky, that was when Knight Singh's people would restrain him and sell him back to Salt. If he wasn't lucky, she'd have orders to finish him off. The cold air of the alley hit his face and he felt a rush of indifference toward risks. He liked her. He liked that she was mean and funny and willing to make a scene. He liked that she was nothing like him or anyone from his old life. He liked her enough to follow her deeper into the alley, despite his suspicions. When she turned against the brick facade of the building and threw him a look that felt like a dare, he pressed her back against the wall and kissed her. Her lips were chapped. He could smell her perfume, something with smoke and roses in it. Her mouth tasted like gin. Night Singh could go hang. Vince could make the exchange some other time. Drawing away, he looked down at her, traced the line of scarabs across her collarbone. Do you want to go somewhere? He whispered against her hair, although he wasn't sure where that would be. He'd spent the last night in a van. All he knew was that he wanted her. Here, she said softly reaching for his belt. He wasn't sure if she actually liked him. Maybe she just wanted to forget whatever sadness she'd come to the bar to drink away. He could make her forget. He concentrated on the hot rush of her breath, the softness of her hip when he lifted her, the scratch of the brick against his palm. He didn't dare think about the past, and he wouldn't let himself think about the future. All he let himself think of was her. 30. Ye Who Enter Here On Saturday night, Charlie pulled her mother's station wagon to the curb, far enough from Salt's house, that she didn't think anyone would notice their arrival. Pressing her forehead to the steering wheel, she took a deep breath. Then she turned to her sister in the passenger seat. You don't have to do this. Posey made a face. You don't either. At least I'm getting something out of it. I don't know what you're getting. A preemptive strike, Charlie informed her. She knew Salt was perfectly capable of fulfilling all the worst of his promises. If she didn't get this right, she might not have another chance. Charlie got out of the car. See you later, alligator, she said, leaning on the door. Posey grinned. After a while, crocodile. Charlie made her way along the side of the road, backpack slung over one shoulder. 
the closer she got to Salt's fairy tale castle of a house, the more clearly she remembered the last time she'd been there, the panic she'd felt running through those woods, the cockiness Rand had as they went inside, the churn of her guts. And there she was, years later, about to con her way into a party, dressed in a scratchy white shirt, cheap black pants, and a vest, looking the picture of a cater waiter. She liked to think Rand would be proud. She'd spent all of Friday getting ready. Abandoning her collection of wigs, she'd gone to the mall and had a recent beauty school graduate give her a pixie cut. It made the back of her neck itch, but she definitely looked different. With that, she added a fresh round of Halloween makeup to cover her bruises and tucked all the supplies she thought she would need into her backpack. The swelling in her face had gone down a bit, and she was almost entirely sure that her rib was okay. She was doing great. Charlie tried to sink into character, resentful and underpaid employee arriving late to a gig to which she already regretted agreeing. It wasn't that hard. As she swung through the open gates, which, she couldn't help notice, were connected to a fence topped with what appeared to be an electric wire, she had almost convinced herself that it wouldn't bother her to see the estate. Then it came into view, and her stomach tried to crawl out of her mouth. Constructed of some gray stone, and crawling with Boston ivy turned bright red and gold in the late autumn air. It loomed in the distance. Gargoyles, made of bronze and streaked with vertigrees, squatted above the roof, watching her approach. The more she looked, the sharper her memories became. So she turned her gaze to the grass and kept going. Run. You have to run. The people from the palace are hunting me. Charlie had worked enough jobs that she ought to trust the tug of intuition, that antenna inside her attuned to wrongness. There was something she was missing, as though she was looking at dots up close. But if only she could step back, she'd see another pattern. That feeling had kept her from getting caught before. Sometimes you felt the air change and knew to abandon a con. But no matter how wrong this already felt, she was going to see tonight through. A valet watched Charlie in a considering manner as she approached the house. She gave him the long-suffering nod of one person working on a Saturday to another. That seemed good enough to convince him she was staff, and he lost interest. Around the back, Charlie found the kitchen. She'd called around until she discovered someone involved in the party. It turned out that Jose was part of the on-site catering. He'd left the door propped open for her. Inside, cold shrimp were being tweezered onto silver platters topped with lettuce leaves and some kind of creamy sauce. Risotto balls were being lowered into a portable fryer set up on a large marble island big enough to lay out a dead body on. She turned her thoughts away from that. It was easy to be overlooked at a party like this, with multiple vendors and freelance waitstaff. Jose's catering would be supplemented by specialty offerings, like a caviar station or a sushi station or a human sacrifice station. Hopefully, she could get lost among them. She was just stepping into the hall when someone called after her. You're late, said a harried-looking woman with a clipboard and a lot of curly blonde hair, probably the event coordinator. With what Charlie hoped was a sufficiently blank look, she turned. Sorry, I was looking for a bathroom to use before I started. There isn't time. Put your things down and take these hors d'oeuvres. Charlie shoved her backpack under a table where she could grab it easily later and took the metal tray. Across the room, she saw Jose, rolling prosciutto roses. He winked. Cheeks prickly with warmth after going from the cold autumn air into rooms full of bodies. Charlie moved through Lionel Salt's mansion. Passing leaves smeared with blue cheese and candied walnuts to anyone with empty hands was a good cover for reacquainting herself with the house and trying to spot Vince. Charlie gritted her teeth against the uncomfortable mix of familiarity and dread she felt as she walked through the rooms. She kept a little smile on her face and didn't meet anyone's eyes. Balthazar had shielded her from direct contact with clients, but stealing things occasionally meant conning people so it wasn't like no gloom had met her before. She just hoped no one would recognize her. Passing through a gallery-like hall near the entrance, she covertly observed a display of antiquarian books under glass. 
Beside that was an etched plate that said, The Lionel Salt Library will be open to all Glomists and cultivate a space where arcane knowledge can be shared. The taxidermied animal heads Charlie remembered looked down from where they hung. Their shining glass eyes, polished antlers, and sharp horns catching the light. Usually collections like salts were hoarded, so the idea of getting a look must have gotten the glooms, especially the younger ones, salivating. As a thief of magical secrets, Charlie was not unlike a bee, pollinating many flowers. Once glomists digested an old book, copying down the experiments or techniques they thought might be useful into their own notes, the only reason they hung on to the original copy was to guarantee that what they learned stayed exclusive to them. Charlie had once failed to steal a volume from a guy, because when she arrived, she discovered that he burned every single book he'd acquired as soon as he copied down the parts in which he was interested. She still got angry sometimes, thinking about him. If Salt wanted to found a library, that would make him very popular. It showed a willingness to share his secrets, a generosity of spirit. Or that his secrets were so much greater and more terrible that he could afford to have a collection like this mean nothing to him. Either way, he ought to have no problem convincing the local glomists that his elevation to the cabal had been long overdue. His influence would grow, and so would the horror that followed in his wake. Charlie's gaze went to her own shadow, then away. At the end of the hall hung an oil painting of a dark-haired woman, lying on a couch, wearing a diamond-encrusted crown. Her dress was parted, showing her naked body from the waist down, and suspended over her by straps was a stallion. Charlie frowned at it, then glanced around. It was far from the only piece of disturbing art. A painting of a Roman king being devoured by his horses hung by a door. Beneath a sconce, she spotted a sketch of a decomposing fawn, as though Salt's house needed to be creepier. Charlie walked by massive and magnificent stairs carved in the shapes of lions through an arch into a sitting room. There, two bartenders poured drinks from behind a wooden bar topped in pewter. A small knot of people waited for their drinks. Gangsters stood shoulder to shoulder with academics. Performers chatted with mystics. Gloaming was a new science, and its practitioners as hungry as the shadows that fluttered behind them in the shapes of capes or wrapped around their bodies like snakes. Others drifted a bit behind their wearer, leashed by a single silver cord, moving to peer out of the window or fetch a drink. One shadow even drifted up to her tray, plucking an endive off of it before she could pause. Startled into stopping, she swallowed a curse as she almost dropped the food. She heard a bark of laughter from across the room. A prank. It reminded her that no matter how tense she was, and no matter how terrible her suspicions were, to most of the glooms present, this was a party. With effort, she swallowed her irritation and glanced into the great room with its towering two-story ceiling and its wall of windows. She spotted Salt in a tuxedo, standing beside one of his four enormous couches, declaiming to a few older glomists. Adeline, in an elegant black column of a dress, stood beside the limestone fireplace, in which green and blue flames burned. An enormous painting of a forest hung over the mantel. Only when you looked closely did you notice that it was full of shadows wearing deep red slashes for mouths, and that gray body parts had been rendered among the ferns of the forest floor. Two additional cabal members were there as well. Bellamy stood in a corner, and Malik looked particularly regal. His locks had been pulled into flat twists on the sides, and wrapped in gleaming gold thread his shadow hanging across his body like a sash. A trio of musicians in animal masks played classical music. An owl with a violin, a fox with a cello, a bear with a viola. Through the windows, an outdoor garden was lit with low lamps that showed off marble statues of shrouded figures. What must it have been like to grow up in a place like this, surrounded by this much wealth, force-fed untold depravity? Charlie finished her circuit and ate the remaining hors d'oeuvres so she had an excuse to go back to the kitchen. Setting the silver tray down on the marble island to be wiped and refilled, she took the opportunity to grab her backpack. Then she headed directly for the library. Charlie's memories of the house were blurry and indistinct, 
more nightmare than recollection. A voice close enough for her to have felt breath on her neck. Cavernous rooms linked together in a puzzling maze. The library, with a secret door leading to a room of treasures, including a safe. With the rug she vomited on, and where she might have died. When she glanced in, she found two men in the leather chairs, talking in an intense way, one gesturing with a snifter of cognac. An empty glass and a napkin rested beside the other. They looked extremely settled. Charlie needed to make them move, and quickly. Excuse me, sir, she said, squatting down in front of the one she thought seemed more self-important. I'm sorry, but there was a woman asking for you in the other room. Tall with red hair, very pretty. She described you and told me that if I saw you, I should inform you of her interest. He looked smug and rose. I'll just be a second, he said to his friend. But his friend was rising too. Going to refresh my drink, the man said with a little too obvious relief. And Charlie had the sudden thought that perhaps she'd saved him from being buttonholed for the entire evening. Charlie picked up the crumpled napkin and began to sweep up imaginary crumbs until she was alone. Then she went to the light switch on the wall, throwing it so that the darkened room would seem off limits to other guests. She reached into her backpack and drew on gloves and glasses with tiny lights attached to both sides. Once she switched them on, they would make her face a confusing blur to cameras, as well as provide a way to work in the dark. Finally, she went to the wall of books. Red and gold. Red and gold. Something with flames. Something with a title that started with an I. She couldn't find the lever. Two pulls of books with red spines and gold type went nowhere. Then she spotted it. A shelf lower than where she'd been looking, and a foot to the left. Inferno. She lifted it, and the bookshelf door swung jerkily inward, revealing the smaller library and the painting with the safe behind. Charlie stepped through into the secret room, its walls covered in shelves packed with older books. Nausea abruptly constricted her throat. The memory of lying on the library carpet rushing back at her as though no time had passed between then and now, as though she were still a terrified kid. The rough texture of the merino wool against her cheek. The wetness from her vomit. The voice coming from the dark. Don't look behind you. The smell of beets still made her gag. Charlie stepped through onto the onyx tiles of the smaller chamber. Shelves lined the walls there too, with older and more precious books filling them. Memoirs, notebooks, and scientific journals, a hundred at least, all worth stealing. The mystical discoveries of Tavilde Guerre sat beside confessions of Nigel Lucy, Magus, and Diarios de Juan Pedro Maria Ugarte. There were other books in Portuguese, Chinese, Arabic, Latin, and Greek, as well as a whole half wall in French. Her fingers itched to choose a few at random and stuff them into her bag. Pushing the bookshelf door closed, she checked for any additional wiring that might indicate an unexpected surprise. Charlie didn't find anything that seemed worrisome and turned toward the back of the hidden room. A trompe l'oeil of a dead goat, entrails spilling out and mingling with split pomegranates, hung above a club chair, the only piece of furniture. Gingerly, she felt around the edge of the hideous painting. She found hinges, with no lock on the other side. She swung it open to reveal the wall safe she remembered. Made by Stockinger, who were known for offering solid, bespoke models with the bells and whistles of all the custom luxury safe makers, like Boobin and Zorweg or Agresti. There would be winders for watches, cloth-lined wooden drawers, but none of the ridiculous golden bejeweled neo-Victorian extravagances of Boca de Lobo pieces. Stockinger made serious safes for serious people. A dial rested on the front, beside a gleaming handle engraved with Lionel Salt's initials and beside it, a keypad. Most modern safes were digital, offering none of the romance of breaking into the old ones, none of the listening for when the spin changed, the infinitesimal slotting into place, the softer click-click as satisfying as the crack of knuckles. If she could ignore the keypad entirely, she would. Digital safes 
weren't just unromantic. They were nearly impossible to open without the code. Taking a deep breath, she reset the lock by spinning clockwise, then started going counterclockwise. She heard the first notch at five. Then she reset and spun again and again until she had five numbers. Two, four, five, sixty-three, seven. She was certain of them. She was as sure as sure could be. But what there was no way to know was the order. And five numbers meant five tumblers, five interior wheels, and 120 possible combinations. All she could do then was grind through them, while sweat beaded up at her forehead and in the hollow of her throat. She was conscious of the party going on, of time slipping away, of the possibility that someone might find her. Charlie could hear the moment the fence fell and released the locking mechanism. She let out a long, unsteady breath and turned the lever. It only moved halfway. Then the digital keypad lit, green and bright and blinking. Charlie stared at it in disbelief. This safe wasn't digital or dial. It was both. Her heart rate kicked up and her mouth tasted sour with panic. She had no way to know if there was a timer on entering the code, and she'd be limited in the number of tries. Safes like this offered three, usually, before locking up and setting off an alarm. Fishing a UV pen light out of the bottom of her backpack, Charlie turned off the lights of her glasses, pushing them up onto her head. Then she shone the pen light onto the keypad. Very few people wiped down their keys after use. The light revealed the grease of fingertips, limiting the number of options for the combination. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. The same numbers as the other side. Relieved, she moved to type in the order that had worked on the dial. She stopped herself a moment later, finger hovering over the keypad. There were more markings on the two and the six than on the other numbers, suggesting they repeated. If that was true, then this was a seven-digit code, at minimum. If cracking a mechanical safe was about understanding the machine, cracking a digital safe was about understanding the person who set it. Would they choose a random number and then hide the combination somewhere they could find it? Or would they pick something less random and therefore more memorable? Lionel Salt was the kind of person who needed to be better than everyone else. With his carved stares, his awful paintings, and his willingness to murder for his own amusement. Not his birthday, since it would be a reminder of his age and mortality. Not his name and numbers, because even he would know that was too obvious. Perhaps a word, then? Blight? Shadow? Gloaming? She stopped. The key is abandon all hope. Abandon all hope. It used all of the numerically converted letters and used the six and two four times each. And Salt would like the idea of giving a clue in the form of the book that opened the secret door, referencing the most famous quote from Dante's Inferno, the one that even Charlie, who'd never read it, knew. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. She bet he felt rather smug about his cleverness. Charlie ignored her racing heart her sweaty hands and panicked thoughts. She went over the word again, writing it out in numbers in the dust of the onyx floor. Two, 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 six, three, six, six, two, five, five, four, six, seven, three. Carefully, she punched the code into the still blinking pad. There was a sharp beep, as though an alarm was about to sound. Then she heard the second locking mechanism opening. She turned the lever again. A soft glow came from inside, showing off felt-lined drawers and several shelves of items. Charlie opened one. A small bag of diamonds rested inside. In another, she found an antique pistol chased in gold. And at the bottom, wrapped in cloth, the thing she'd come looking for. Quickly, she made the exchange, shoving the item deep into the bottom of her backpack hoping like hell that she knew what she was doing. Then, in the privacy of Salt's hidden room, she got out her party outfit. Susie Lampton, the only person whose closet she had access to at the moment, wasn't even remotely her size. She still had her key to rapture, though, 
and there was no better time to borrow that red satin suit abandoned in the back. With a little stretch to the fabric, it fit her like a second skin. Add to that some notice me red lipstick, and Charlie would seem like she'd just arrived at the party, instead of robbing it for the better part of an hour. Before she was ready to go out there, she pushed on a three-finger knuckle ring set with onyx and shoved the onyx dagger she'd gotten from Murray's into her bra. Holstered with a makeshift sheath of duct tape, it would be there if she needed it. She waited for the familiar rush, that pleasurable hit of adrenaline. But it wouldn't come. Charlie turned back to the safe, intending to close it, when she noticed a black button in the upper corner, close to the back. Could there be something behind the safe? A compartment she hadn't opened yet? Come on, Charlie Hall. You don't have to stick your finger in every socket. But that cautious instinct seemed to belong to someone who hadn't already chosen the path of recklessness. She pressed the button. A click came from the shelf to her left. Another bookshelf swung open, revealing a hall. A passageway that must run behind the walls of the house. Taking out her phone, Charlie checked the time. She'd gotten to the house at half past six. Jose had told her that the party was supposed to go officially until 10, and that there was going to be a champagne toast at 8.30. It was 7.45. Time was tight. Still, Charlie stepped through. Into the dark. She switched back on the lights on her glasses. They illuminated something that mixed the architecture of a wine cellar with that of a mausoleum. More tiles of onyx ran across the floor. Two cells were ahead of her, with a door opposite them. A groove had been carved into the ground, running in front of the bars, the blue line of a glass flame outlining the edge. The air had a faint smell of rot and of incense. Sweat dampened her palms and brow. This was the bad kind of adrenaline, the kind that made her twitchy instead of careful that made her stomach sour and her hands shaky. This felt like a haunted place. Still, she kept walking. The soft soles of her flats scratched against the floor. The cells were deep enough that Charlie's little lights couldn't pierce the darkness. Along the wall were an assortment of restraints, a rope that had been threaded with onyx beads, a pair of shackles with blue silk padding on the inside the cloth sewn tightly with rectangular onyx tiles. Above them, a shelf with onyx containment boxes. The door on the opposite side was slightly ajar, flickering colors within. She pushed slowly with her foot and found herself staring at a bank of screens. Surveillance footage of the house. Caterers in the kitchen. Partygoers moving through the rooms. The Hierophant, speaking with Vicerain seeming completely composed. She peered at him more closely, hoping for some tell. The only thing notable was that he was thinner and more unhealthily pale than ever. In another room, two men were making out, one a blurred outline. Was he kissing his own shadow? Someone else's? Charlie couldn't tell. Outside in the garden, three men were arguing. One had the other by the shirt, their shadows looming large behind them like the spread plumes of fighting peacocks. Salt was walking through the rooms with purpose, a drink in one hand, looking as though everything was going his way. He glanced up, for a heart-stopping moment, peering directly into the camera. The time in the upper right-hand corner read 7.52. Charlie. Vince's voice came out of the darkness. She whirled around. He was in the cell standing just behind the bars, broad-shouldered, hair like old gold, a small smile turning up the corner of his mouth, as familiar as her own heart. What happened to your eye? He asked. Hold on, she said, so relieved at the sight of him that her voice broke. I can get you out of there. Before Charlie could pick the lock, she had to disable whatever the gas line running along the seam beneath the bars was supposed to do. She guessed it was on some kind of tripwire that would send up a burst of flames when the cell door opened. There had to be a way to turn it off. Charlie hesitated. The wrongness of the scene bothered her. Like an itch in the mind. Pale, hollow eyes followed her movements. 
She wanted to believe it was Vince in the cell, behind bars of onyx, with a gutter of fire between them. But those weren't restraints meant for a human. You're not Vince, are you? She asked softly, walking to the bars. The silence from the cell was her answer. Charlie met the Blight's gaze. You're his shadow. You're red. 31. The Fool, the Magician, and the Hierophant Only when her back hit the wall did she realize how far she'd moved from the cell. You found the Libra Noctum, she managed to choke out. You did the ritual. Because I look like a person, the shadow asked. It was Edmund who made me like this. He wouldn't do that. Her voice came out too high. She didn't know how to comprehend the being in front of her. It was a doppelganger, a mirror reflection come to life, a thing Frankenstein together from discarded parts of Vince, slime and snails and puppy dog tails. Is he here? Is Vince all right? The shadow shrugged. Even its expression was one that Vince would make, slightly chagrined. The tailored suit it wore was the color of its eyes. We met before. Do you remember? Don't look behind you. Charlie didn't speak for a long moment. It wasn't as though the thought hadn't crossed her mind, but she'd had a hard time believing it. In the library. I suppose you wanted it to be Remy who saved you, the shadow said, voice soft. Not red. Charlie wasn't about to answer that. Yes, she had a naive desire for the sort of romance a palm reader would trace on the inside of a hand. A faded love, begun in childhood. Love was a family religion, passed down to her when she'd been too young to protect herself from belief. Even back then, you were already a blight? The shadow nodded, allowing her to turn the subject. And you killed people for salt. She kept her voice stiff. Yes, it said. She had to remind both of them that she wasn't some fool who was going to trust it just because they had a weird past together. Tell me, the way you killed Adam, was that special? Cracking his ribs open like you were going to spatchcock a turkey and painting the walls with his blood? Or is that how you did them all? It stepped closer to the bars. Adam? You've got to remember the guy you murdered on my couch, in a very gross way. The shadow stared at her, with what appeared to be real horror. I'd never do that to you. Never. Charlie hated how much it looked like Vince, and how much that made her want to trust it. Okay, tell me about all the other people you didn't murder. You're clever, it said, with a small, rueful smile. And I'm not used to explaining things. I didn't do much talking before. I don't think I'm very good at it. Try, Charlie said. You shouldn't have had to come back here. It seemed sad and tired. She had no way to know if that was something it was putting on, or if flesh conferred weakness. You should go and never come back, like I told you that night. So, what, I'm supposed to grab my sister and mother and blow town? Let Salt win? Do whatever he wants to Vince? Yes, it said, with more heat than she expected. He can handle himself. He shouldn't have to, Charlie said. He left you, the shadow said. And you, as well, didn't he? Charlie asked. Must piss you off. To have him create you and then shed you like he was crawling out of a chrysalis, leave you behind. Red looked at her with Vince's eyes, but there was a little amusement in them. I'm made of his anger. What do you think? I don't know, Charlie said, refusing to be distracted. I don't know anything about you. The shadow turned its face from her, the amusement gone. I was always the part of him that took care of things when he wasn't able to manage. I was given everything that made him uncomfortable. The desire to cause pain. The terror at what salt made us do. The ability to intuit how other people felt when the bad stuff happened. I was made to be strong, so he didn't have to be. So yes, I was angry when he was gone. But I loved Remy, no matter what he did, 
and no matter what he made me do. A shiver went through Charlie's shoulders. Red went on. He wanted to block out what was happening when I was on his grandfather's missions, so I asked him to try untethering me. We didn't understand about blights then. All we knew was that it worked. Each time I returned to him, I was stronger than before. More solid and for longer. We hid it from salt, he said. Adeline knew, but she kept our secret. Because she and Vince were close, Charlie offered. His lashes brushed his cheek as he looked down and away. We all three were, once. Too close, maybe. We only had each other. It came to her, one of the things she'd heard that night. The boy's voice. He doesn't like you. And then the girl. That's not true. We have games we play that he would never play with you. There was something bad there lurking beneath the surface, but Charlie was too much a coward to ask. She glanced into the room with the monitors. On the screens, Charlie could see that speeches were underway. She was running late. Where's Vince? Charlie asked. The shadow stared back at her with Vince's pale eyes, and she could feel the hair on the back of her neck begin to stand. The itch of wrongness was back, worse than ever. I know this house, Red said. I could help you get out without anyone knowing you were ever here. Not without Vince, Charlie said. You say you care about him. Help me save him. Help me find him. I'd do anything for you, Char, he told her. But don't ask me for that. There was only one person who called her Char. No, you're not him. Stop acting like him. Char, he cautioned. Where is he? she demanded, heart thundering. You already know, he said. She didn't want to put the pieces together. Vince had snapped Hermes' neck and gotten rid of the body. He cleaned up crime scenes, a wash in blood for a living. None of that sounded like Remy, but it sounded a lot like Red. Vince faked his death, Charlie protested. Or Salt faked it for him. He was on the run, and two days ago, he was in a hotel room. The shadow didn't speak. It was hard to fake a death. There were dental records. There was evidence of past surgeries or fractures. Forensics could tell a lot from bones, sex, ancestry, age, height. Salt could have paid someone, or several someones, to cover all that up. There was another answer, though. That the burnt body found in the car had belonged to Edmund Carver. And the person she had known wasn't him at all. The shadow wasn't a malevolent entity taking the shape of Vince. It was Vince. He was Vince. And Vince had always only been the lost parts of Edmund Carver. The scraps from his table, his upside-down self, his mirror self, his night self. He was right. Part of her had known from the moment he'd been horrified about Adam. She hadn't wanted to admit it to herself. Charlie Hall, flinching, finally discovering the puzzle she hadn't wanted to solve. When Remy was dying, Vince said, after his grandfather stabbed him, while Adeline screamed, Remy grabbed hold of me and pulled me to him so I would have all his blood, all his strength. As it left him, it became mine. He breathed his last breath into my mouth. For a moment, I didn't understand how I could be naked, how I could feel the cold floor under me. Then I ran. Hours later, I woke up beneath an underpass, lying on asphalt and broken glass with no idea how I got there. And then I had to learn how to be a person, all the time. I tried to be, for you. Charlie recalled his words during their last fight, their only real fight. I wish I could say I was sorry, that I wanted to be honest the whole time, but I didn't. I never wanted to be honest. I just wanted what I told you to be the truth. If this was what was behind the mask, she understood why he hadn't wanted to remove it. And called yourself Vincent, Charlie said. 
the one thing Remy didn't give me that I took anyway, the shadow said, lifting his chin, as if daring her to judge him for it. Down the hall, gears shifted in the wall, making a soft but distinct noise. Someone had entered the secret room beyond the library. In moments, they'd enter the corridor where Charlie was standing. Vince, she said. Their eyes met. Hide, he told her. Charlie made it to the shadows of the security room, crawling under the leather couch at the same time she heard steps in the hall. How many times had Salt sat on that couch, watching something awful on the screens? Rand might have died in one of these cells. Charlie herself could have died there. Could, still, if she wasn't careful. Red, a woman's voice, soft and worried. Adeline, Charlie realized. He didn't tell me you were here until now. Did he hurt you? Only silence answered her. I know. I should have left when you did, she said, with a big huffing sigh. You must be very angry with me. Vince's voice had a veneer of calm, but beneath you could hear the vibration of some very different emotion. Once his mother was dead, he wasn't going to rest until the world knew what your father had done. You should have warned him she was in danger. I didn't know. How could I have known she was going to overdose? I thought she was getting better. We all did. You know why she never got better, Vince said. Your father needed her to be sick, and then he needed her to be dead. Vince sounded as though he was talking about a family that wasn't also his. His mother, your father. The only person he considered to be his family was Remy. I swear I didn't know about any of it, she protested. The hall was dark, and Charlie thought it might be possible to slip out past Adeline while she was distracted. Quietly, she pulled herself out from under the couch. But as she edged closer to the door, Charlie's whole plan started to seem wobbly. Maybe she should bonk Adeline over the head and try to get Vince out of the prison. But if Adeline didn't have the key, and neither Adeline nor Vince were behaving as though there was a possibility of her freeing him, then they were all screwed. Carefully, Charlie slid behind Adeline's body, moving slowly and sticking to the shadows. You can still help me. Vince's voice was soft. He didn't look in Charlie's direction, but there was something so carefully blank in his stare that the effort showed. Adeline put her hand on one of the onyx bars of his prison. How? Charlie was far enough down the hall by then that she didn't hear Vince's request. Maybe it was unfair to think he couldn't trust Adeline as far as he could throw her. If Charlie's plan worked, it wouldn't matter. She'd come back with a hammer and a flame-retardant blanket and get him out. She would, even if she was afraid of him. Sliding the door open, Charlie slipped through. Then she climbed back through the second hidden bookcase into the library. She needed to get outside and meet Posey, but she was distracted, thinking of how he'd guided her through the house that night. Don't look. What would she have seen if she had, back then? Perhaps a smudgy shape, like a ghost? Perhaps he would have been half boy and half shadow. Don't look at me. She snuck into a garden room. Ominously large plants with waxy leaves filled the spaces between pieces of white cast iron furniture. Through the windows, she could see the gardens. Charlie took out her phone and sent a text. The time on her screen read 8.16. 14 minutes to do what she needed to do, and no chance for errors. But she had at least one answer she hadn't before. If Red wasn't the blight that Salt had been using to do his dirty work, she knew who had been in his employ. Opening a multi-paned glass door halfway, she slipped through into the cold night air. Posey met her on the side of the house, breathing hard. I made it. <sighs> she looked wide-eyed with panic. You're still sure? Charlie asked her sister. You're the one who has to be sure, Posey told her. Although she was obviously nervous, and not just about getting caught. We can still walk away. Walk away. Wasn't that what she'd tried to do for years? Walked away from the death of Rand, pretended it hadn't scarred her pretended she didn't remember, that she didn't blame herself for surviving. 
walked away from being a thief and told herself it was because of the bullet in her side that she'd lost her nerve, rather than admit she'd scared herself with how easily and brutally she'd turned the betrayal back on Mark. She'd never been all that afraid of getting hurt or dying. It had always been her own abilities, her capacity for solving a puzzle, for getting a job done at any cost. She was terrified of what she could do if she tried. From the time she'd pretended to channel Alonzo and it had actually gotten rid of Travis, she'd been afraid of herself. Somebody needed to keep her in check, and so that person became Charlie herself, making sure she got knocked down every time things were going too well, picking the wrong people to love, getting fired from jobs, screwing up. Charlie had been walking away from herself her whole life. She sat down on the grass. Posey sat down opposite her, their feet touching. Charlie took the onyx dagger from its sheath. Ready? She asked. Posey nodded. Charlie wasn't sure what she expected, but the first cut didn't feel like anything. The real challenges were spotty moonlight and inexperience, and she was relieved when her part was done and Posey took over. Inside the house, she watched Salt move to the front of the great room. He had a champagne flute in one hand. This must be the part where he thanked them all for coming and the cabal for accepting him as a member. Charlie staggered to her feet, not quite sure how she felt. Not lighter, not less herself, but changed. Maybe there really was such a thing as fate. Maybe people really did have destinies that could be deciphered through cards. Maybe Charlie needed to stop fighting hers. With a last look back at Posey, she opened one of the glass doors to the great room. A great gust of cold wind whipped through the room behind her, filling the long white curtains like sails. Conversations went out like candles as the glomists turned toward her. She hadn't expected to make quite so dramatic an entrance. Charlie stuck close to the doors, making sure the light was coming toward her. Hello, she said, her voice carrying in the high-ceilinged room and remaining steady, despite all the eyes on her. Sorry, I'm late. Charlie Hall, Lionel Salt said, furious the interruption and doing a bad job of hiding it. I didn't expect you'd make it. Tension straightened her spine, drawing back her shoulders. She was certain he'd been counting on her not showing up. After all, he'd given her a terrifying threat and then set her a task at which she'd been guaranteed to fail. The last place she ought to be was at his party. The smart thing to do, would be to leave town for a couple of weeks until things cooled off. Maybe not come back. But of course, whatever kind of smart Charlie was, it wasn't that kind. You told me what would happen if I didn't. A few hushed conversations became less hushed after that. Gossip was the lifeblood of any party. A musician, the one in the owl mask, made for the exit, instrument in hand. A waiter whispered to Jose. The waiter pointed. Jose took a canapé off a silver tray and ate it. This was definitely not going to help her reputation back home. Across the room, the hierophant left where he'd been standing and began to move toward her. His eyes were more sunken than ever. His lips had a faintly blue cast. I would think that this was a piece of performance art for our entertainment, except that Lionel seems absolutely flummoxed, said Vicerain. The head of the alterationists was in a tuxedo her shadow taking on the appearance of a large hunting cat pawing the ground beside her. Maybe you missed your cue? Salt cleared his throat. I hired her to steal back a book that I lost, the Liber Noctum. It is a jewel in my collection, and I had hoped to have it on display tonight. So, Miss Hall, do you have my book? I do, she said. He smiled at that with all the satisfaction of someone checkmating a rogue king. Well then, come and give it to me. He had, after all, arranged a situation where all her choices were bad. The only book she had was the one that had belonged to Night Sing. She could bluff and give him that. He'd probably appreciate having it, since the cover was stuffed with pages full of heinous shit he'd done. But no matter if she gave him something valuable, he'd still accuse her of foul play of trying to pass off that book as his lost one. Charlie took a deep breath, 
letting Salt really enjoy the moment. Then she reached into her backpack and took out what she'd brought from the safe in the library, where it had been locked up tight the whole time. The famed Book of Night, the genuine Liber Noctum. Light streaming through the crystals of the chandelier reflected off the polished metal cover, sending rainbows along the wall. The smile left Salt's face so quickly that it seemed as though it had been slapped off. Where did you find? I stole it, Charlie said. That's what I do. You told me to get it, so I got it. The Hierophant reached for the book with pale, trembling fingers. Mine! Those secrets belong to me. 32. The Charlatan This close, Charlie could smell the sour sweat of the Hierophant's body. She held tight to the book and turned her gaze to Salt. Shall I give it to him? No, Salt barked, then saw the warning in the Hierophant's face and modulated his tone. Bring it to me, so I can verify this is the authentic volume. Charlie frowned. So you don't want me to give it to him? Do not make me repeat myself, Salt said. Bring the book to me. Her heart pounded. There were so many chances to get things wrong here and only one chance to get them right. People were watching. Viserain was close by, but so far with no reason to be anything but amused. I can promise you this copy of the Liber Noctum is authentic, Charlie said. Since I got it from your safe, along with a certificate from Sotheby's and a receipt from the auction, the book never left the house. You just let everyone believe that it was stolen. Is that true? The Hierophant croaked out. Salt began walking toward Charlie, allowing him to lower his voice, making it harder for the rest of the crowd to listen in. Let's discuss this further in private. Charlie had puzzled over why Salt had set her an impossible task with an even more impossible deadline, unless he wanted her to fail. It was thinking about that which made her remember Night Singh's opinion on the Liber Noctum. If there had been a ritual in the book to let a blight take human form, then nothing made much sense. But if there was no ritual, if the book was as useless as Knight had claimed, then Salt was free to employ the rumor to convince a blight to help him. But that depended on keeping the book forever out of the blight's hands, and yet seemingly obtainable enough to stay hooked. Hence the need for a thief of the original volume, Edmund Carver a new possible lead, Paul Echo, and the most recent red herring, Charlie Hall. If she hadn't shown up, Salt could have convinced the Hierophant she had the book and was hiding it from him, and Charlie would wind up with her guts smeared on the ceiling, just like the others. Or she could have shown up to the party to say she hadn't found the Liber Noctum. That might help some, but Salt would accuse her of holding out, and her guts would still wind up on the ceiling. What Salt needed was someone for the Hierophant to blame, anyone other than him, which meant he knew where the book was, and the simplest answer for how he knew was that he still had it. She'd had a bad moment when she saw Red in the cell, not just astonished by him, but abruptly sure she'd been wrong about everything. But then she realized he must have been the convincer the reason the Hierophant believed Salt in the first place. If there wasn't a ritual, then how could he exist? Private? I don't think so, said Charlie, shaking her head. You're responsible for a lot of murders. Night Singh, for one. I'd rather not be next. A wave of murmuring moved through the crowd. It was one thing to chuckle at a party's host bickering with a guest. An accusation like the one Charlie was making? required a more serious response from the cabal. Come along, Salt grabbed for her arm. What did that young woman say? Asked Malik. He stepped forward, several others with him. Charlie didn't think surrounding Salt was intentional, but it spoke to how the mood of the room had shifted. Two things she'd known from the time Salt forced her into his car at gunpoint were that he wanted control more than anything, maybe even more than power and that he expected absolute obedience from those he considered beneath him. He sent his shadow toward her, 
They were close enough that it might not have been immediately noticeable to the crowd, but she felt it brushing against her shoulder and cheek, as though she'd been touched by a piece of muslin whipped by a breeze. She only had time to gasp once before it flooded into her skin. She could feel it worming inside of her, trying to force her to speak, trying to make her tongue form the words that would cause her to deny everything. Long ago, when Charlie had come to Salt's house with Rand, she had practiced rolling up her eyes into her head to indicate that she was possessed, had been ready to speak with another voice. Ever since Alonzo, she found it disturbingly easy to be someone other than Charlie Hall, a relief to give in to such an old urge. I'm drunk, she shouted in a deeper voice than her natural one. And a liar, a drunk liar. Also, I have a secret resentment toward the fantastic, handsome, totally not a killer Lionel Salt, who is most certainly not trying to puppet me. He stared at her, mouth agape. Everyone was looking at his shadow now, the way it had bent against the light to get to her. Get out of my head, Mr. Salt, she said in her normal voice. Laughter bubbled up around them. Charlie allowed herself to step away from the door to the garden the one whose proximity to the darkness had hidden what was changed in her, what she was lacking. The shadowless can't be controlled. There's a door shut inside of them. There would have been no way for Charlie to come here and confront Salt if it was possible for him to puppet her. It had been surprisingly hard to give up her shadow, but she'd sewn it to Posey's feet and trusted her sister to care for it. Charlie wasn't destined to be a glomist. She was destined for this. Lionel, said Vice Rain. That was naughty of you. I wanted to force her to confess the truth, Salt said, a hectic flush on his cheeks. He managed to sound calm, however, as though this was all just a small and embarrassing disagreement. I shouldn't have done that, but she has herself been deceived. Do you know something about the death of a cabal member? Malik asked Lionel because that would have been a hell of a thing to keep to yourself, no matter what the truth is about your involvement. I did not think I would have to reveal this, certainly not here, Salt said, looking around, annoyed. But you see, I have been working with the Hierophant to catch the murderer of Night Singh, and we have succeeded. Oh, did he catch himself then? Charlie asked, because he's the one who killed Knight on your orders. Be quiet, the Hierophant ground out. Salt turned toward Charlie with a sneer. The Hierophant has served the Cabal faithfully, Salt said. Who are you to question his loyalty, thief? Stephen, what's this about? Bellamy asked, peering at the Hierophant. The name of the human, the one who Charlie was almost sure wasn't in control of the body anymore. It wasn't just the way he spoke, but that he had the wan, sickly appearance of someone whose energy was being consumed. She's a liar, said the Hierophant. Salt looked at Charlie and shook his head sadly. Oh dear, yes, our boy tricked you, didn't he? The deceiver deceived. You're not the first. He turned back to the others, his confidence that he could get away with this growing. Now, perhaps we can do this part in private. I have something to show you. Something I would prefer we kept between the four of us. Vicerain and Malik shared a glance. Malik nodded to Bellamy. Yes, I think so, Vicerain said, with a look at Charlie. I believe you said your name was... Charlie, she said. Charlie Hall. Miss Hall? I promise you that we'll hear your accusations and pass judgment. Malik nodded. Bellamy regarded her with interest. We can be fair. Charlie was certain they could, but less certain they would. Let us adjourn to the library, Salt said, and I will tell you everything. He signaled to a young man in a suit and tie. Get him for me. Bring him in the cuffs. The other glomists watched them leave a few of them stopping one or the other cabal members to ask them a question or make some comment. A few laughed. The Hierophant walked behind them, 
his gaze returning over and over to the book in Charlie's hands. You, Salt said to her under his breath, are nothing more than a piece of gristle between my teeth. She tried to ignore him, tried to ignore the shudder that went through her. He was just picking at stitches, hoping she'd unravel. It was uncomfortable to be back in the library, her gaze going automatically to the small stain on the rug. But only for a moment, because Vince was already there, standing against a shelf, his arms bound to the same onyx restraints that had been hanging on the wall in the hidden hallway. She took in the despair in his gray eyes, his broad shoulders and the muscles beneath them, took in the dark gold of his hair and the angry line of his mouth. Looking at him made her stomach hurt. Shar, he said, you should have gone when you had a chance. She turned her face away, not sure if she was capable of doing what was necessary with him watching. And who is this? Malik asked. That's Edmund, his grandson, Bellamy said, peering at Vince as though trying to convince himself of something. I thought he was dead. Oh, we'll get to that, Salt said. Adeline entered the room in her long black gown and perched on the arm of a chair. Can I get any of you a drink? Charlie, having been drugged once in this room already, shook her head. Vicerain settled herself into a chair opposite Adeline. All right, Lionel. Now, explain yourself. He looked relaxed, pleased. Charlie thought he might even be enjoying himself. I became involved with the Hierophant because we had a common interest. The murderer of Night Singh was also the murderer of my grandson. It stands before you, in his guise. But it isn't him. You're looking at his shadow. That is impossible, said Malik. Are you saying this man is a blight? Asked Bellamy, walking up to Vince. Vince glowered, but made no move to step away. Bellamy reached out a hand. Almost immediately upon touching Vince's upper arm, he pulled back in surprise. He turned toward Vicerain, who said nothing. My grandson had always taken a somewhat unorthodox approach to shadow magic. He treated his shadow like an entirely separate being, one he let make decisions for them both. Eventually, it became independent enough to trick him. Trick him? Bellamy echoed, more intrigued than astonished. Masks were almost exclusively interested in mysteries, which led to lots of academics and even more mad scientists. Charlie had always figured they were a bit of a hodgepodge of the other specialties, and she could see why someone like Vince would be especially intriguing to them. He was deceived into conducting a ritual from the book, one that proved fatal. Charlie interrupted him. That's not true. You're the one that killed Remy. Did it tell you that? Salt asked, making his voice gentle. It used Remy's life and created this shell in which it's hiding. It then absconded with the book and began murdering anyone who knew about it. A rare book dealer, Knight, who'd had access to the Liber Noctum while it was at Sotheby's. And finally, a thief who'd I'd contracted to steal it back. It all sounded reasonable when he said it, and Vince stood there, denying nothing. Charlie could feel her control of the situation slip away. Shadows lie, my dear, Salt went on. If you have a blight stitched to you, it will whisper in your ear, and every glomus knows not to believe everything it says. That is why it is a heavy burden to drape yourself in another's shadow. Charlie glanced at the Hierophant. As much as Salt might be enjoying this, the Hierophant was not. Both of you are claiming to have solved the murder. You're saying that's a blight, and it's responsible for all those murders, Malik said to Salt, then turned to Charlie. While you, for some reason, believe it was Lionel and Stephen. She nodded, glancing at Vince, who still didn't speak. Night's not the first Glomus Lionel Salt killed, either. Salt smiled and stood, pacing the room, clearly believing he'd already won. Allow me to order proof of my version of events. Adeline, my dear, what did Edmund call his shadow? Charlie was dressed in the color. 
red, the scarlet of poppies and cutthroats. Adeline smiled at her. Red. And what was on the walls where Adam Locken, that thief I hired, was killed? He asked Charlie. The word, red, she told them reluctantly. Painted in blood. But it was meant to threaten Vincent, since the Hierophant believed he had the book. Vincent, Bellamy echoed. She means me, Vince said. Adeline startled, and the others seemed surprised too, as though they'd forgotten he could speak. Isn't it more likely that the Blight wished everyone to know who had murdered Adam, and that's why it covered the walls with its name, Salt said. The Hierophant has again, I remind you, shown no inclination toward bloodshed. The fuck he hasn't, Charlie said. Salt's hooded gaze was on her, unrelenting. Now, how close to where Red was living was Paul Echo murdered? A few blocks, but I don't see what this has to do with... And how close to where Red was living was Adam Locken murdered? Charlie sighed, frustrated. He lived in the house where the murder happened, but he'd left. He wasn't there. He hadn't been there in days. And who had he lived with in that house prior to leaving? Me. Charlie admitted. And isn't it likely that you got the book from Red since you've been living with him? Rather than that, you broke through my extensive security. I could show everyone how I did it, Charlie offered sweetly. Yes, said Salt. That brings us to one other thing. Do you think there's a reason he insinuated himself into your life? Something about you he might have wanted? Charlie folded her arms over her chest, looking salt in the face. I don't know. My tits? Maybe my ass? It broke some of the tension in the room. Vicerain snorted. Bellamy smiled. But salt was undeterred. You don't suppose it's because you're a well-known thief? The charlatan, who stopped taking freelance gigs, coincidentally, of course, right around the time she met Red. Charlie took a stuttering breath. It had been one thing for them to know she was a thief. But it was a little different for them to know she was someone they all had some experience with. Although she'd done a job or two for Vice Rain, the others had only experienced her as a cause of misfortune. You've lost them, Charlie Hall. They're never going to believe you now. You should have figured that a billionaire would make a pretty good con artist. Tell us. Did it inform you that it was a living shadow? Salt asked. Or did it give you a false name and a false history, along with its false face? Charlie couldn't help thinking of the fairy tale of the scholar's shadow, playing at love. Of Vince's hungry mouth on hers. Of him cooking her eggs. I know who Vince is, said Charlie. And I know who you are. You poisoned me when I was 15. Your people chased me through the woods. Don't talk to me about false faces. Bellamy raised his eyebrows. Adeline looked over at Vince, as though for confirmation. But it wasn't like Charlie thought any of the cabal would care all that much about something that had happened over a decade ago, to someone who was in a gloom, even if they believed her. But she wanted Salt to know. So, you have a grudge against me, he said smoothly which was ballsy, but clever. Put your worst foot forward. Admit to one bad thing so they think you're honest when you deny another. His attempt to cast the blame on Vince was unnervingly convincing. Salt had strung together enough parts for it to make sense, especially since the proof could cut both ways. And he was rich, which always helped, while Vince was a terrifying monster, even without the question of the murders. The knowledge that she might not be able to turn this thing around ramped her nerves up even higher. Well, Malik asked Vince, did you kill those people? We know you can talk. Vince looked at him expressionlessly. Charlie thought his assessment of the situation might be even more grim than hers. I was Remy's shadow. I would have never hurt him. And I didn't touch Night Sing. Do you have anything else to add, Stephen? Vicerain asked. You have been acting strangely lately. 
I haven't been sleeping well, Stephen said, looking at them. I have a lot of nightmares. Bellamy touched his shoulder, and he flinched. I understand my punishment, Stephen told them. All I want is to be done serving out my sentence. Did you murder a glomist? He shook his head. No, I hunt blights, which is why I've been seeking red. Just red. Halfway through that second sentence, Charlie thought she could tell that something else seemed to be speaking. It was a smooth transition, easy to miss if you hadn't been looking for it. What made you so interested in the Liber Noctum? Viserain asked. The Hierophant shrugged. Lionel promised that I could read it, to help with my work. How long had this blight been bound to a series of fuck-ups and ne'er-do-wells, forced to hunt its own kind? Charlie would have felt sympathetic if she thought it was interested in something other than killing her. Salt cleared his throat. Red is a deceiver. A thing formed of envy and corruption and hatred that my grandson sought to slough off. It has poured honey in this poor girl's ears. Let us end this ridiculous conversation and go back to the party. I will keep the blight restrained, and you can determine what to do with him tomorrow or the next day. Wait, Charlie said. I can prove I got the book from his safe. I can show you where it is and I can open it. I'm not sure that's... Malik began. I offered before, Charlie interrupted, and he barely even acknowledged it. Right now, I am the only one with any proof. I have the Liber Noctum. Which could prove your point as well as mine, said Salt. And you forget, I have read. Let me show you, Charlie said. Please. Viserain glanced at Salt. Is it possible? Absolutely not he said with a small smile. My security is impenetrable. She has that book because the Blight stole it. Bellamy raised his eyebrows. Then why not? A small demonstration and we can go back to the party. Charlie's hands were sweating as she nodded to all of them. She set down the Liber Noctum on a table near where the higher fence stood and ignored the way he moved automatically toward it. Very well, Salt said. Go ahead, thief. She walked to where Dante's Inferno sat and pulled it. One of the bookshelves swung open. Interesting, said Bicerain. Yes, said Salt. I rather like that little room. Charlie went to the painting and pushed it so that the safe was revealed. Then she went to work. She already knew the codes, but she needed to make something of a show of the first part. So she found the notches all over again for them. It was dramatic, and bought a little time. She could see they were impressed when the handle went down halfway. What are we going to find inside? asked Malik. Gold, gems, the usual, Charlie said. Salt just smiled. He'd taken a few steps back from the others, one hand going to the inside pocket of his coat. When it came to the digital part, Charlie keyed in the code carefully. She looked back at the cabal, at Vince took a deep breath, and turned the lever. The alarm went off, filling the room with a sound like a siren. Salt punched in another code, and the sound stopped. You did that, she accused him. He shook his head, eyes lit with the satisfaction of winning. Don't be ridiculous. You failed, that's all. Okay, so open the safe, Charlie said, her heart speeding, a blur of hummingbird wings in her chest. Prove you didn't. Very well. I will indulge you one last time, he said, enjoying the moment enough to draw it out. He punched in what she could see were the same set of numbers that she'd used. The lever turned, and the door to the safe swung open. His phone. He'd slipped it out while she was working and activated the alarm as she finished. While she'd been showing off, he'd been finding a way to stop her. We're sorry for doubting you, Malik said to Salt. But you understand we had to. Wait, Vicerain said, reaching past him. I know that book. And from the safe, she took out Night Singh's notebook, papers detailing Salt's crimes in his own hand, shoved hastily back into the leather cover. 
edges sticking out, right where Charlie had left it when she'd taken the Lieber Noctum. I, Salt began, but no words came. Charlie had known the way to trap Salt since the day she'd spent with him. She'd thought it then, idly, not realizing how much it would matter. Let him dominate. Let him win. He'd be so certain he belonged on top that he'd never guess he was being drawn into a trap. He'd honestly believe that she gave him all that time while she futzed around with the first lock for no goddamn reason. He'd honestly believe that she could crack a safe but not be able to guess he had a security app on his phone. Miss Hall must have put it there, whatever it is, Salt said finally, recovering enough to realize he had to pin the appearance of Knight's book on someone else immediately. Lionel Salt was a planner. Charlie was sure he'd planned for being confronted with any number of his crimes. He'd be able to explain lots of true things. But no one can plan for planted evidence. I thought that I couldn't get into your safe, Charlie reminded him. Isn't that what you were trying to prove? Which is it? Did you hide the Lieber Noctum in there, and I stole it while putting something else in your safe? Or did I lie about the Lieber Noctum? And you're lying now. Lionel Salt cut his gaze toward the Hierophant. Admitting to the first was less damning, but it meant admitting he'd been stringing along a very old and powerful blight. Vicerain was opening the papers stuffed into the top of Knight's book, smoothing them out. Charlie wasn't sure that Salt knew what they were, but she could tell by the way Vice Rain's expression shifted that she realized who'd written them. Malik frowned. I think it's time the Cabal spoke with you and Stephen separately, Lionel. Salt reached into his pocket and took out his matte black gun, pointing it directly at Charlie. You have made a very bad mistake crossing me, charlatan. Charlie froze. Vice Rain's shadow cat roared as three shadows spread from Malik, their mouths full of teeth. Bellamy drew a sword of shadow. Lionel, Malik said. There's no need for this. Behind Salt, Vince lifted his wrists and the cuffs came away, falling to the ground. He stepped forward with inhuman swiftness, pressing the point of a letter opener to Salt's throat. Adeline made a sharp sound that was almost a scream. The sounds of the party seemed very far away. You said I was a creature of hate, Vince spoke in a salt's ear. And I do hate you. For Remy, whose blood is my blood, whose flesh is my flesh, and whose hate is my hate. For Char, who will survive tonight. Aim that gun somewhere else, or I will hurt you, and go on hurting you until there is nothing but pain. You can't. Salt began, voice trembling. I'm sorry, Char. Vince wore a small, sad smile. It was always going to happen like this. I knew he'd let me get close to him, and it'd give me a chance. When they found Vince waiting in the library, alone, Charlie should have realized something was off. Should have seen what the disappearance of the man in the suit meant. Should have realized what Vince had been making in the hotel room. Faux onyx tiles ones that made him seem safely cuffed when he was entirely able to pull his hands free. He had known that, Charlie or not, Salt was going to show him off to the cabal, and then he'd planned to slip his cuffs and kill Salt before anyone would be able to stop him. And after that? Vince pressed the knife point harder, and a bead of blood trickled down Salt's throat like the track of a single tear. He made a choking sound, and his arm sagged, although he didn't drop his glock. Still, it wasn't pointed right at her face. Charlie let herself breathe. Drop the gun on the rug, Lionel, Vice Rain said. The blight will remove the knife, won't you? Will I? Vince asked lightly. I didn't come here planning on leaving. Lionel Salt's face had paled and his eyes darted around. How odd the moment must be for him. Malhar, had called shadows ghosts of the living. But Vince was the shadow of a dead man. Vince, who was almost Salt's grandson. Who was that grandson's avenging specter. You're going to leave, Charlie told Vince, with me. Plans change. 
The Cabal knows what he's done. Surely they're not going to ignore the murder of one of their own. Vince lifted the point of the knife infinitesimally away from Salt's artery. I have done nothing! Salt's words came to an abrupt stop as the Hierophant stepped between him and Charlie. His back was to Salt, and his eyes blazed. The blight, looking down at her through Stephen's eyes, was ancient and wrathful. He held the Liber Noctum in his arms. Tell me, he said. Tell me about this book. Tell me about his lies. Charlie cleared her throat. Vince could probably answer this better. You, the Blight said. She nodded. Okay. When Remy died, he pushed all his energy, his last breath of life, into his shadow. That's how Red became able to pass for human. She looked directly at the Hierophant, not allowing herself to flinch. The ritual? The one that was supposed to have made Red like this? It doesn't exist. It's not in the Liber Noctum. It's not anywhere. That was a thing I couldn't figure at first. Why would Mr. Salt tell me to find a book when it was locked away in a safe? She sucked in a breath and let it out slowly, forcing herself to pause for dramatic effect. Because he'd promised you something he could never give. The Hierophant's fingers closed over the metal, pressing hard enough to bend the edge. He convinced you to compromise yourself for him, Charlie said. And you know that young man you've been possessing isn't doing well. There's not much more energy there to take. Killing Night Singh was for nothing. Killing Paul Echo was for nothing. Killing Adam Locken was for nothing. Salt laughed, although it sounded forced. Is that what this is about? Of course I know how Red became the way he is now. It's all in the Book of Blights. It was hard to argue convincingly with a frail old man with a knife to his throat. She decided to ignore him. Red was already pretty solid because Remy had put so much of his own energy into him and then cut him loose for short periods of time, over years. He started to appear like Remy and to hold that shape. Isn't that right, Adeline? She gasped in surprise, as though Charlie had asked her something awful. You murdered your own grandson? Vicerain asked. And Knight? You lied to me! The words boomed out of Stephen's mouth, but the voice was nothing like his. Deceiver! I will strip the flesh from your bones! I will... The sound of the gun going off cracked through the air. The Hierophant fell on the rug, blood seeping from the wound, fingers clutching at it, mouth opening. And behind the body, the shadow of the Hierophant rose larger and larger. Breath of life, it said. The shadow swept over the body it had worn. Stephen gave a wordless howl as he withered his skin shrinking in on itself, his body curling and then going limp. The blood around the bullet hole was dry, crystallized. The shadow towered over them, crackling with fresh energy. Oh, God, Vicerain said. Oh, shit. Salt ducked away from Vince's hand, bringing his hand up to touch the shallow cut at his throat. The blight looked down at them, growing, so that the library lights dimmed as shadow covered them. If no one will give me flesh, then I will take it. We have to contain it, said Malik. I have weapons, Salt said. Devices. Down through that corridor. But there wasn't time. The Hierophant lunged. Vicerain's shadow cat leapt to meet him, claws raking, but the blight only struck it aside. Bellamy stepped forward holding up his shadow sword. The Hierophant grabbed hold, and the blade turned to smoke. Charlie grabbed Vince's arm. He looked at her, the way he had that night out in the cold, when he hadn't seemed to believe she would still touch him. Come on, she said. We have to go now. He shook his head. I serve no longer! The Hierophant threatened in a voice that was the rush of wind in the sky, the echo of an empty room not human in the least. 
I was made from your kind, but I am greater than you now. I will take all that I want, and you will serve me. Bellamy rushed down the hall toward the great room, calling a warning as he drew a dagger of shadow from his coat. Malik's shadow triplets circled his body, preparing for an attack. No more hiding. Vince took her hand. His body started to blur at the edges. It was his eyes that went first, from hollow to empty to smoke. Then the gold of his hair, like sparks flying off a bonfire. Darkness licked at his body, as though threatening to devour him. Vince! Charlie shouted. The Hierophant's voice moved through the room like the howls of wind through trees. All of you who bound me, who tied me to your weak wills and mewing ambitions, know me. I am Cleophes, and I will paint the... Vince lunged into him. They crashed together down the hall, shadows on the walls, but where they hit, drywall shattered, plaster rained down. A painting was knocked loose, falling and cracking its frame. The Hierophant's hands became long claws, each one coming to a thin point. Its mouth opened wide, full of sharp teeth. It ran for the great room, Vince's shadow chasing after it. Charlie moved to follow when she felt cold metal against the back of her head. A gun. Turn around, said Salt. She did. In all the commotion, no one remembered the Glock. At point-blank range, there wasn't much she could do if he shot her, but he basked in the satisfaction of having her for a moment too long. Charlie knocked his arm sideways. The shot went off, hitting the bookshelves and taking off a chunk of wooden trim. He swung the gun at her head as though he was going to bludgeon her with it. She grabbed his wrist and bit down on it as hard as she could. Howling in pain, Salt dropped the gun. She kicked it with her foot, sending it skittering across the floor. You're nothing, he told her. A smudge, a blotch on the universe. And no blotch is going to be my downfall. He punched her in the head with his other hand. She staggered, dizzily back, and he hit her again. He was an old man, but he was strong and used to hurting people. I should have killed you when I had the chance, he told her. Oh, absolutely, Charlie said, because you're not going to kill me now. He grabbed hold of a poker by the fireplace and swung it toward her. Charlie ducked and grabbed for another tool from the stand. This one was disappointingly tipped with a metal dustpan, but she brought it up anyway, knocking back another attack. The metal clanged together, and she felt it all the way up her arm. Charlie's sole experience in this kind of fighting was playing with Posey in the lot by their old apartment, swinging sticks at one another. Unfortunately, that was the level of sucking she was bringing to this fight now. She needed to hit him hard enough that he'd go down and not get up. She knew it, and yet part of her was horrified at the thought. She hated Salt. She would have been glad if he were dead. But actually making him dead was another thing. He swung the poker at her leg. She jumped out of the way. He was an old man. Surely he'd tire out fast, wouldn't he? But the wild-eyed glee in his face made her think otherwise. He wanted to see her sprawled on the rug wanted to crack her skull open, would be delighted to see her bleed. He whipped his poker toward her head as something grabbed for her hands. She threw herself to one side so that the poker skimmed over the side of her hip without really connecting. She hit the rug. His goddamn shadow, that's what had grabbed for her. She wasn't fighting just him, but his shadow as well. On the ground, Charlie rolled over and scrabbled for the gun. She whipped it up toward him finger on the trigger. He stopped, his shadow drifting toward her like a cobra, moving back and forth on the wall above her. Charlie got up, keeping the gun trained on him. Stay where you are. You're not going to shoot me, he scoffed. With her free hand, Charlie pulled the onyx knife out of her bra. She removed the duct tape sheath by biting down on it and yanking. Salt looked amused. What are you planning on doing with that? That shadow of yours. It's not exactly yours, is it? It belonged to a Glomus before you. A good one, I bet. 
you wouldn't want anything less than excellence. So what? He said. She squatted down, keeping the gun on him. So? I bet it hates you. And with one long slash of the dagger, his shadow slipped free. Salt backed up so quickly that he tripped. On the ground, the shadow had formed a puddle on the floor, like an oil slick, and from the center something was starting to rise. Guess you were right about me not shooting you, she said, and left the library. Charlie got to the great room in time to see Vince and the Hierophant clash. Figures splashed on the wall, huge as titans. Someone had thrown open the doors to the garden, and cold air blew through the room, sending the curtains dancing. I have lived two hundred years, the Hierophant howled in his voice that wasn't a voice. And I will live thousands more. Screams were all around Charlie. People were rushing from the room, bumping into her or drawing weapons of onyx. One glomist flew up on wings of shadow, holding out a glistening black blade. The Hierophant tore the shadow from her back, sending her spiraling down onto a coffee table. A flurry of onyx arrows flew toward the blights. The shafts sunk into both figures. Vince contorted in pain and surprise before the shafts fell from both, scattering on the floor. One archer ran to retrieve them while others cocked back more arrows. I didn't come here planning on leaving. Vince wasn't going to survive this fight. She'd seen the way those teeth and claws and arrows sank into his body, the way his movement slowed and took on a staggering, drunken quality. The Hierophant reached out his hands, and the nails of his fingers tore long lines into the wall along both sides of the room. Stop fighting me, Red! Together, we can become more powerful than any Blights since the massacre! We will be like the Blights of old and devour the very edges of the world! Viserain used long black daggers to guide Glomists out onto the lawn. Malik stood in the gallery on the second story, some glittering cloth in his hands. Two other Glomists were with him. Adeline stepped into the mouth of the hall, near where Charlie stood. Her fingers were flecked with blood. Vince was fighting to a purpose, Charlie realized, steering the Hierophant backward. He might get in a hard, staggering blow, might slice Vince's chest with those nails. But Vince kept pushing, kept making the Hierophant give ground. Too late, she realized what he was about to do. With unsteady hands, Charlie stripped off her triple onyx ring, the one that looked like fancy brass knuckles. She put it back on, the onyx facing the inside of her palm. Then she ran for the fireplace. Because that's what Vince had been backing the Hierophant toward. Vince who maintained his position even when it meant absorbing hits instead of dodging them. Charlie felt the brush of electric air as the shadows moved above her. Vince threw himself at the Hierophant. She saw the Blight's nails sink into Vince's side. And then Vince rolled them both toward the fire, where he was going to immolate the Hierophant even if it meant feeding himself to the flames. Charlie only had time to lurch toward them, reaching out and grabbing his indistinct shape. She held on, the onyx forcing Vince solid in her hands, making him collapse on top of her as the Hierophant gave a furious scream. The flames leapt up, so high that they set the bottom of Salt's painting on fire. Malik and his assistants dropped a netting of jet beads moments later, catching Vince and Charlie inside. 33. Thief of Night No one would let Charlie talk to him. Viserain brought her to the dining room, and two people from Carapace held her there. Someone gave her a drink from Salt's fancy liquor cabinet. It was probably the most expensive whiskey she'd ever drink, and she couldn't taste it. They would have taken her back to the library, except they'd found Salt's body there, letter opener buried in his chest. And so Charlie sat, angry, adrenaline still racing through her veins. She stared at the polished wood of the antique sideboard at the ridiculously ornate silver apern resting on top, and the hideous oil painting of a bowl of severed heads. Her eye went to the heavy silk drapes with tasseled gimp trim, down to a hand-knotted silk rug that had to be at least a hundred years old. Someone had tracked ash onto it. The world was going to be better without Lionel Salt in it. 
she looked down at her red suit, the leg of which had been smeared with soot. Possibly, she was the one who tracked Ash onto the rug. You were right, Vicerain told her, pouring a highball glass of scotch for herself. About salt. About all of it, I suppose. I am sure you wanted someone to say that, so let me start there. Great, Charlie said, starting to stand. So let me talk to Vince. A gloom stepped toward her, expression grim, and she sat back down with a sigh. An unhappy smile came to Vice Rain's lips. We must contemplate our options when it comes to your blight. We've never seen one that could pass for human. Vince almost destroyed himself saving you, she reminded Vice Rain. We know, truly. But you must accept that we're going to have to speak with him and come to a decision about how to proceed. Vice Rain gave a heavy sigh. He's too dangerous to ignore. And who knows how many more like him are out there. Go home, Charlie Hall. I'm not leaving unless you let me talk to him, Charlie insisted. Eventually, Bellamy and Malik came into the room, appearing exhausted. Bellamy had a slash in his coat that she thought must have come from Shadow Claws. I can show you where Salt's secret dungeon is, Charlie offered, then raised an eyebrow. I can actually open his safe. Although your offer is appreciated, we can handle it from here, said Malik. You have my word. We won't hurt Red. We owe you both a debt. Charlie raised her eyebrows, not feeling particularly trusting. Wow, your word. That and a dollar won't even buy me a decent cup of coffee. Malik scowled at her. He's too fascinating for me to let anyone touch a hair on his head, Bellamy said, which she actually believed. You can come see him at my place in three days' time. How about that? She glanced between the others, expecting to see some conflict about where he was going to be held. But there was none. Either they'd decided this before, or no one else wanted him. Okay, Charlie finally said, having run out of other options. Fine. Three days. On her way out of Salt's mansion, she pocketed an antique ink pot and shoved a pair of solid silver candlesticks up her sleeve. Posey was waiting for her in the station wagon, dozing in the driver's seat. When Charlie got in, she jumped up in alarm. Then, seeing it was only her sister, she yawned. Where's Vince? Posey asked, squinting at the black, star-spattered sky, as though she could tell time by it. How long were you in there? Charlie shook her head. Drive, I'll explain. We have one stop before we go home. Do you remember Tina? After their detour, Posey took them back to their rental house, even though it was still taped off as a crime scene. Charlie crawled through the window to her bedroom, showered in her own bathroom, and slept on her own mattress. Her sister slept beside her. Charlie's shadow curled around them both. When she woke, the scent of bleach in her nose. She realized the sheets still smelled like Vince. She held her hands up in the air, long fingers, black nail polish already chipped, clever hands, capable of picking a lock and opening a safe. She thought of reaching out for her shadow, grabbing Vince. If she hadn't guessed what he was going to do, if she hadn't gotten there in time, the momentum would have taken him into the fire there wouldn't even have been a body. The thought made her feel hollowed out as she went through the motions of taking a shower. Part of her felt trapped in that upside-down world where he was already gone. Her gaze fell on the wall tiles, staring at the nothing that was where her shadow ought to be. The absence hadn't just shut a door inside her mind. It shut a door on a potential future. She wasn't going to be a glomist. She hadn't been sure she wanted to be. But still... Would Vicerain and the rest of them have listened to her more if she'd had a quickened shadow? Would they have let her see Vince? She'd been so certain he'd want to come home with her, but after thinking about it, maybe she shouldn't have been. When he met her, he wasn't used to being alone in the world and had limited options. Maybe he hadn't seen a future for himself past the end of Salt, but now he was in that future and, for perhaps the first time, could shape it as he wished. If the cabal let him, of course. 
She wondered what he thought of the swing for the fences and damn the consequences Charlie Hall that he'd never met before. Maybe they both had been holding themselves back when the other person had been capable of rising to the challenge. When the other person might have been thrilled by the challenge. After she was clean and dressed in her own clothes, she waited for Posey. Mom sent me like 17 messages about bringing back the station wagon, her sister said, emerging from her bedroom in fresh clothes. Charlie glanced behind Posey, at her shadow. Her sister followed her gaze, her brow furrowed with worry. Is it weird? I don't know. Is it weird for you? Charlie asked. Posey moved her lips silently, and the shadow swept around her, curling over her shoulders, looking for all the world as though it preferred to be there. Charlie couldn't help a shiver that was part recognition. It's the most perfect thing that's ever happened. You won't believe all the things I'll teach myself to do. Posey's eyes were bright in a way they hadn't been in a long time, and that Charlie didn't want anything to dim. She headed to the window and jammed it open. Well, come on. If Mom and Bob are desperate to get the station wagon back, we better get out of here, since I want to stop for coffee first, she said. Thank all the gods, Posey said fervently. They stopped at Small Oven Bakery, where Charlie got three espressos in tiny paper cups and lined them up in front of her like shots. Posey poked at a sticky bun while looking at her phone. Charlie took the first of the espressos and downed it. Um, Posey said, and turned the phone toward her sister. Early this morning, the Gazette received pages from a journal alleged to be written by Lionel Salt implicating him in several open investigations, including that of Rose Aliband. Aliband's body was found in a burnt-out car along with the body of Salt's grandson, Edmund Carver, over a year ago. Both may have been Salt's victims. Other cases are likely to be reopened based on information in the pages, including Randall Grigoris, Ankita Esweron, and Hector Blanco. Not only does the journal include detailed accounts of their deaths, but drawings of medical experiments conducted on their shadows. Handwriting examiners were able to confirm with 98% confidence that the writing in the journal was consistent with samples of Salt's handwriting that the Gazette had obtained. We reached out to Salt's representatives for comment, but we haven't heard back at this time. You did this to Lionel Salt? Posey said, astonished. How? When Charlie had opened the safe, she'd only been expecting to find the Libra Noctum, but there had been something else in there too. A notebook, from which a few pages had been torn out. It couldn't be too often that the Hampshire Gazette got a scoop like that. Charlie took her second shot of espresso, and then the third. I didn't do it to him. He did it to himself. That Sunday, Charlie showed up for her shift at Rapture. Her mind wasn't in it, though, and she kept having to ask people to repeat their drink orders. She dropped two wine glasses and set an entire highball of absinthe on fire, instead of just the sugar cube. That glass broke, too, and in a much more dramatic way. Partway through her shift, Odette pulled her aside. She thought it was going to be to scold her or ask her about a missing red pantsuit, but instead, it was to introduce her to the new bartender, the one taking Jose's ex's shifts. Charlie was surprised to see Don. Hey, he said. Top Hat got a new manager, and I decided I could use a change of scenery. Well, this place is that, Charlie told him, and proceeded to walk him through what things were put where, how to use the register, and how many dry ice pellets to float on a drink. They swallow it, we get a lawsuit, she told him. Maybe we shouldn't have it on the menu, Don suggested. It's going to take you a minute to get the vibe of this place, Charlie predicted. Around closing time, Balthazar came to the bar. Pour us a last drink, whatever you're having, he told her. Oh, I'm drinking too, she smiled. If I were you, I would be. She couldn't argue with that. Took down the brand new Lefroy 15, opened it, and poured them both two fingers. So, your guy, he said. Charlie nodded. I guess you heard. Quite a thing. Does this mean you're back in business? He asked. She shrugged. After the spectacle I made of myself, I should probably lay low for a while. Oh, I don't know. The charlatan's reputation is at an all-time high, he said, taking a sip of his drink and then wincing. Ugh, 
This tastes like someone poured gasoline over a tire, set it on fire, and then put the fire out with dirt. Odette made her way over and sat down next to Balthazar. Having some cocktails, are we? Well, don't leave me out. You can have mine, Balthazar said, passing his drink over. Please. Odette accepted it without complaint. Charlie poured Balthazar amaretto instead, which he took gratefully. You see the news? He asked Odette. About Lionel? Odette made a disgusted sound. The funny thing is that I always knew he was a sadist and a bit of a narcissist. But interesting, and I thought, self-aware. You can know who someone is and still have no idea how far they will go. I thought I understood his limits. And now I have to ask myself if it was because I didn't want the discomfort of realizing he had none. Charlie took a sip of her drink and wondered about her own limits. Now they're saying he might be responsible for the death of Fiona's sweet boy. Edmund Carver, Balthazar said, enunciating each syllable, his gaze going to Charlie. I thought his mother's name was Kiara, Charlie said. Odette nodded. Yes, I'm referring to Salt's first wife. That's how he and I met, through Fiona. Poor old thing. First losing her daughter, then her grandson, and now this. All within the span of two years. How is it that you know absolutely everyone? Balthazar asked. Ah, oh, but do I know any of them well? Odette looked into the mirror, as though studying her own face. Balthazar sat up straighter. Well, let me distract us from this increasingly morbid conversation with a bit of news. Do either of you know Murray, of Murray's fine jewelry? Sure, Charlie said, thinking of the silver ink pot and candlesticks she needed to sell. Why? He closed the pawn shop, Balthazar said, raising his eyebrows. Struck it rich. Retiring to Boca, apparently. Odette gave a delicate little snort. You make it sound as though he dug up a pot of gold in his backyard. Practically, Balthazar agreed. Rumor has it he won it all with one lucky bet at the racetrack. Huh, Charlie said. Imagine that. The three-day wait to see Vince was awful. Charlie's mind kept darting back and forth between scenarios. What if the cabal lied and hurt him after all? What if they wanted to experiment on him? What if they decided his existence was too big of a risk? What if they wouldn't let her see him after all? Her mind would careen along one path and then another, making imaginary moves and counter moves, a chess game played against herself to no purpose except indulging her anxiety, a snake eating its own tail and then choking on it. At least by then, she and Posey were back in their house. Winnie from Vince's work had been the tech hired to get rid of the bloodstains. She'd messaged Charlie to say that she'd done an extra thorough job on account of her friendship with Vince. She'd also given Charlie a whole bunch of information she never wanted about the weirdest places she'd found bits of Adam. For her part, Posey had spent the last few days with Malhar. She claimed that she was just doing some tests, now that she'd agreed to join his study. But Charlie thought there were too many meals involved for that to be strictly true. But it did mean Charlie was left with a lot of nervous energy and no one to snap at as she got ready, pulling on black jeggings, boots, and a sweater without any holes in it. The pants were stretchy enough that if she needed to do some quick moves, they could accommodate. And the boots were heavy enough to hurt if someone needed to get kicked in the head. Charlie's Corolla was in the shop, but she'd managed to locate Vince's van two blocks from the East Star Motel. She found keys behind the sun visor on the driver's side. Shoving two parking tickets into the glove compartment, she'd taken it home. That's what she drove over to Bellamy's stronghold. True to his mysterious nature, he'd taken over a watchtower in Holyoke. It was accessible only by trail and appeared abandoned from the outside. The front door was rotted along the bottom, its hinges thick with rust. Charlie knocked, hard. A few moments later, it creaked open, revealing a girl with a shaved head and thick black makeup around her eyes. One magnetic eyelash hung slightly askew. A new piercing on her cheek appeared red and infected. Her shadow swirled around her like a snake ready to strike. Probably some kind of apprentice. I'm here to see Vince, Charlie said. Who? The girl asked. 
If Bellamy and the others thought they were going to blow Charlie off, she was going to make every single one of them sorry. The blight. Oh, the girl said. Right. Come in. They're expecting you. The inside had the appearance of a castle or a tomb. The girl led her through chambers of bare concrete walls, occasionally marked with graffiti, and up a flight of stairs, to a room hung with brocade curtains. Thin red taper candles burned in silver skull Halloween candelabras. The cold cement floor was piled with cushions. Lounging on a red velvet beanbag was Bellamy. Charlie looked around warily. Where is he? We're holding him in a room at the top of the tower, like a princess waiting for rescue, Bellamy said. Unharmed. He's leaving today, Charlie told him. With me. Bellamy took a sip from a delicate cup, thin enough to be translucent. Bone china. Go and speak with your blight. Up the stairs, up, up, up. We'll talk again after. Charlie didn't like the sound of that, but in her eagerness to see Vince, she let it go. She started back toward the stairs and was stopped by a woman's voice. Miss Hall, Adeline Salt said. She sat on a slightly ripped couch in a room full of locked metal cases of books. She had on dark wash jeans and an emerald colored blouse that tied in a bow underneath her throat. Balanced on her thighs was a computer, its case rose gold. She had that strangely burnished look that wealthy people have, hair extra smooth and skin extra glowing. She couldn't have looked more out of place. Charlie leaned against the opening, not quite entering the room. You've come to see Red, is that right? Oh, good. I'm sure he will like that. He was asking for you. Adeline's smile was completely disingenuous. Vince, Charlie said. It was interesting to see Adeline trying to decide whether to argue over his name. It obviously bothered her, not that Charlie called him something else, but Charlie acting as though the name he went by with her was his real one. Well, it was what he called himself. I've spoken to the cabal. He's going to come home with me. I'm going to be his guardian, and he'll be able to pick up where Edmund's life ended. Oddly, there seemed to be a flicker of fear in her eyes. How exactly is he going to do that? Charlie asked. I've already begun the process of voiding the death certificate. Adeline smiled again, stiffly. You understand that's for the best, don't you? Red will be very wealthy, and he'll only be bound to me for a few years. The idea that Adeline might be considered a guardian for Vince, when by all rights she should be the one punished, was enraging. The possessive tone in her voice made it worse and a whole lot creepier. Maybe that's not what he wants. Adeline tossed back her hair. You think he'd rather be skulking around with a thief? I think he'd rather do almost anything that live in your father's house, Charlie said. You didn't hear? One perfectly manicured eyebrow arched. My father died that night after being left alone with you. Stabbed 33 times with a letter opener. Tragic, Charlie said archly. She had heard. What did you do to him in there? Adeline asked silkily. I took his gun away and cut off his shadow. Charlie told her. Whatever happened after that, I wasn't there for it. Convenient, Adeline sneered. I'd agree. Charlie looked at Adeline's laptop, at the green leather Chanel shopper she'd carried it in at the diamond studs in her ears. You're his only heir, aren't you? Adeline's hand went to her hair, nervously catching a strand of it between her fingers. Don't try to implicate me in your crime, she said stiffly. Your guilt is your own to wrestle with. In the great room, Charlie said. I was pretty distracted when you came in. The funny thing is that I still noticed you had blood on your hands. Charlie started toward the hall then looked back over her shoulder. By the way, you're welcome. Charlie tried to walk calmly up the concrete steps, but when she hit the second landing, she found herself walking faster and faster until she was practically running. At the very top, she found a door, banded in onyx and locked with a bar. Charlie lifted it, surprised by the weight. Vince stood in the small, windowless room with his back to her. He appeared much the same as he always had been, 
same broad shoulders, same height, same everything. But when he turned, his eyes were empty sockets, filled only with smoke. It made her think of his body as a shell, with some swirling creature living inside. Charlie thought of the tarot cards she'd pulled from Posey's deck. The conversion of the spiritual into material. The magician. When his eyes closed, she noticed that for his hair had darkened to bronze, as though the gold had blown off when he changed. He was dressed in a black button-up, and his pants were some kind of performance material that looked expensive. Remy's clothes. Charlie felt turned inside out by the closeness of him, like the man in that story he told at Barb's party, like a sock. All her vulnerable parts seemed to be showing. The slightest touch might hurt. I didn't go quite back together the way I was, did I? Vince asked her. Charlie realized that she'd stopped, going no farther into the room than that first step. No wonder he didn't look happy. He had to think she was afraid. And she was afraid, but only a little. She made herself walk toward him. The fool, walking off a cliff. I like it. It's weird. That small surprised lift of the corner of his lip, as though he'd forgotten he could smile, was familiar enough for her to actually relax. The longer she looked, the less she minded the strangeness of his eyes. Why did you do it? Lie to you? He asked. Hide what I was? No, Charlie sighed, sitting on the arm of one of the patterned brocade sofas. Why fight the Hierophant? You almost died for nothing. None of these fuckers care about you. His smile widened. That is not a question anyone asked me since I got here. And they've asked a lot. Well, I don't think they're focused on your well-being. You don't say. Vince waved her toward one of the chairs, and she took in the rest of the room for the first time. There were two chairs, a mattress on the floor, sheets, and a small rug. No books, no heavy things, no sharp things. A single bright bulb burned above them. Vince had a cuff around his leg, studded with actual onyx and attached to a metal plate in the floor. It was possible that the onyx was keeping him solid. Charlie wasn't sure. She really wished she'd read a lot more of the books that she'd stolen. She sat, a small puff of dust going up when she did. Look, I'm kind of tense, he said. So could you just break it to me? I know you've got some feelings about me being a shadow. I've been trying not to think about it too much, Charlie told him. He looked at her incredulously. How's that working? I figured I could think about it when we got out of here. And maybe, Charlie said hopefully, we could even have a big fight about it. With screaming and throwing things. And I could tell you how stupid you were for thinking I was having an affair with Adam. After you described his murder, I figured that out for myself. You seemed pretty upset about the couch. He laughed before he could stop himself, his hand going to cover his mouth. I'm so sorry. It's not funny. It's a little bit funny, she admitted. He looked down at her with eyes that bled smoke. So what else do we have to fight about? She averted her gaze. When did you figure it out, that I was the girl you let out of Salt's house? In the bar, he admitted. That first night. And what? You wanted to screw around with someone you'd saved? There. Now that was what an argument was supposed to sound like. Maybe. No. I don't know. He either didn't notice the opportunity to squabble, or squandered it. I like you, Char. I always liked you. I should have said something, but I'm not a good person. I'm not even sure I'm a person at all. Oh. Surprised, Charlie took his hand and folded her fingers through his. They were surprisingly solid. You're a person. You're my person. He bent down and bring their clasped hands to his lips. That's when Charlie started to panic. Because they just had an abbreviated version of the argument. Okay, it had been more of a conversation she'd been anticipating having when they got home. And the only reason for Vince to have it while imprisoned in Bellamy's tower was that he wasn't going home with Charlie. He was planning on leaving with Adeline, like she'd said. 
he was going to take up the mantle of Edmund Vincent Carver, as though nothing had ever happened. Get his old life back. Be the first blight to hold a charity ball. So what happens now? Charlie asked, because she had to hear him say it. With us. There was something in the set of his jaw that made her think of how she described him to Adeline, as a lake that was still on the surface, with a whole drowned town inside. I killed the Hierophant. The Cabal needs a new Hierophant. No. Fuck no. Charlie threw herself out of the chair. She paced the room trying to get her thoughts under control. You can't let them do that to you. Not after everything you've done for them. It's not any worse of a job than cleaning up dead bodies in hotel rooms. His voice sounded calm, but his fingers were curled inward as though he was about to fist them. I thought Adeline was going to be some kind of guardian or something, she said, frowning. He nodded. That's one way of looking at it, but I'll still be hunting blights. She scowled. You can't agree to this. How long before you don't just hate what's happened to you, but hate the person to whom you're bound? His gaze dropped from Charlie's. I hate her already. Oh. Now she understood Adeline's mealy-mouthed innuendo. And she understood exactly how bound Vince was going to be. They'd be tethered together. She'd be wearing him. That's why you and I need to be apart for a while he told her. I will never stop feeling the way I do about you, Char. But I won't be the same. Someone will be trying to control me. She remembered him talking in his sleep. Adeline, Adeline, don't. The thought made Charlie's skin crawl. I can get you out of the cuff. We can run for it. He shook his head. If we did, they wouldn't be hunting just me. I don't care. Charlie told him. He put his hand to her cheek. They told me that I need to prove I'm trustworthy. And that once I do, I won't need to be tethered. I'll get out of this. I'll find a way for us to be together. Oh, they were going to find a way out of this, all right. And they're going to do it today? Of course they were. That was why Adeline had been there. They were going to stitch him on as soon as Charlie departed. Vince turned away, so that she couldn't see much of his face, but he looked resigned, and she was making it harder. Today, yes, I've already agreed. She could tell that he hated that she was making it harder. Tell me one thing, she said. If you could, would you choose me? Over anything, he said. Okay, she said, finally. I think this is a bad decision, but I've made lots of those. This was what he'd learned from being Remy's shadow. If there was a problem, he was supposed to throw himself at it. He was supposed to let himself get captured so he could try to kill an ancient blight. Was supposed to give up his freedom to make sure the cabal wouldn't feel threatened. If there was a terrible task, he was the one who was supposed to do it. If there was a difficult emotion, he was the one who was supposed to feel it. His golden lashes caught the light as they swept down over his cheek, hiding the smoke of his eyes. Sometimes there are no good decisions. And wasn't that just the truth? If I can't talk you out of it, then how about I distract you? I bet we've got a couple of minutes before they kick me out. His eyebrows went up, clearly astonished. Maybe he thought she'd have a problem with his smoke-filled eyes, or the fact that he was a blight. Or maybe he thought that no one was crazy enough to want to screw around in a cold, concrete room with someone whose ankle was cuffed to the floor. Well, welcome to the absolute mess that was Charlie Hall. She reached up and dragged his mouth to hers. For a moment, he went utterly still, and she wondered if he was going to push her away. Shame heated her cheeks. Then he kissed her as though he had never thought to do so again, hands cradling the back of her head fingers in her hair. For a moment, there was only the sensation of lips and teeth and tongue, of skin, and the scent of him that wasn't masked by bleach or soap, like a charge of electricity in the air. And when he pressed her back against the wall like he had outside the bar that first night, she grinned up at him. Charlie Hall, he whispered into her hair. 
There will never be anyone like you, for which we can all be grateful, she whispered back, regretting wearing the stretchy pants, which were hell to get off. The hard part was walking out of the room, but she did, stomping down the hall, waiting for him to call her back to tell her that he'd made a huge mistake and they should run after all. He didn't, despite how much she wished he would. Once she'd gone down four flights of stairs, she found her way back to Bellamy and his red velvet beanbag. He wasn't alone. Vicerain was there, and Malik. Neither of them seemed particularly surprised to see her, but they also didn't seem happy about it. Hello, Charlie said, brushing past Malik to find a cushion of her own to settle on. You did us a service, he said. The cabal owes you something. We'd like to settle our debts. If the larger world gets involved, our disputes will only make them nervous. We reward our friends, Vicerain said, and punish our enemies. You've proved to be our friend, Charlie Hall. Pirate justice. Carrot and stick. We want to help you, Malik said. Ask us for something. You know what I want, Charlie said. Let him go. Or at least let him be unbound. Haven't you learned from the last Hierophant? What we learned was not to trust Blights, Malik said. Imagine how much worse it would have been if the Hierophant had been unbound. Not worse for Stephen, Charlie said. Stephen stole shadows, said Bellamy. Quicken shadows, shadows of vulnerable people. Sold them to dealers. Don't have too much sympathy for him, Malik nodded. And the problem wasn't Stephen. We believe that Lionel dosed him with something that allowed the Hierophant to take possession of his body. Over time, it either learned how to do that on its own, or they continued to drug him. Ask us for something that doesn't have to do with the Blight. You'd be surprised what we can make happen. Charlie supposed the Cabal could give her a lot of stuff. Her sister re-registered for school in the spring. A scholarship. Pay off Charlie's medical debt while they were at it. Get her a spanking new car. Hell. They might give her Salt's Phantom if she asked. But Posey had never wanted to go to college, and Charlie didn't want to be bribed. I want you to let Vince go. Malik made a frustrated sound. She couldn't help it. It was her nature. Charlie Hall, refusing to learn from her mistakes, eager to throw herself against the same wall again and again, no matter how much it hurt. What did Adeline Salt give you to let her become his guardian? Bellamy looked surprised. I think you misunderstand the situation. You're letting her take him home, aren't you? Charlie said. Vicerain gave a cruel little smile. In a matter of speaking. But this isn't something she chose. Do you know what she will be expected to do? Hunt blights, Charlie said. And do you know why it's considered a punishment? A way to make up for past crimes? Because it's dangerous, she guessed. Very, said Malik, in slightly horrified tones. What was it that Balthazar had told Charlie? That she could steal the breath from a body, the hate from a heart, the moon from the sky. Well, in this case, maybe she didn't need to steal anything. Maybe they'd give her everything she wanted. All it would cost was her secrets. Charlie pasted a smile on her face glanced at the old fear-less tattoo looping across the skin of her inner arm. Fine, she said, through gritted teeth. In that case, I'd like to confess. Confess? Vicerain echoed, puzzled. Do you remember when Brian Araya had his secrets written with a laser on grains of rice and kept them in a glass jar under his pillow? I snatched that like I was a tooth fairy. Or remember when Eshi Godwin got that book with all the detailed illustrations and no one could make head or tail of it? The secrets were written in the artwork, so I cut those pages straight out. I'm not sure she's opened it up to know they're missing. I took Owain Cadwallader's 18th century memoir and discovered a whole pile of notes stitched into the interior binding of another book. I forget the title, but it had these cool metal catches on the side and took those without anyone being the wiser. Oh, and I grabbed Jaden Coffey's whole collection of 70s shadow magic zines. Want me to go on? I've been doing this for years. She felt giddy, 
like she was sliding down a hill, no way to stop now. All the exultation of finally admitting to something. You cut out pages from Eshi's book? Vicerain sounded pissed. I'm a bad person. Charlie reached into the pocket of her jeans, took something out, and threw it to Malik. Startled, he caught it. When he looked at what was in his hands, his brows drew together. I also grabbed your wallet when I brushed by you. Sorry. You are making some very dangerous enemies, Vicerain told her. What's all this about? Malik was tight-jawed. What are you doing? Punish me, Charlie said. I'm loads worse than Adeline. You want it tied to you? Bellamy asked. The idea of someone inside her head, someone she couldn't hide her worst thoughts from, someone she loved, made her feel a little queasy. Yes. Reward or punishment, give him to me. I'll be the Hierophant. When Vince came into the room, necklaces of onyx draped over his throat and one attached to his arm like a leash, his eyes changed at the sight of her. He turned to Bellamy. But where's Adeline? We sent her home, Malik said. Then who? Me, Charlie said. If you can make a stupid decision, then I can make one too. He shook his head. This is supposed to be a punishment. Oh, I know, she said. You're going to be stuck in my head with all my secrets. Even I don't know all my secrets. It's going to be awful. He appeared to be seriously considering strangling her. Shar. She's volunteered, Vice Rain said, and confessed to quite a few crimes just to convince us. The look he gave her was scathing. Did she? I'll need your feet to be bare, Vice Rain said, all business now. Charlie reached down to take off her boots. They were already untied, the laces loose from kicking them off in the tower. Vince appeared to be belatedly wondering if he could break free of the onyx chains and escape. She saw him pull against the shining loop over his wrist. It must have held, because his expression set into grim lines. You don't know what I'll be like after. No one does, he said under his breath. You'll still be you, Charlie whispered back. Bellamy said something to Malik, and both of them looked amused. Charlie didn't think it was directed at her, but it ramped up her nerves. She reminded herself that she'd been through this before, cutting loose her own shadow as she sewed it to her sister's feet. Posey had to finish the sewing, and neither of them was a great seamstress. Still, it seemed to be attached, and Posey seemed fine. She reminded herself that she was stealing Vince right out from under their noses. Vice Rain directed Charlie to stand in front of him, which she did. When he wanted me to tell you hello, she whispered. Your boss is furious, but probably you don't want your old job back anyway. Oh, and believe it or not, Posey might actually apologize. Vince looked down at her and sighed, but when she reached for his hand, he let her take it. She squeezed once before he returned to shadow. The front door of the watchtower closed heavily behind Charlie as she crossed the lawn, frost-rhymed leaves crunching beneath her boots. Vince, she said, under her breath. See, I told you we were going to leave together, and now we're out of there. He didn't reply, but when she glanced down, the shape of the shadow that followed her was his. She stuck her hands in the pockets of her coat, listened to the wind whistle through the trees. I know you're mad she said. In the van, she pulled out the tactical knife attached to her keys, pressed the point against the pad of her ring finger until a drop of blood welled up. Vicerain said I was supposed to do this right away. So, here we go. That seemed to get his attention. The shadow swirled around her in a dark cloud. She felt something against her skin that might have been a tongue, except that it wasn't wet. The sensation made her shiver. Vince she said again, starting to get nervous. Stop messing with me, say something. A whisper came in her mind, making her sit up straight. You're not Remy. I'm your girlfriend, she said, voice unsteady. And this joke isn't even a little bit funny. Charlie stared at the shadow that spilled across the passenger seat, 
at the hectic light filtering through the trees. Watched as his shadow took shape without her control. A figure of darkness with same burning eyes and no recognition in them. Triumph turned sour in her mouth. His voice was soft with menace. If that were true, I would know you. And I don't. She thought of the story that Vince had told her, about running away from salts, about waking up beneath that underpass without memory of how he got there. She'd taken that to mean he hadn't remembered the time between Remy's death and waking up. But maybe he'd lost more than that, and for longer. Or maybe this was different. Maybe he'd never recall sitting with her under the stars. Never remember bringing ice to Barb's party. Never remember eating buttered toast and drinking coffee in bed. She felt the burn of tears, blinked them back, tasted salt in the back of her throat. Outside, night was coming on. A few single flakes of snow fell. She slammed her fist against the steering wheel. He watched her, smoke curling from the sockets of his eyes. There'd always been something wrong with Charlie Hall. Crooked, from the day she was born. Never met a bad decision she wasn't willing to double down on. I'm a good enough thief to steal a shadow from a tower, she told him. I can steal back your heart. He said nothing in return. And a few moments later, the shadow had melted away, leaving her alone. This is Sarah Meany. Thank you for listening to Book of Night, written by Holly Black. A Macmillan audio production from Tor Books. Produced by Callum Plews. Text copyright 2022 by Holly Black. Production copyright 2022 by Macmillan Audio. All rights reserved.